This is the third day of the three-day international OA winner on biopolitics, culture, and literature, organized by the Department of English under the aegis of ITUSC Coalition in Mahavidyalaya Chandan Okay, affiliated to the University of Batavan, in collaboration with Mahistala College, Kolkata, affiliated to the University of Calcutta. So, very good afternoon to all the participants, to all my dear colleagues, my dear students, especially to the to the invited uh, research passion of the session, Dr. John Charles Ryan, adjunct associate professor, Southern Cross University, Australia, and the moderator of the session, Dr. Shandukta Chatterjee, a faculty member, Department of English, in charge. Center for Women's Studies, Raigon University. So now over to Dr. Sonal Chatterjee, please. Um, very good afternoon to everybody. And uh, I very briefly would like to, uh, you know, introduce her because he is like, he's the real speaker here and he should have his stage. So uh, Professor John Charles Ryan, uh, he's an adjunct associate professor at Southern Cross University and senior research fellow, senior research fellow at Notre Dame University, Australia. His interests include creative writing, literary studies, critical plant studies, and the environmental humanities. His latest co-edited book is Australian Wetland Cultures, Swamps, and the Environmental Crisis, 2019 Lexington Books. His poetry collection, Seeing Trees, a Poetic Arboretum, is forthcoming with Pinion Publishing based in Colorado, USA. In 2020, he was visiting scholar at university, uh, 17 August 1945, Surabaya, University, Indonesia, and writer in residence at Oak Spring Garden Foundation in Virginia, USA. Uh, his paper today delineates the theory of plant biopolitics through a comparative phytocritical, that is plant-based reading of the work of Aboriginal Australian poet D. Nature, pardon me if I pronounce wrong. And uh, his uh, topic today is uh, the biopolitical plant, poetry, and the liberation of vegetal beings. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Chatterjee, Dr. Dr. and uh, uh, thank you very much for having me. Is my um, audio clear and my, my uh, video clear? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you are clear. Okay, clear. Okay, excellent. I'll, I'll share my screen. Uh, is there screen sharing uh, available? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That looks, that looks good. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks very much uh, for the for the organizer for having me uh, speak on this topic of the biopolitical plants, poetry, and the liberation of vegetable being. And I hope by the end of this uh, hour or two, uh, you'll have a clearer idea of what I mean by the liberation of uh, vegetable being uh, through poetry, and also the second concept I want to enforce here is the the idea of the biopolitical plan. And so uh, just briefly, I'm associated with uh, Southern Cross University and the University of Notre Dame, both in Australia, and also a visiting scholar in Indonesia uh, for four months uh, in Surabaya. So thank you uh, very much. So I'm, I'll begin with a quote uh, on this idea of biopolitics, plants, and poetry. I'll begin with a quote from uh, Story About Feeling, which is a poetry book published by an Aboriginal Australian author named Will Nietzsche. And um, I'll just begin with an excerpt from this poem. Uh, and uh, just briefly, the book itself is a kind of dialogue between the author and his many ancestors. Uh, Bill Nietzsche was a, an Aboriginal uh, leader in the Northern Territory part of Australia. And uh, so the book is very much a conversation between Nietzsche, the, the poet, and his many ancestors, human and non-human. It's also uh, a book about Nietzsche's desire to pass 
pass his knowledge of culture and environment to younger generations of Aboriginal people. Yeah. And so in the, in the following excerpt, we see um, the speaker, uh, Niji himself, admonishing a young man for recklessly chopping down an ancient tree. And the first thing you'll notice is in this passage is that it's written in Aboriginal English. So yes, I chop it down, that big tree. I play, I cut it, yes. You cut it at yourself. When you get, oh, about 50, you'll feel it, pain on your back, because you cut it. So uh, Aboriginal English is a dialect used by many Aboriginal people throughout Australia. It's a recognized dialect within Australia. And um, these lines speak of the physical implications of cutting down this big sacred tree, uh, the embodied implications, if you will, so that when you get to oh, about 50 years old, you'll feel it, a pain in your back from having cut that tree down. So um, indeed, many trees, uh, such as this Boat tree pictured on the right side of the screen, uh, can live for many millennia, uh, can live for up 2,000 years old, and so they are uh, extraordinary <laughs> many Aboriginal cultures. So um, on this idea of the I'll law for this story, um, the clearance of ancient trees such as the Boad still continues in Australia. This is a, an example that received uh, quite a lot of media coverage in around 2008. Um, this is the story of the famous Jijumalu. This was a Boab tree about a 750-year-old Boab tree, and it was uh, transplanted from the Kimberley region of Western Australia to the city of Perth. And that was a distance of about 3,200 kilometers. Uh, it, was, it was in the way of, of a road-making project. And so uh, with the consultation of Aboriginal elders, uh, the tree was transplanted and shipped south uh, almost over 3,000 kilometers um, to the city of Perth. Now this event is known as the longest land journey of a tree of its size in history. Uh, so this is the tree as of uh, 2016. This is its new home in Perth, in the uh, Kings Park Botanic Garden in the city of Perth. And by all accounts, it seems to be doing well. So, We see how trees become obstacles to uh, ideals of progress and then are manipulated by uh, technological means and created, uh, essentially transformed into diasporans. So I use this example to uh, discuss uh, the idea of the biopolitical plant that, uh, that factors. Um, excuse me, sir. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Very sorry to interrupt you, but uh, our participants say that the audio is not clear. So, like, uh, would it be okay. okay with you if you put on a headphone, sir? Oh, yes. Uh, is, is it clearer now? Is it clearer now? It is better, sir. Definitely. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll speak more directly into the uh, microphone. Into the mouth. Yes. Sir. Okay. Much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so this idea of the biopolitical plant is uh, what I'll be developing here in the presentation. And um, the, the uh, companion notion of the liberation of vegetable being. And I'll begin with Nietzsche's story about feeling, uh, published in 1989. Uh, and I'll look at three themes that communicate a biopolitical plant. The first is the intercorporeality of the work, uh, the second is the affect of the work, and the third is the idea of plant voice, as it appears uh, in this work by Bill Niji. And I argue that what emerges in Niji's work is an indigenous biopolitics of plants that recognizes the agency of botanical life, that, that also recognizes how plants are the objects of biopolitical discourse, particularly of the nation state, but that also attributes a kind of agency to plants that uh, recuperates their own biopolitics. And then I want to draw some comparisons to uh, a work by a, a Nicaraguan poet, Pablo Antonio Coandra, called Seven Trees Against the Dying Light. And uh, this, as I argue, is another biopolitical work, specifically about uh, native and introduced tree species in Nicaragua. 
And I'll also examine uh, briefly how these three themes figure into uh, Quandra's work, corporeality, affect, and voice. Um, okay, so plant biopolitics. And how I develop this idea here is through what I call a psychocritical reading. Now, we've all heard of uh, critical literary readings. We've even perhaps heard of zoo, uh, zoo centric readings of text that are animal focused. But my approach is phytocritical, it's a plant focused reading of these texts. And um, I'm going to develop uh, this phytocritical reading of plant biopolitics uh, through these two works. Now, uh, Niji is pictured on the right. His dates uh, were about, he was born in about 1920 and passed away in 2002. Um, Kwanzaa was born in, uh, in Nicaragua in uh, 1912 and passed away in 2002. Well, so they, they have roughly the same dates, uh, birth and, and death dates, which I find quite fascinating as well. So Niji's work, pictured on, uh, is published in 89, and uh, Kwanzaa's uh, Seven Trees Against the Dying of the Light was actually written during the 1970s in Spanish, but then translated and published in English in 2007. So these are the two uh, works at the, uh, at the center point of my development of this idea of a plant biopolitics through poetry. Okay, so what is a plant biopolitics? And certainly uh, there's been some uh, developments, theoretical developments in the idea of plant biopolitics. There's been some critical interest in literary and cultural studies, especially in the last decade on plants. And um, uh, the two theorists uh, I'll briefly mention here, the first is uh, Jeffrey Nealon. Uh, and he uh, published a book in 2016 called Plant Theory, Biopower and Vegetable uh, Life. And uh, what Nealon does is he reminds us that plants uh, comprise the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of biomass on the planet, upward to 99% of the land biomass, yet that they are the subject of biopolitical discourse and debate, right? So if you think of Monsanto, and the patenting of seeds, uh, as well as the global commodification of plants as uh, seeds or as aesthetic objects or as goods that are transported in global networks. We get the idea that plants are very much subject to biopolitical discourses. Um, but Nealon identifies a problem in this book, and he calls it the elision of plant life in recent biopolitical theory. He discusses a liminal place, a liminal place of plants within the wider biopolitical focus on life in humanities theory today. Uh, and he wants to redress this uh, lack of emphasis on plant life in biopolitical theory. Now he's not alone uh, in this in this uh, calling to redress the lack of attention to plants. He argues that the biopolitics debate. Uh, will need to take into account an even more robust notion of what constitutes life beyond the human, and I would say beyond the animal. Animal rights and animal biopolitics have also received a lot of critical attention. Uh, Nealon argues that we need to consider the plant. Now, um, Kate Sandilands has this very interesting notion or interesting take on bio, the biopolitics of plant life. She argues that yes, plants are indeed implicated in biopolitical relations as, as um, uh, you know, objects of manipulation, objects of exploitation, objects of trade and commerce. Yet, as we are discovering, uh, we being science uh, and those interested in recent plant science, we're discovering that plants have their own capacities, their own abilities, their own biopolitics that has to do uh, with their interrelationships with other plants, their relationships to insects, animals, and humans. And so there's a kind of agency at play when we think of the biopolitics of plants in light of recent research that shows that plants have a wide array of capacities, that they're not simply passive objects. Um, her idea, which I'll invoke uh, during the course of this talk, is called floral sensation. So for, uh, for Sandilands, that uh, describes the, the quality that some plants have that makes them uh, desirable commodities, that makes them sensational, right? That makes flowers uh, aesthetically pleasing, that makes humans desire spices from other parts of the world, right? But she, she argues that 
the other side of this um, biopolitics of plants is that they have their own sensations, their own agencies, their own uh, uh, biopolitics apart from what human, humans attribute as values to them. So floral sensation uh, recognizes that agency of plants. That's Sandlin's argument. So my approach to plant biopolitics is going to, uh, it works a bit uh, transdisciplinarily, if you will. I look at ecocriticism, ethnobotany, which is uh, human uses and interactions with plants, and also environmental ethics, how we can develop a kind of plant ethic uh, through our analysis of biopolitics. And the biopolitics I have in mind values our interactions understandings and uses of plants, uh, indigenous or otherwise, uh, uses of plants as foods, fibers, medicines, ornaments, and spiritual totems. So those interactions are the basis through which a plant biopolitics emerges and uh, perpetuates itself. Um, the plant biopolitics I have in mind in particular in this talk is the traditional eco ecological knowledge politics. Uh, specifically of indigenous people's interactions with plants in an era in which plant life is being lost exponentially. Uh, plant diversity is threatened in almost every part of the world. So to consider plant biopolitics is an urgent task. And that we can also discover plant biopolitics in works not only of poetry, but of prose and fiction, nonfiction scripts, and even digital media and everyday discourses. They're laden with plant biopolitics, and we choose to call a plant a rose rather than its scientific name, or uh, we use a common name for a tree rather than a scientific name, or vice versa, we're in fact enacting or invoking a plant biopolitics that has to do with the science of plants. So um, plant biopolitics for me also is uh, an ex exercise in the environmental humanities, which applies uh, humanities-based approaches to resolving environmental issues and also uh, uh, post-colonial eco-criticism. Uh, biopolitics, especially in an indigenous context, uh, needs to take into account the colonial and neo-colonial discourses that impact human relations and the, the vitality of plant life. And uh, phytocriticism, as mentioned earlier, this looks at the representation of plants and environmental texts defined broadly, poetry, prose, but also pop cultural texts and other forms and uh, lastly, the scientific notion of vegetal cognition, uh, an area of research that's gained incredible momentum in the past two decades uh, that recognizes the capacity of plants to learn, to communicate, even to behave. It's a contentious area of research, but it's one that's gained more and more traction over the last two decades. And it, for me, at least the approach that I use, it factors very much into the notion of a plant biopolitics. Okay, so let's turn uh, to Niji's uh, work in particular. So a story about feeling is a remarkable little book. It's physically small, it can fit in your hand, in the palm of your hand, but it is uh, incredibly uh, uh, full of uh, important knowledge and important uh, perceptions, traditional perceptions of plants. Now, this work was transcribed by an ethnographer named Keith Taylor uh, in conversation with Bill Nietzsche, pictured on the right, and it was published in 1989. Now, Nietzsche was known as what uh, is, was known as a senior lawman, and so sometimes he's referred to as SLM Nietzsche, senior lawman. That's uh, sort of the highest designation for Aboriginal person in Australia, so that recognizes his cultural uh, custodianship. And so the, the work itself comprises 11 thematic chapters on uh, a range of subjects, but including traditional botanical knowledge and specifically of the Gajuku people. Now, these are the people uh, of the uh, traditional people of the area, what is, is what's known now as the Kakadu National Park, Northern Australia, the Northern Territory, just east of Darwin. This is a very uh, uh, iconic Australian park. It's full of uh, some of the most you know, photographed monuments. It's one of the top 10 national parks in Australia. So Nietzsche was uh, critical to the formation of this national park 
in the 80s and 90s. Now, um, so these are his, these were his ancestral lands. Um, this is a world heritage listed area. It is also rich in uranium, so it's always been a contested area. It's been the site of, of uh, decades of mining incursion. And so Niji writes about this, uh, this dialectic of preserving cultural heritage, yet also uh, being constantly threatened by the incursion of mining. Even when the governments of Australia designated the place a national park, still having these different uh, uh, threats to it by mining and other forms of industry. So in this book, Nietzsche narrates a, a, a range of ethnobotanical knowledge forms. And so these include you know, how to procure certain bush foods, uh, how to take care of the plants in the country, uh, the plants, the traditional Aboriginal names, uh, you know, what it's like when it's germinating, how it grows and decays and regenerates. So it's very much a work of botanical knowledge. Um, but uh, more than that, there's a respect and an ethic for plants. And what I argue is a biopolitics of plants that play in this work. And that's why I find it so important to discuss in the context of biopolitics. So the second chapter, for example, is called Tree. And uh, this chapter discloses a view of plants, an Aboriginal view of plants as intelligent subjects, as responsive subjects, as subjects from whom one can learn wisdom. Uh, and lessons in live sustainably on the land. Uh, that reflects back to Nietzsche's idea that if you touch that tree, you're going to feel it in your back when you turn 50. Uh, so there's this physical connection between Aboriginal people and the ancient flora of their country. Uh, so um, uh, this idea of human plant communication communication is essential to Niji's politics. And as I'll mention in a moment, uh, he, he goes into detail about how um, plants are not simply objects of, of visual analysis, but they are uh, objects or subjects of discourse, right? We're in conversation and dialogue with plants at all times. And, and uh, this has some uh, evolutionary basis. Um, Anne Leonard and Jacob Francis, two biologists, argue that plant communication, and they quote, underlies some of the planet's most ecologically and economically important mutualisms. So that plant communication, plant, plant, plant to animal, plant to human, has been essential for uh, evolutionary development of life. That's their argument. And Niji's indigenous uh, biopolitics of plants intersects with that scientific idea very much. And so the, the biopolitics I have in mind is a kind of rapprochement between poetic, scientific, and Aboriginal conceptions of life. Now, an indigenous uh, Australian scholar named C.F. Black talks about a democratic space inhabited by a multiverse of beings of which humans are just one manifestation. And so this is the, the democratic space in which the plant is situated from an Aboriginal perspective, a multiverse of beings. Multiverse being that uh, not only the human has the Discourse, the plant, the cosmos, and so forth have the power of discourse, and that uh, the role of, of narrative, the role of poetry and story, is to uh, capture the power and vitality of that realization. Uh, so, just briefly uh, here, in terms of the various biopolitical discourses that factor into uh, how a plant is represented. So this is the Waratah. This is a national plant symbol. I believe it's a state symbol of New South Wales, but it's one of the most recognized of Australia. Uh, so we can think of how this plant has become a kind of flor uh, floral symbol of the nation state, right? So that when many Australians see this plant, they, uh, they think of, uh, of nationalism. Of the, or the beauty of the Australian nation, which is one kind of biopolitics of flora. But an indigenous biopolitics is very different, right? So for this plant, uh, the Waratah, uh, there's a story actually of, in the New South, state of New South Wales, a traditional story amongst Aboriginal people. 
The story is, a young, is that a young woman named Kruby wrapped book, awaited the return of her lover, the warrior Bamai. After his death in battle, she refuses to eat, withers away, and dies. A crimson flower, its stem as high as a long spear, emerges from the spot where she, resembling a broken heart, the flower petals uh, are in the shape of teardrops, right? So, uh, so the creation story uh, brings this plant into the world of the cosmological. Uh, the indigenous people of New South Wales uh, see their origins as a cultural group, as a people, as very closely implicated with this plant. A very different biopolitics, of course, but one that has equal uh, importance uh, to the uh, dominant biopolitical view of the plant as a symbol of uh, nationhood. So uh, returning to Niji's story about feeling and uh, its origins, when we think of Aboriginal poetry, we are confronted by a 60,000 years unlike any literary tradition on earth. Uh, a tradition of literature grounded in oral uh, narratives and song poetry. Aboriginal people have been on the Australian continent for at least 60,000 uh, 60, years, astonishing. And so the, the contemporary form of Aboriginal poetry, which began essentially in 1964 with Intramino Cal's uh, publication of We Are Going, d uh, draws a 60,000 year lineage. And what I mean by that is that the traditional uh, oral poetry into printed poetry and have in the whole uh, 50 plus year history of contemporary Aboriginal poetry. So it's an astonishing um, tradition of literature. So, uh, okay. So if uh, indigenous philosopher, Mary Graham, reminds us of Aboriginal that it's situated in what she calls the sacred web of connection, including not only relations to the land, but also relations to nature and all living things. So poetry in the Aboriginal view is less uh, representational and more uh, intermediational. It's working at, on the level of a living thing. It's mediating relations between people and plants and people and animals and people in the cosmos. Uh, so it's a important uh, uh, understanding of Aboriginal poetry when we think of its biopolitical dimensions. Uh, so um, Aboriginal poetry has uh, always been political. I think that's the point I want to make. It's always been critiqued uh, as political from its very early origins. Uh, or critics, often anglo australian critics, identified it as protest poetry, as post-colonial poetry, as poetry of mourning. Uh, even some critics said it is a performative poetry with little literary value, some early criticisms uh, that approach. So the political dimensions of Aboriginal poetry have been with it since origins, but the biopolitical uh, dimensions have been given less emphasis. Okay, so um, also think of, of the biopolitics of Aboriginal poetry in terms of decolonial praxis. And so this would draw in scholarship by indigenous uh, researchers such as Linda um, Tuiwai Smith, uh, Maori uh, researcher, who acknowledges that the very term research is implicated in Anglo-European imperialism uh, and nationalism. So she advocates what she calls a decolonial praxis, uh, recognizing the value of indigenous perspectives to uphold, quote, self-determination, decolonization, and social justice. And uh, also what she calls, quote, a more respectful, ethical, sympathetic, and, and useful uh, approach to research than has normally been the case historically in the case in Australia. 
So that leads us to an ethics of the clinical life and a biopolitics as constituting a basis for more fully respecting, appreciating, and living with uh, the plants of a place. And so we find this in Niji's work. Uh, now, part of the uh, part of the power of this sort of narrative is it is its visual content as well, its artistic content. So, uh, alongside the poetry, verse poetry itself, or verse prose, if you will, itself, there are these um, uh, illustrations uh, by an Aboriginal artist named Jack uh, Bunkaniyal. And this amplifies the botanical elements of the text. So this, for example, is an illustration of a, of a cocky apple. And uh, so underneath the illustration, there is some description of the plant uh, as bearing a pulpy and sweet fruit. So there's this ethnobotanical content within the caption to the image itself. And this interplay of the visual and the biopolitical resonances of the work. So, um, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, Nietzsche was considered a senior elder or a senior law man. Uh, he was also the other uh, uh, lexicon you can use as traditional owner. Uh, that's the vocabulary used in Australia. And so he was a traditional owner of this part of the Northern Territory in Australia. Uh, he, with, with the assistance of an ethnographer, he published a story about feeling in 89, and then Old Man's Story, was, which was a posthumous work, but very much in this tradition of the verse narrative. Uh, and um, central to both of these books and all, all of Nietzsche's other work is this idea. Is that sorry to interrupt you? Yes. Uh, sir, actually, sound is not clear. Uh, sound is actually getting a very poor sound for me. So, uh, okay. please, if you. Okay, I'll, I'll try to speak uh, more directly into the microphone. Is it clear? Uh, so, so central to these two works is an idea of plants as communicative kin, very much the traditional the views of his cultural group. Uh, so here is uh, Bill Niji and this uh, work story about feeling grew from a series of recorded conversations between Nietzsche and the interviewer over uh, an extended period of time, uh, 1982. And then uh, with the assistance of the ethnographer, the recorded conversations were transcribed into a kind of verse narrative. So it's pretty much a kind of ethno ethnographic poem, ethnobotanical, but also ethnographic poem. So um, Nietzsche understood his storytelling as a, as a gift and uh, as a means to communicate to indigenous people and in culture. So in Story About Feeling, we find uh, instances of uranium mining in this uh, national park area construction of roads, uh, the spoilers, spoilation of uh, ceremonial sites, the cutting down of sacred trees, etc. These are all kinds of uh, neo-colonial intrusions with biopolitical intrusions. And um, uh, the other aspect of this work is, is that it's presented entirely in Aboriginal English. So there's a biopolitics at play there intrinsically as well. Uh, this, the, the work itself has a kind of conversational tone that invites the reader into this sacred knowledge mesh. And um, more importantly, uh, Niji uses this uh, inclusive pronoun e, right? So e is a pronoun used in Aboriginal English, and it is inclusive of he, she, and it. And so when you talk of the plant as an e, you are attributing a kind of personhood to him in, in an Aboriginal uh, sense. So the E, this uh, inclusive pronoun, enfolds the human and the non-human, the animate and the inanimate, the earth, and so that's an important part of this work. 
So we find here from story about feeling and uh, in terms of its intercorporeality, intercorporeality. I'll just briefly mention what I mean by that. Intercorporeality foregrounds the role of embodied interactions between the self and the other in the process of social understanding. And through these embodied interactions, meanings are created, intersubjective meanings are created and shared between the self and the other. So intercorporeality. And uh, we find this in, uh, in Niji's work as a kind of human plant intercorporeality. So tree, grass, star, because star and tree working with you, we got blood pressure, but same thing, spirits on your body, but e working with you, that tree, same thing, your body, my body, you, anyone, tree working when you're sleeping and dream. I love it tree because he love me too. He watching me same as you. Tree, he working with your body, my body. He working with us while you sleep, he working. Daylight when you walking around, he work too. That tree, grass, that all like our father. Dirt, earth, I sleep with this earth. Grass, just like your brother in my blood, in my arm, this grass. So that final line, in my blood, in my arm, this grass, powerfully homologizes, draws a homology between the human and the plant body, right? And so both of uh, these bodies, the human and the plant, are energized by the same force, which in, uh, in Nietzsche's parlance is uh, called Jiang. It's a vital force uh, of uh, the Aboriginal cultural group of which he was part. Now, uh, affect is another important formation to understanding of plant biopolitics. Affect has received lots of theoretical treatment uh, by people like Brian Masumi, each, uh, Eve Sedgwick, Adam Frank, and others. Uh, there's been a kind of of tech studies in the past few years, the past decade in particular. And, uh, and though there's been a, a lack of attention, how affect is shared between forms of life. So what is affect? It's often confused with emotion, but it is something different. Affect can be considered as a kind of interaction of emotion and embodiment. Uh, some scholars define it as, quote, modulated intensities. Others define it as embodied capacities, phenomena that arise and circulate as intensities among assemblages. So what affect does is provide a basis for thinking about how these intense intensities arise between bodies. Those bodies can be human, non-human, and other than human. Uh, this is an important aspect of Sandalin's concept plant biopolitics as floral sensation. Once again, that idea of communicating that, yes, plants have been the subject of biopolitics discourse, but that they are also subject in their own right who have their own biopolitics uh, emerging through their capacity to sense the world and to sense other beings. We know that plants are sensitive uh, beyond what we traditionally in Western thought have, have agreed. Uh, they have uh, gustatory capacities. They um, are highly adaptive through their use of chemical languages and uh, uh, other forms of signaling. Uh, they can alert other plants to danger. So this is inherently a kind of biopolitic at play. Uh, when a plant sends a signal to the other plant on the other side of the forest, uh, telling that plant to be careful that an insect invasion is coming, that's plant biopolitics at work which is resistive to the uh, plant biopolitics that would clear that forest uh, in the name of uh, colonial, neocolonial progress. So yeah, plant affect is an important uh, dimension in this idea of uh, plant biopolitics. And in Nietzsche's work, uh, plant affect uh, manifests in how people uh, harvest plants or interact with plants as food, fibers, and medicine. So, uh, this is another passage. Um, I'm your old man, but I'm telling you, 
You take yam? Yes. Well, one of your granny or mother, you dig him through the belly. You must cover him up, cover again. When you get yam, you cover so no hole through there because you're killing yam, other thing. And you got to hang on. And he teach him, he said, this, eating red apple, any kind of fruit for the people, any kind of tree, yam. He dig up one long yam, you seen it? He said, this could cover. He said, Billy and Lily nuts, little ones in the plains, they can dig up dig up and eat them, any sort of some yam, little one buried. This one cheeky yam, he said, no good, that brown one plenty here. This one he can soak them all night. So next morning he won't kill but he, but he won't kill you but sour. But he can throw them in the water. He can eat them next morning. Oh lovely. So the long yam he dig them up. He can eat raw and he can pick them and cook them if you want to, because that means raw, you can eat that flavor for you, make more blood and clean your body. When you eat, cook, same thing, clean your stomach, clean your stomach. So there is a, a, an extraordinary uh, uh, level of interaction occurring here. Uh, and the, the plant is uh, serving as a food a healing agent and uh, the purpose of the agency of the poem is to communicate this knowledge that's lost as uh, these plants are lost and as Aboriginal culture uh, becomes uh, more westernized by various uh, neocolonial forces. So uh, plants affect. Now the other biopolitical dimension of this work is voice. Uh, we tend to think of voice as a human phenomenon, as something having to do with vocalization of speaking. So if we consider it in those terms, humans uh, automatically are privileged with voice. Animals have something like voice. They have the ability to uh, vocalize and such. So, uh, but plants and fungi and other forms of uh, non-human life are essentially denied voice. But if we think of voice differently, uh, we can begin to, to see that voice manifestation of presencing. Um, so of course an anatomical sense tells us that plants don't speak, right? They don't have the me mechanical structures to vocalize. But if we think of voice as a kind of um, emergence in the world, an articulation, a, as I said, presencing, uh, we can begin to refuse the long-standing biopolitics that, uh, that grant voice to humans and to some extent to animals and deny voice everything else. And um, now this has some correlation with current research in plant science that's showing us that plants use sound strategically. Uh, that plants in fact have a kind of sound signature. They often emit these subsonic frequencies through their roots uh, as a way to communicate with other plants and also to communicate with predators. That's, uh, you could say have a kind of voice, if you will, if we can think of voice beyond our dominant idea of it. So uh, in, in Niji's work, we see plants are very much uh, having voice, having the capacity to listen, right? So here Niji says, that tree now feeling the blow, sit quiet, you speaking, that tree now he speak, that wind he blow, he can listen, tree, yes, that story, he listen, story, you and me same, grass, and listen. Now I'm telling story, I can listen this. You listen that wind, he come more. Tree, he start moving around and feeling. This tree, he stay watching you. Something, this tree. If you go by yourself, lie down. That tree, he can listen. Might be, he might give you a signal. Spirit, quiet, he say. Oh, my man come. Something, you know, noise, you might say. Hey, what's that? My grandpa, he said, yes, well, leave it. That's the tree now. I'll tell you somebody coming, that tree, you work. Uh, so uh, these passages, once again, uh, written in, in Aboriginal English are communicating uh, uh, quite a lot about human plant communication. Uh, the tree listens, speaks, and watches. He tends to care for and works with people by announcing that quote, somebody coming. So in its transmission of a signal into noise, 
the intrinsically relational tree being communicates uh, also empathetically, right, with the with the humans through feeling, warning the human of danger coming. There's a kind of uh, empathy for the human human's well-being. So these are the expressive modes of uh, arboreal life. It's, if you will, heterogeneous voices manifest not only through the tree body but via the plant voice and within the polyvocal mesh of country. That that uh, land for Aboriginal people is in intrinsically polyvocal, full of voices. That these voices come as messages, signs, signals, etc., uh, or as feelings, as feelings. So that's why. Uh, the story is called Story About Feelings. So you can see uh, Nietzsche's work is a kind of resistive plant biopolitics. It's resisting the biopolitics of plants that would clear the plant, turn it into uh, a commodity to export, that would chip the plant and send it, in, uh, send it off uh, for consumption and elsewhere, uh, that would uh, colonize the plant. Uh, Niji's biopolitics is resistive, and he's, he's accomplishing that uh, resistance through these elements of intercorporeality, uh, voice, and affect, right, to show this very intimate connection between plants. So, uh, having examined uh, biopolitics of voice, affect, and intercorporeality in Niji's story, let's look at how these themes show up in. Um, Quandra's Seven Trees. Now, just briefly, the poems in Seven Trees were written between 1977 and 78. Now, these years correspond to the incident in Nicaragua against the dictatorship of the And this was a kind of that is similar to the war between the two Greek brothers, uh, Diocles and Polynesis in uh, Greek mythology. And so that's partly why uh, the book is called Seven, uh, the book has the, the title uh, that it does, Seven Trees Against the Dying of the Light. Uh, it's also important to bear in mind that in the 1920s and 30s, US troops occupied uh, Nicaragua in the war against the heroic general of three men, Augusto Cesar Sandino. Uh, in many of the poems, it is the flora and fauna of Nicaragua, such as the Sieba tree, here that assume responsibility for defeating and expelling the foreign invaders. So uh, in Seven Trees, we find a biopolitics of native versus naturalized tree that, trees that's not inscribed as a kind of pernicious binary where uh, the native is essentially desirable and good and the naturalized is essentially undesirable and, and bad. But what we find is a kind of blending of these categories of uh, a uh, dismantling of that biopolitics that puts the native tree into opposition with the uh, with the invasive so-called invasive uh, foreign tree. There's a kind of xenophobic uh, biopolitics at work there. So um, Quandra's uh, work helps to dismantle those um, categorical oppositions. So if we look at uh, the mango tree, uh, one of the seven poems from this uh, this work, we find that. Um, Sandalin's idea of floral sensation uh, is quite illuminative here, illuminating here. It's underscoring the agencies of trees, their own capacity for sensation, for, um, for accomplishing the work in the world as uh, resistive forces once again. And not only plants as a subject to but as having their own biopolitical agency. And so from the mango tree, uh, they are one invisible step ahead of civilization. You know about trees. You know the native trees that help river shepherds, trees that are so deeply Nicaraguan, like the petotes, which even when slashed for kindling, sprout up again from the land. And you know the strangers to this place, such as Senegal's abundant Itoko tree, or Algeria's pomegranate, or the immense breadfruit from the Maluka or the mango that arrived in Nicaragua from distant Hindustan. So the, the poem uh, imparts a resistive biopolitical agency to native and naturalized trees to life. That these trees have become part of the community uh, of beings that, um, uh, that functions to 
to uh, as a counterforce to the kind of uh, the political circumstances that in, impede on people's relations to the land that seek to uh, modify and exploit trees. So the poem Mango continues. The mango tree also burned its story in time, and now you consider it from this place. It professes a familiar in your islands, accompanies you in rows along both sides of your roads, rows in the courtyard at home, takes in your native birds as it interlaces breezes and its own locusts, like a hammock for your siesta. So there's this intercorporeal element right, between the, the mango tree with its foreign origins. This intercorporeality means that the tree has become part of a community of species that distinguishes Nicaragua, not as a nation state, but a community of beings and constitutes it people's resistance to forms of political repression. The liberation of plant being is intimately connected to the liberation of human being in this poem. Um, intercorporeality intercorporeality, very much uh, an important theme as I've been describing it to the development of a plant biopolitics. Uh, let's examine intercorporeality as embodied interactions that create intersubjective meanings between the self and the other in, uh, in uh, Kwanja's work. So this is from a poem called the Sieba Tree. This is the tree that lovingly cradles your childhood on the with the light silky coffin of its fate your people made the pillows on which they rest and shape their dreams. Climbing this tree, the serpent becomes bird and the word song. This is the mother Cheba in whose swelling trunk your people honored birth and fertility. From a single piece of its white, easily carved wood, they built a vessel. That is their and their coffin when they reached port. From this tree, humanity learned mercy and architecture, order, and how to give grace. So as I've argued, the, the idea of, of plant affect in, in addition to corporeality is important to this notion of plant biopolitics. And it's a, it's a um, perhaps a dialectic, if you will, once again, the capacity of plants for spectacularism. The, a beautiful fruit that's then sought as a global commodity, right? that's then commodified. But this other dimension of plural sensation is uh, the inherent capacity of plants for agency and for their own sensing of the world uh, beyond their appropriation as materials, objects, or symbols. So we find this in the cacao, cacao, cacao tree, cacao tree, an effective plant biopolitics, uh, where the poet discusses origins of the tree and its subsequent commodification at the hands of the imperial invasion. So uh, Quetzalcoatl told us, we are people who wander. And he gave us a drink called pinol, made from corn. And he gave us piste, a, treat, a drink made from cacao and corn, drinks for the pilgrims. Because ours is the land of the uprooted. We are the people whose only country is called free of our lands from us, all the cacao trees. Uh, in the south. And as soon as they were the owners of these trees, they used the seeds as money. The people no longer drank cacao. Only the titis, the landowners, only the rich lords and the warrior chiefs. Right, so there's, uh, there is this appropriation of the, the uh, healing and uh, traditional and ceremonial aspect of the tree, the appropriation of that as a global commodity. So uh, it's a very much an important dimension, this dialectic politics between the application uh, of the plant as a material or icon or symbol, but then the plant's own resistant force to that appropriation. So I think that's why uh, Quandra is uh, mentioning or is uh, signaling in this passage. So finally, voice. We looked at uh, Niji's engagement with the idea of plant voice as uh, upending this notion that plants are mute 
objects or passive objects. Uh, following uh, the cultural tradition of which he was part uh, gives plants such uh, a well-defined and uh, uh, sonorous voice, if you will, a very prominent kind of uh, voice, not merely as vocalization in the human sense, but as uh, the feeling we get in the presence of plants and the kind of knowledge that's imparted through that feeling. And so uh, Quantra does the same with plant voice. And uh, this is an example of plant maturity. And he says, that's why when the tree eventually fell, and a fisherman wanted to use his foot, a voice ordered him, don't cut here, cut high. Again, the voice commanded, not there, but lower. And the voice kept guiding him and ordered him to dig out uh, the trunk and hollow it with fire. And the man slid the trunk into the water and saw how it navigated like the Casper fish. And the man had built the first canoe. Study this tree, Circulia. Apatala, Sterculia Carthaginensis. So, uh, lots of biopolitical resonance there, very much. The idea of the plant voice as uh, instructing the human on the most respectful usage of it, and how following that respectful protocol leads to uh, discovery, imagination, and innovation. The man had built <clears throat> the first canoe by listening to the voice of the tree. Uh, and also this biopolitical tension between uh, plant names, a very important consideration, both in Niji's work, but more, in Niji's work, yes, but more prominently, I would say, in Kwanja's, where he's constantly citing the typical uh, scientific names for plants. And I think he does this for a purpose, to show that these names are, these technical names that command certain knowledge of trees and plants are merely one form of naming among many, right? There are the traditional names of, that uh, describe perhaps some of the uh, folkloric usages of those plants and trees. Uh, there are uh, common names of all sorts and indigenous names of all sorts, as well as the nomenclatural scientific taxonomic names. So, uh, the other aspect here is that there's some beauty, poetic beauty in the names themselves. There's historical resonances in the names as well. And I think that's part of uh, plant biopolitics of, of uh, Quandra's uh, work. Okay, so uh, let us uh, conclude and uh, on this topic of plant biopolitics. And uh, what I've argued uh, in some is that this idea of plant biopolitics signifies Politicization, politicization of plants, yes, on the one hand, right? That plants are always already part of political discourse, that plants are subject to political uh, decisions and political views, et cetera, uh, but that plants also have their own inherent, their own uh, innate uh, biopolitics that has to do with their eventual capacities, interacting within biocultural communities, um, exerting their powers to listen, if we think of uh, Nietzsche's work, their powers to, to have voice, if we think of Nietzsche's work and Quantra's work, uh, their, and if we think of the science of plants, their powers to uh, signal, to communicate, to in fact behave in some ways comparable to animals. There's a lot we are learning in me being sort of the scientific view. Uh, I'm sympathetic to science, I'm not a scientist, but I use science a lot in my research on literature and plants. And so uh, as, as I read that science, I see more uh, imbrication between um, traditional views, indigenous views, traditional cultural views of plants, and the emerging scientific views of plants as having a kind of a biopolitical agency. So Nietzsche and Quandra's poetic recuperation of traditional botanical knowledge functions as a counterforce to the appropriation of plants. As biodiversity is lost, so too is cultural and biocultural diversity, so too is knowledge of plants. Right? And that's how these, these sort of um, literary ethnobotanical works function. They help to recover, preserve, recuperate this knowledge that is being um, uh, threatened, uh, attenuated, jeopardized, imperiled 
in the uh, world uh, global increasing world today. And then finally, there's this animacy of tree life and plant life more generally, and we can call that botanical nature, that's uh, encountered materially in everyday experience through intercorporeality, affect, and voice. And so uh, thinking about our own interactions with plants, they're inherently biopolitical, right? When we collect the fruit from the tree, we're engaged in a bio biopolitical act. When that plant, however, when that plant decides to issue that fruit for our collection or for the collection or consumption by an animal, that's also a biopolitical volition, biopolitical agency, I think. Um, so that's uh, the last message that I want to impart, uh, and that ties back to um, uh, Sandlin's notion of plant biopolitics as moral sensation. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, I apologize for any uh, distortions in the voice. Hopefully you could hear most of what I said, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this subject from, uh, from Eastern Java, Indonesia. Thank you. And I suppose the next session is the interactive session. Hello, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, am I audible, everyone? I hope so. Yeah. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, sir. Um, there are questions, and uh, there are a couple from my side. So not questions, but it was so interesting and engaging, this thought that came to my mind. Um, but first, uh, the participants. So, uh, one of the participants have asked a question, sir. So, how do these biocultural communities look at the bushfires? Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, Can I repeat it? The question is how did biocultural communities look after the bushfires? And uh, the bush fires. Yes, for those who, who don't know, of course, Australia was uh, besieged by fires uh, pretty much from September to Sugar, please mute yourself. Yes, Australia, okay, Australia was uh, besieged by fires for about six months. And that was a culmination of uh, a long drought of more than two years. And so these uh, botanical communities have been uh, very much impacted. And, uh, and that in turn has very much in, impacted the, the bio communities. Now, um, to give you an example, in New South Wales, there's a community of trees uh, called the Gondwanan, Gondwanan forest. Right? So these are the very ancient forests. They're actually uh, made up of trees called Antarctic beaches. Uh, these are the trees that existed in Australia during the last ice age. Right, not the same trees, but the same species of trees. Uh, these now exist as pockets in some parts of Australia uh, because of, you know, over, since the last ice age, the climate has warmed. Uh, these tree communities have retreated to higher elevations. And so you can find these tree communities. They're now uh, designated as World Heritage Communities and they're called Gondwanan. And that evokes the uh, Gondwanan connection between Australia South America, New Zealand, and South Africa. And uh, in the recent bushfires, about 60% of those trees were burned. Now, uh, these trees are significant for uh, Aboriginal people in a number of, of ways, of course. Uh, significant uh, for the, the mythological stories, the dreaming or creation stories that are associated with the trees, uh, but also for cultural identity. For, uh, for strengthening uh, cultural identity state. These trees have a lot of uh, very strong role in, in that um, identity formation for especially young Aboriginal people. So as these trees uh, were lost, we find uh, a real sense of mourning and sorrow among uh, communities, not only indigenous, uh, but the conservation communities in Australia. And uh, this is but a small example of what happens across um, the country. So as those biocultural communities are impacted, um, uh, there are resonances that we are uh, quite a 
while everything. So uh, there's a loss of, of knowledge, there's a loss of, loss of identity, uh, and there is a loss of spirit oftentimes, a real uh, uh, weakening of spirit. Now, if we think of the recent bushfires and their connection to climate change and the government of Australia's denial essentially of, of the connection between climate change and bushfires, that becomes even a, a stronger point of contention. So that these biocultural communities become focal points for biopolitics. Uh, and that's but one example that you can find in many parts of Australia, say with the Boab tree and its relocation to Perth, uh, very much the biopolitics at, at uh, play. Um, but, but yes, it's a good question. And I think the final answer I'll give you is that as biocultural communities become uh, transformed, so too do uh, a whole, does a whole uh, network of relations become transformed. Ecological relations, yes, between animals and animals, plants and plants and so on, but also between the people and lands. Thank you, thank you for the question. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, we are almost uh, uh, out of time, but just um, a, just a very humble query. That is, uh, uh, see the role uh, you have uh, spoken about, the role of plants in the indigenous literature uh, that is now being biopolitically used as a discursive structure by the so-called civilized societies. And this turning back, this reverse biopolitics, if I may say, we are talking of the plants. We are talking, we are, we are taking the indigenous literature up that we had, you know, marginalized indi indigenous literature in the first place, and now we are taking it back. Mm. So isn't it like layers of biopolitics at work? That's oh. the, I was just yes, that's a great point, and and absolutely that we have to think of biopolitics uh, as a plurality when we you know, think of of Aboriginal literature to begin with as a textual medium. Now there's a biopolitics at play there, uh, and um, uh, as I mentioned, the the use of certain names in a work of literature, certain names for plants or animals, that's also a kind of biopolitics. Uh, there's a there's also a biopolitics of of ecology. Uh, so you know when when the tree starts to tell the human, don't cut me there, cut me here, and you can yeah. you can create the world's first canoe if you follow this respectful protocol respectfully. And uh, that's also a kind of biopolitics. So there's a real plurality at work. And that's why I think poetry is so important uh, in, uh, in this discussion of biopolitics because it's, uh, it's, it's form. Um, I see the form of poetry as more conducive to certain uh, things like voice that a prose of course can convey, but uh, there's something in poetry, at least from my perspective that uh, it is that connects in the Aboriginal sense to the uh, oral narratives of 60,000 years and uh, the kinds of um, uh, interactions, traditional interactions that have, you know, this very long lineage. Poetry in the Aboriginal sense connects very clearly uh, to those oral traditions and uh, to this examination of biopolitics. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Ryan, thank you so much for your wonderful speech. We've really been enlightened. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. Shibroto, over to you. Uh, actually, thank you, uh, Dr. Ryan, for your wonderful session and wonderful presentation. And thank you, Dr. Sundita Chatterjee, for your moderation. Uh, we have really enjoyed the session, so uh, though there are some technical uh, problems uh, of sound, basically. So, uh, in spite of that, we have enjoyed the session. So, uh, really, we have honored our colleagues, honored by your presentation. Uh, so, this is the end of the first technical session, and uh, this is the time for our next technical session. Uh, Next technical session for paper presentation that will start from 3.20 p.m. Uh, and it will continue till 4.30 p.m. So dear pe uh, paper presenters, uh, please uh, get yourself ready for, for your presentation. And for the next session, that is paper presentation session, uh, the chairperson of this session is Dr. Deepa Nitapal. And there are uh, 
five paper, paper present tests. Uh, previously, it was four paper present tests, practically uh, one, two were actually shortlisted. Uh, so one has been included in the session and another one has been included in the next session, next paper presentation session. Uh, so I would request you all to get yourself ready for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Dipanita? Dipanita? Dipanita, are you there? Dr. Dipanita Pal? Uh, our audio is not uh, actually connected with the system. Okay, try to connect it. Yeah, even in the same. Hello. Hello. You are not audible. You are not audible. You are not audible. Try to connect over the internet. Call over internet. Try to connect to call over internet. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, now I can hear you. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're audible. Actually, we have uh, three, six minutes left. Uh, six, uh, actually, six minutes in our hand. Okay. So, okay. Uh, sure. we get ready ourselves uh, with our paper presentations now. Okay. And the okay, presentation, sure. uh, session, actually, one has been included who are in the shortlisted. You have okay. previously four paper presentations. Okay. Uh, Rajat Subramandal, uh, Rumela Shaha. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And M. Maji, as well as who has been included with your session, Shushana Korea. Shushana Korea. Okay, okay. Can you inform me earlier about that? So I have five speakers in this, right? Yeah. Right? Yes. Five speakers. Five. Your main maximum, maximum, and there after the completion of the of their uh, their 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 lecture or their. Uh, Presentation. We may have yeah, the yeah. interactive session. Okay, sure. Okay. So each and every presentation, uh, presenter will have ten to twelve minutes, and after the completion of their presentation, we may have the questions from the participants. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shubhru Thank you. Okay, so welcome and good afternoon uh, to this international uh, conference, web conference on biopolitics. And in this session, we have five speakers, as already has been told by our convener, that is uh, Rajat Shubra Mundul, Rumela Shaha, S. A. Aswin, and Dr. M. Saji. Uh, Sini K and Shushana Korea. So um, I will rather start with um, Mr. Rajat Shubhra Mundal. And what I can see is he is about to. Token is a very interesting topic. His topic is very interesting. Is, um, and he has 
given the title to his topic as is sex duty a biopolitical transformation from recreation to procreation i it sounds to be very interesting so i will request mr uh, mundol to proceed on yeah deepan nitha actually uh, the session actually according to the schedule uh, starts from yes the session actually starts from 3:20 pm now it's 3:00 okay. Okay, okay, so we will start later. Okay, 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 sure. Okay, sure. pm dipanita yeah i'm here i'll do uh, so yeah i'm here so this is the second technical session for paper presentation uh i'd like to 
I would like to hand over the responsibility to Dr. Dipani Patel for this session, the chairperson of the session, who is actually uh, Assistant Officer, Department of English, Gaulshi Mohadukalai. And four paper, five paper presenters are there. Rajut Subramandal, Rumela Shaha, Eshe Oshin, Dr. M. M. Saji, Sini K, and Shushana Korea. Uh, now over to Dr. Dipani Patel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rana. And welcome and good afternoon to all of you in this session and to this wonderful international web conference going on for the last three days from 23rd of July. And this is, uh, this is the last day of the conference and welcome you all to that technical session. And in this session, we have five speakers, um, Rajut Shubramondol, Rumela Shaha, S. A. Oshin and Dr. M. Saji, Senike and Shasana Korea. Right. So, I will first um, start with Dr. Mr. Rajat Chubra Mundal, uh, who is who is a research scholar of the Raiganj University, and his topic. Is, the topic he is going to talk on is very interesting. Uh, is sex duty biopolitical transformation from recreation to procreation? So, um, Mr. Mondal, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Okay, okay. Uh, welcome, first of all, welcome to the conference. And now I will request you to proceed on with your discussion. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Am I both audible and visible? Yeah, you are audible. Okay, okay. Thank and you. visible too, obviously. <laughs> okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, Welcome. Before wasting absolutely any more time, uh, because of time constraint, uh, uh, let's uh, get sure. down to the business. Uh, my topic uh, is, uh, I have titled it, Is Sex Duty? Uh, biopolitical uh, Transformation from Recreation to Procreation. In order to fully grasp the complex dynamics of topological power relations in Foucault's analysis of modern Western societies, we have to look at the ways in which biopower is integrated into liberal governments and modern state by the support of what Foucault calls pastoral power. Foucault considers pastoral technique by governing as a prelude for modern state and its biopolitics. Pastoral techniques are integral in constitution of the subject, but also that technique, you know, uh, by directing population in modern states spring from, very interestingly, Christian pastorate. Now, pastoral power supported the technique by which individuals were eventually located within the mechanisms of governmentalized state. Now, pastoral techniques played a very, very crucial part in the actualization of discipline and biopolitics from the very beginning of organizing state through the reason of state and its police apparatus to the liberal apparatuses of security. Now, pastoral relations were then integrated into those practices of conducting the conduct of individuals and managing the populations. Biopolitical state pretends to take care, I put care in quotation for obvious reasons, uh, care of the management of populations. Now, we all know how beautifully uh, Porijai Shromiks, Porijai levers are being taken care of by our government, whom I call return diaspora. And consequently, in addition to the Foucauldian nation, notion of governmentality, pastoral power constitutes another meeting point, intersecting point for governing the masses and subjecting individuals to biopolitical rationality and truths. It is true that Foucault did not publish an elaborated study of the pastorate and Christian techniques of the self, and thus we will have to once again rely on essays, interviews, and plenty of lectures. Uh, however, he, has, he was working with the subject until his death, and actually wrote a book titled La Vue de la Chien. It's confessions of the flesh in English about Christianity. Now, pastoral power is a power of care. Uh, no word is more biopolitically correct than care. 
And yes, state loves to take care of all of us, doesn't it? Now there is somebody else who knows one's good better than oneself. From his basis of hierarchical relationships of guidance obedience is established between the pastor and the guided. Now, pastor always takes care of the person who gets guided. Now, now obviously, therefore, care is almost a, like a biopolitical myth in that regard. However, there are only few pastors who will take care of the multiplicity of men or a population. Like that was have been the plight of the Purijai Shromi I was alluding to. And it reminds of how men take care of women by way of hugging and tapping on the shoulder exactly three times to prove their hegemonic masculinity. Now this is the Foucaultian historiography of the biopolitical techniques by which in the Western culture, individuals are constituted as subjects. And they have always been. Furthermore, Foucault claims that along with the reason of state political government began to take more and more responsibility of people's conduct. Later, I'll be talking about how state almost banged into the bedrooms, almost into the kitchens of, of these subjects. And they're no longer individuals, by the way. And from this onward, pastoral techniques of governing started to integrate into secular governments, especially through institutions such as police and medicine, and it's a medical juridical kind of thing. And according to biopolitics, uh, become, therefore biopolitics becomes integrated with the modern state and with social and human sciences, as Foucault would put. And it is clear how pastoral power, liberal state, and modern biopolitics come together to form governmentality. From the idea that the state has its own nature and its own finality to the idea that man as living being or man as a part of population in relation to an environment. Now, as a very sophisticated, it's a very sophisticated biopolitical structure in which individuals can be integrated under one condition that this individuality, that this individuality would be shaped in a new form and submitted to a set of very specific patterns. In a way, we can see the state as a modern matrix of individualization or a new form of pastoral power. I think it is absolutely fruitful uh, to think pastoral power as a technology, as a technology uh, uh, that enabled biopower to have such a profound impact on mass and population. Pastoral techniques enable people to be individualized through race, sexuality, public hygiene, medical care, etc. Thus, thus we can combine with those disciplinary, with those, again, disciplinary, I'm fond of quotations of mine, disciplinary and biopolitical techniques by which population becomes biologized and medicalized. Now, the crucial question is the relationship between the state and population. And the relation is reflected through the notion of government and governmentality. Foucault tackles the interdiscursivity between the state and population, having located the state in the broader historiography of the governmentality that originates from the Christian church and its pastorate. Now, let, let me ask a few simple questions. Why does the state become interested in the sexuality of population? Why has the state suddenly, suddenly woken up? Uh, who is sleeping with whom? And why has the state suddenly kept banging on people's bedrooms? And for example, the state has suddenly started banging in our kitchens as well of late. Now this why would obviously take me back to industrial revolution. Why? This is the why. As factories were being built and industrial revolution was in need of workers and plenty of them as well. With a long line of people willing to work, employers could set wages as low as they wanted because their laborers were just willing to get paid no matter how little, how big that could be. Now, historical studies indicate that between 1700 to 1750, that is the first half of the 18th century, just prior to the, uh, uh, the initiation of industrial uh, revolution, the population of England stayed relatively stagnant and grew very, very little. Precise figures don't exist, but from 1750 to 
1850, that is mid 18th century to mid 19th century, the post industrial revolution era, the population just boomed. Finally, we are well into Foucault's absolutely favorite century, that is 19th century, the Victoria age. The year 1835 saw pinnacle of homophobia because of a couple of discursive medico juridical praxis and some incredibly homophobic achievements. So what are these homophobic achievements? Okay, there you go. A grand narrative of heteronormativity kicking off with medicalization of homosexuality. Now, the Sexual Offenses Act 1967, in an act of parliament in the United States, citation, it legalized homosexual acts. Now, for the first time in history, homosexuality became illegal. And in Congress, Poland, Russian part of the Poland, acquired after the partition of Poland, after it became part of Russian Empire. The last known execution of her homosexuality in Great Britain, James Pratt and John Smith, now they hang, They were hanged in Newgate Prison, London, after being caught together in private lodgings. Now, next research question of mine will therefore be, why did this criminalization, this pathologization, and this medicalization of homosexuality begin in the 19th century? This is my humble answer. Homosexuality was criminalized, pathologized, medicalized because of the supply line of docile bodies had to be continued. And in order for that supple, supply line of docile bodies to continue, heterosexuality had to be legalized in all the absolute glory and fanfare. Now, once the criminalization of homosexuality got legalized, the state ideology could ensure the momentum of heterosexuality and it's totally linked to each other. And therefore, the momentum of population and the supply line of mass would continue. Once this population and supply line of mass is ensured, the interest of capitalism, market trade, commercialization, industrialization were beautifully addressed. Now, the biopolitical nexus between the sexuality of body and the politics of bourgeois capitalism got permanently ex exclusively established, therefore. Okay, then. Now we know the reason why state becomes interested in the bedroom. Now we know why suddenly state has woken up to who is sleeping with whom. Because it, it's a heterosexuality that only procreative sexuality. Now, almost sexuality becomes a duty. Why? Because whenever we are participating in heterosexuality, we are not participating in heterosexuality. We are actually participating in a national duty of producing laborers, producing industrial troops. Now, again, I have another humble response to this research gap. Now, it simply converts sexuality into a duty, almost a national patriotic duty, by way of creating family, participating in marriage, and believing that heterosexuality is love, L-O-V-E, with all capital letters. And bourgeois state continues to chuckle on the other side of the face. And since the state has already normalized only one form of heterosexuality, so love is heterosexualized and normalized and, and the caught between the capitalist trope of marriage and family. Now, we all know how much patriarchy and capitalism are in love with marriage and, marriage and family. So sex becomes a duty and one must produce population in, if one indulges in sexuality. It is taken for granted that it has got to be heterosexuality. Now, in ancient India, we had proliferation of sexualities till the civilized British, I'm sorry, British came over with their lovely penal code 377, which we kept clinging to even few months ago after so many years of independence. Happy Independence Day in advance. Power is not repressive. Power is productive. What does power produce? Power produces culture and truth. In Foucault's assessment of power over life, sexuality occupies a very distinct position. First, along with scientific discourses and disciplinary mechanisms. It is something through which an individual may be subjected. In this case, it forms an important part of production of truth about oneself at certain categorical subjects like homosexual, like deviant, like perverts, all in quotations, in relation to quote-unquote normal. And in the framework of normalizing power, sexuality, does produces a specific phenomenon in which body and population intersect each other. Historically, Foucault argues body becomes 
a political issue, a site of political contest, uh, particularly from 19th century onwards, since it enabled power knowledge apparatus to intervene into both an individual and a social body. Finally, to conclude, why do the state ideological technologies become so much interested in bios, body, life from 19th century onwards? Sex, gender, sexuality became the ideological concerns of this medical juridical Foucaultian panopticon, which is based on Mentham's theory of imprisonment because of the rise and rise and rise of capitalism and commercialization from industrialization onwards. Now, bourgeois state needs labor supplies to keep factories and urbanization flourishing. Therefore, population becomes the major interest of capitalist state. The rubric of biopower is the human body. And body is an object to be manipulated and, as Althusser would have said, interpolated. So biopower had to be tapped, regulated, and disciplined. As a result, body becomes an ideological headache to of capitalist state. Sex as recreation gets criminalized, and sex as procreation is normalized and legalized. And consequently, her heterosexuality as procreative sex becomes the only normalized cultural practice. And therefore, this transformation of sex from recreation, that is ars erotica, or the erotic art, to procreation, that is sciencia sexualis, that is science of sexuality, could be traced to enlightenment and industrial revolution. Procreative sex and heterosexuality became national duty, and since it contributes to Victorian capitalism, patriarchy, and nationalism. That's the last irony that I have, that ironically enough, during the World War II, the Allied power, Great Britain, badly needed the intellectual service of a gay Cambridge professor of mathematics to crack the German Enigma code and save homophobic Britain from the rampaging Nazis, despite all Britain's capitalist, nationalist, and masculinist British cultural codes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rajat Shubramundal, for this wonderful presentation. And of course, also for that reason that you kept the time. So, sure, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mundal. Welcome, and, welcome. Now, and now we have the second speaker who is um, going to talk on conservation biology as biopolitics, studying the Maurik Chapi massacre of 1979 as a state sponsored biopolitical sacrifice. And the speaker is Rumela Shah. Uh, she is a research scholar in the Department of English in Kaji Nazrul University. Welcome, Rumela. And I would now request you to please go on with your presentation. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Am I audible and visible, madam? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I am Rumela Shah. I am pursuing my research degree from the Department of English of Kaji Nazrul University. And Glad as to the meet title, you. Yeah. Hello, madam. As the title of my paper speaks, it is Conservation Biology as Biopolitics, Studying the Mori Japi Massacre of 1979 as a State-Sponsored Biopolitical Sacrifice. So, let me begin with my paper. So, in the Indian English Literary Circle, following the publication of Amitabh Ghosh's The Hungry Tide in the year 2004, there has been a growing emphasis on examining various narratives associated with the Sundarbans. In almost all the local and mythical narrative that belongs to this piece of fragmented landmass situated between the Bay of Bengal and the plains of West Bengal, the conflict between the human and the non-human remains constant. One such narrative that is edged in human memory from the one such narrative that is edged in human memory from the forested islands of the West Bengal Sundarbans is the historical Morijhavi massacre of 1979, where several hundred poor lower caste Hindu refugees were brutally massacred and evicted from the Morijhavi island by the authorities for violating the forest act. In my paper, I try to examine how the state's primacy on conservation of Sundarbans ecology and wildlife has been used as a regulatory mechanism to legitimize the biopolitical sacrifice of poor lower caste Hindu refugee islanders of Morijhapi. Michel Foucault, in his concluding lecture, delivered at the College of France on March 17, 1976, titled Society Must Be Defended, points out that the 19th century saw the emergence of a political rationality which makes a significant historical transformation from the politics of sovereignty to the politics of society. Agamben further elaborates upon Foucault's analysis in Homo Sacher, 
arguing that the species and the individual as a living body become what is at stake in a society's political strategies. The politics of society involves the administration of life and the population as its subjects to ensure, sustain, and multiply life, to put life in order. To put life in order, the kind of power that is exercised upon the entire population in society is what Foucault says is biopower. So as the name itself suggests, that biopower is a life-giving power, a kind of power exercised in society to make our life better. So biopolitics aims at governing the society by taking control of life and the biological process of man as species. In order to take control of life on earth, ecology becomes an important power or knowledge regime of biopolitical scientific regulatory mechanism. Ecology entered within the body of law through various forest and wildlife conservation acts. Thus, by bringing ecology within the purview of law, the state declares some spaces as zones of exception, like ecological hotspots, biosphere reserves, national parks, or wildlife sanctuaries, where both human and non-human life become objects of governmentality in the hands of the state. So what are these zones of exceptions? This is a concept developed in um, Agamben's book, The State of Exception, and later on by M. Bembe in his essay, Necropolitics. That is, the zone of exception is a special zone within the geopolitical boundaries of state where any kind of privileges or civil rights will be completely suspended and any sort of oppression or brutality is sanctioned in the name of greater good. So, in the biopolitical arrangement, conservation initiatives are like state apparatus that leads to the declaration of certain landscapes as zone of exceptions, within which this zone of exceptions actually entangles the fate of human and non-human species by bringing certain human communities within the direct purview of governmental projects to be governed and managed if their attitudes and practices are perceived as environmentally harmful and incompatible with conservation. So the next, proceeding to my next part, that who are these people that who were brutally evicted and massacred and what actually made the state so easy to to exercise this brutality on them. So who were these people? So these people in the article written by Ross Malik on refugee resettlement in forest reserves, he mentions that during the partition of Bengal around 1960s and 70s, after the Hindu upper caste landed elite, an urban and rural middle class departed from East Pakistan, which is presently Bangladesh, and migrated to West Bengal, then the communal agitation had to be directed against the Hindu untouchables who remained there. So the later refugees therefore came from the lower classes who lacked the means of survive on their own and became dependent on government relief. Lacking the family and caste connections of the previous middle class refugees, they had to accept the government policy of dispersing them to other states on the claim that there was insufficient vacant land available in West Bengal. So, these refugees belonging from the Hindu lower caste Nimno Borono identity were not given any space to stay in or around Kolkata and were dispersed to various other states, of which a mass of refugees were sent to settle down in a semi arid rocky plain in central, in central India, which is Dondo Karuno, located in some parts of Orissa and Chhattisgarh. Numerous inquiries and official documents affirm that the condition of these refugees in the resettlement camps were deplorable. In Dondo Karano, the refugee resettlement camps were set up in a traditional forest territory of the tribal people who resented the cultivation practices of these refugees in their traditional forest territory. In a uh, newspaper article, which was published by the Overseas Hindustan Times on 29 June 1937, and they, they are publishing this report that the, for the Hindu lower caste refugees, this Dondo Karuno was an alien, fertile, infertile land. So I'm quoting their report. The soil is poor and there is no irrigation. Our crops are looted by the local Adivasis, whom we cannot fight because they shoot with bows and arrows, but even more so because they get protection from the police. Thus, these poor lower caste refugees were dispersed and disposed to an area entirely removed 
both culturally and physically from the refugees known world during this time in bengal this was the time of congress party's rule in bengal so the congress government was behind dispersing and resettling these refugees to some other states the left dominated opposition strongly condemned the congress's attempt to disperse the refugees to some other states and proclaimed that if they come to power they would arrange for their resettlement of these refugees in west bengal in the year 1975 at a meeting of the eight left front parties the site for resettling these refugees was decided to be the sundarban areas of the ganges delta with the support of some top officials and the govern and the grievances of the refugees from the resettlement colonies led to the formation of their own organization which is the udbastu unnoyanshil samiti in 1975 the udbastu unnoyanshil samiti launched a national movement demanding for resettlement of the refugees in the sundarban area of west bengal so gradually refugees in more small numbers started to leave from the resettlement camps of dondo karano and migrated towards west bengal to settle on a sand bandh called the morich chok which was a part of muri jhapi in the kojba police station of sundarbans the rate of migration from the refugee camps of dondo karano accelerated when the left front came to power in the year 1977 so in the year 1977 150000 refugees arrived from dondo karano to west bengal expecting that the newly elected left government to arrange for their resettlement in the sundarbans which had been a long held left opposition demand from the may 1977 under the leadership of shotish mondol the president of the udbastu unnoyanshil samiti 30000 refugees sailed to mori japi and set up their settlement there when but when the left front shifted from opposition to governance their approach toward these lower caste poor refugees significantly changed and they started reviewing the refugee resettlement policies many refugees were arrested when they on their way towards mori japi island and driven back to their resettlement camps in dondo karano however in the meantime settlement had already begun in the mori japi island of the sundarbans by the refugees with the help of the supporters uh, with the help of the islanders from the nearby villages and some other refugees who managed to escape the police vigilance reached, reached the island and by their own efforts they established a viable fishing industry salt pan a health center a school over the following year so the settlers of this mori japi islands were already enlisted as people belonging to the state of exception to whom any kind of civil rights can be denied because they were refugees and history have shown the refugees do not belong to anyone and to anywhere they may be provided with spaces to settle but remains an outsider and those refugees suffer the most who are poor and are of lower caste so these people becomes what agamemnon says as bare life or what judith butler says as the precarious life now what happens in mori japi Mori Japi is a forested island situated in the northern parts of West Bengal Sundarbans archipelago. In 1975 the natural mangrove vegetation of this island was replaced by a government funded experimental coconut and tamarisk plantation program to increase state revenue. Although this island was not covered in mangrove forest but it was categorized by the state government as a reserve forest land. So the government attested the island of Mori Japi as a reserve forest land. and accused the refugees for violating the acts forest acts by disturbing the existing potential forest wealth and also creating ecological imbalance after several attempts when the government failed to persuade the poor refugees to evacuate this land they ordered for a forcible evacuation of these refugees the first evidence record of bloodshed on the mori japi island was on 31st january in the year 1979 when the police opened fire killing 36 people next on 26 january 1979 which is ironically the republic day of india the west bengal government became began an economic blockade of the refugee settlement in the mori japi island with 30 police launches with, with 30 police launches surrounding the island thereby depriving the refugees of food and water the refugee settlements were also tear gassed their huts razed their boats sunk their fisheries and tube wells were destroyed and those who tried to cross the river were shot at On January 27, 1979, the very next day, the government prohibited all movement into and out of Mori Japi under the Forest Preservation Act, 
and also promulgated section 144 of the criminal penal code making it illegal for five or more person to come together at any given time in the month of may from 14th to 16th of the year 1979 the forcible evacuation of the refugees reached its extreme later on many witness of this massacre reported that in may 1979 the men were first separated from the women and most of the young men were arrested sent to the jails and the police began to rape the helpless young woman at random after a vivid analysis of the estimate ross malik in his article titled refugee resettlement in forest reserves estimate that out of 14388 families who dispersed from the resettlement camps of dondo karunno with the expectations of resettling in west bengal 4128 families perished due to starvation cholera exhaustion or were shot at kashipur kumirmari and morijapi my policemen and their bodies were th thrown into the rai mongol river so the previous refugees who belong to, to the traditional elites and urban and rural middle class origin when migrated from west Beng east bengal they were easily accommodated in west bengal whereas this lower caste poor hindu refugees were brutally massacred driven away by the government from the island situated at the periphery of bay of bengal because these people were nothing more than just financial liability so loss, loss of at least several hundred men women and children was rationalized as a necessary price to pay for conservation by declaring the morijapi island as a part of reserve forest the state brings the refugee islanders within the periphery of the zone of exception where now the state can choose whose lives would become nurtured made live and whose abandoned let die in this case the biopolitical state which is obsessed with the thought of progression and development chooses to make leave the non-human at the cost of letting die several hundred precarious human lives thus when perceived through a biopolitical lens the morijapi island of west bengal sundarbans turns out to be the zone of exception where biopolitical strategies for ecological preservation and conservation entangles the fate of all living species both human and non-human that rationalizes the act of separating people from ecology and wildlife by force or displace, displacement or resettlement in the name of greater good that's all my thank you ms rumela shah for your um, nice presentation um, this the two previous papers of mr mondol and ms shah are now open for discussion and you can put your questions in the message box so as i can't see any question in the message box till now so i think it would be better to proceed on to the next presentation uh, the third one of this session which is to be delivered by h a oshwin phd scholar uh, department of english and dr aim saji who is an associate professor and head of the department of english both are from st hindu college nagarkoil tamil nadu so Mr. Ashwin or uh, Mr. Dr. Shaji, are you there? Hello. Hello. Is there? Uh, are you there, Mr. Ashwin, S. A. Ashwin, or Dr. M. Shaji, who is? uh proposed to deliver um the presentation on the struggle of self for existence i think mr vashwin uh, neither mr vashwin nor mr S dr saji is there Yes, uh, Dr. Rana. Yes, actually, uh, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, okay. Since we're actually absent now, uh, uh, okay. so we can go for next. next, next okay. We will, we will go for the next presentation, right? And that one is uh, proposed to be delivered by Sini K. Is is he present? Yeah. Right. So Sini K uh, is to. to I didn't find any detailed um, introduction for her, so I will give the responsibility to herself only to introduce herself. And what I can say is, as she is to talk about biopower to necropower, uh, Raiden on Yezidi sex slave. So, please go on. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Sini, Assistant Professor of English, uh, Amal College of Advanced Studies, uh, and from Kerala. Uh, so my paper is uh, titled uh, Biopower to Necropower, a reading on SED sex slave. So we all are familiar with this term biopower and biopolitics. Uh, with this uh, international conference uh, for these two days, we have been listening to this. So I don't have to explain what biopower is. We all are familiar with that. I'm uh, moving on to my paper. I would like to begin with a quote by Ashil MMB, in which uh, he says, I quote, the ultimate expression of sovereignty resides to a large degree in the power and capacity to dictate who may live and who must die. This is how he begins his essay, which is titled as Necropolitics. So I should say that in a world which is plagued by ever increasing inequality, uh, enmity and terror, as well as uh, by a resurgence of racist, fascist and nationalist forces determined to exclude and kill, it is difficult to survive for a minority community uh, who are labeled as infidels and no right to live. And Ashila Membi, uh, he has extended the notion of uh, biopower, which he felt uh, insufficient to account for contemporary forms of subjugation of life to the power of death. And he has extended that to necropolitics. Uh, Membi put forward the notion of uh, necropolitics and necropower to account uh, for the various ways in which our contemporary world Weapons are deployed in the interest of uh, maximum destruction of persons and the creation of death worlds. New and unique forms of uh, social existence in which vast populations are subjected to conditions of uh, life conferring upon them the status of living dead. So it is actually uh, the theory of walking dead and it shows how different forms of necro power actually over the body reduce people to uncertain conditions of life. Membi is concerned with figures of sovereignty whose central project is actually the generalized instrumentalization of human existence and the material destruction of human bodies and population. So this is about uh, necropolitics and necropower. And uh, in my paper, I try to analyze how in the writings of Yazidi women, I hope uh, you're familiar with this term Yazidi, Yazidi is actually a religious community in Iraq, so uh, in the Middle East. So I'm um, trying to analyze in the writings of uh, Yazidi women, they made it very clear that they are the survivors of uh, necropolitics or necropower imposed upon them by the terrorist group ISIS. So these women writers are the survivors who stood in the path of dead in the midst of fallen and still alive. They are the survivors who have uh, taken on a series of traumatic sexual experience and managed not only to escape a life, but to use their escape as a tool of resistance to expose the world, the plight of Ezidi women as sex slaves of ISIS and thereby resisting necropower under which they have lost the very uh, self. So here I would like to... Um, select one particular work of uh, Yazidi, from Yazidi writings, which is of uh, Nadia Murad. You, you, I, I'm sure that you all are familiar with Nadia Murad, who was a Nobel Peace Prize winner in 2018. Uh, she was a member of uh, uh, 
she is a member of azd community and she has brought to the world's attention the gendered nature of war and there are many tragedies in war of course and among the worst are actually the victims of sexual violence and uh, you know uh, it is actually how women's bodies have become battle sites and sexual violence a tool of war and murad one such victim was held captive as sex slave at the hands of the islamic state and her work which is titled the last girl my story of captivity and my fight against islamic state which actually unveiled a woman's will to fight through unimaginable trauma and torture she used her own sufferings as an instrument of change and devoted herself to survivors of genocide and sexual violence she has also reiterated the idea that rape and sexual slavery need to be conceptualized as weapons of war and treated as such by international criminal law and members of this terrorist organization isis they have organized and committed numerous acts of sexual violence and other serious crimes against religious and ethnic minorities in syria and iraq attacks against this, uh, these asides involve specific features in the targeting of men women and children according to their gender they captured civilians and the brutality uh, and they actually brutally separated men women and children their activities uh, include mass killings of men and forced conversions to islam uh, conscription of children between 8 and 18 years of age to participate in the hostilities as well as their forced conversion to islam and an organized system of sexual violence against women and girls thousands of azidi women and girls were captured by isis fighters who forcibly transferred them and kept them as sex slaves uh, for which they have used the particular term sabaya in mosul and syria azidi women and girls were often registered and photographed at these locations they were forced to live in in inhuman conditions and subjected to inhuman treatment such as rape forced to marriages human trafficking for sexual purposes body inspections and forced to birth control isis has sought to destroy the azidis through killings sexual slavery enslavement torture and inhuman and degrading treatment and forcible transfer causing serious bodily and mental harm the infliction of conditions of life that bring about um, a slow death as ed girls were considered infidels raping a slave is not a sin according to the isis militants they were no longer human beings they were sabaya or sex slaves some women and girls uh, killed themselves by cutting their wrist or throats they committed suicide while others hanged themselves using their head scarves isis fighters threatened as ed women and girls saying that any kind of resistance on their part would be punished by gang rape the we can say that um, how this azd women used their own sufferings as an instrument of change and devoted themselves to survivors of genocide and sexual violence they have also reiterated the idea that rape and sexual slavery need to be conceptualized as weapons of war and uh, Uh, here we can say uh, this azidi women like uh, nadia murad farida khalif uh, badi asan uh, najja etc they were held captives as sex slaves at the hands of the islamic state and how their writings actually unveiled a woman's will to fight through unimaginable trauma and torture thereby resisting the living that situation which uh, membi put forward uh, through the or through the term uh, called necropolitics and necro power so even though membi has um, uh, applied this term uh, in the context of africa i am trying to put that uh, or i am trying to take that term and apply here with the uh, azd community and i'm trying to prove that how these azd sex slaves they actually resisted this uh, necro power of isis militants i would like to conclude my presentation with the words of uh, nadia murad nadia murad says i caught it is not an easy thing to go and speak about the rape the genocide to say that you were the victim of genocide and rape 
but it is something that I feel obligated to do because they are following us, attacking us with the intention to exterminate us. And if they are capable of doing that, they will do that. Unless we can end the terrorism and the ideology of terrorism, we cannot feel safe. So with these words, I conclude my presentation. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your nice presentation. And now uh, I would like to take questions on this presentation as well as on the previous ones. I can see there are some questions for uh, Mr. Rajat Shubhra Mundul. Mr. Mundul, are you there? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Ma so uh, you can see that there are some questions for you in the chat box. Okay. Let me check, ma'am. Uh, the first question comes from Mr. Pullok Roy and he wants to ask you, was sexuality recreational in ancient India? Okay, okay, okay. Is sexuality recreational in ancient India? Oh, that, yeah, that, 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 that is the question. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely yes. Uh, sexuality was uh, pleasure sexuality was uh, was uh, ars erotica as i have pointed out in my in the back end of my paper uh, it is it was erotic pleasure but since the uh, intervention of british uh, law uh, the draconian british law uh, what happened that only one form of sexuality that is heterosexuality uh, became uh, normalized and uh, sort of legalized and made it and and because of that normalization or legalization of heterosexuality as heteronormativity within heteropatriarchy, what happens now, if you participate in sexuality, now you have to produce babies. Now, whenever uh, uh, you say, uh, someone says, uh, I am in love. Okay, if I say I am in love, then obviously it may basically means that I am in love with a girl. Uh, uh, and, and then the next question is, when am I going to get married? And then the next question is, when am I going to give them children? And then the next question, when am I marrying my children? So this is how this collapsing of love and marriage and friendship and, and heterosexuality became almost a, 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 a heteronormative practice that British came with their law. And yes, the answer is recreational to us uh, before, before uh, colonial draconian law. Yes. Okay, Thank we you. have some other questions for you. Uh, the next question is coming from Mr. Ongshuman Shaha and, she were, and he wants to ask you why is care by political pretense? Uh, um, may I uh, uh, have the question okay. again, ma'am? Uh, yeah, I... why is care within quotation uh, by political pretense? Why is uh, care? Uh, care. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry, ma'am. Why is care a biopolitical pretense? Biopolitical yes. pretense. Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. Care. Care is a biopolitical pretense. Always put care in uh, a single quotation. Care is a biopolitical pretense because uh, state cares you, uh, parents care you. Now everybody cares everyone. Now why is care a political biopolitical pretense? Because this whole idea of the government taking care of Puri Jai Shromik or the government taking care of you and me is, a, is an ideological myth. They never do. They never did. No, they will never take care of you. So it is a kind of a, a, a ideological hypocrisy. All they do, they interpolate you. Thank you. Okay, and the next question again is for you, Mr. Mondol. Oh, looks! Uh, I am being bombarded. Yeah, you are. You have you have uh, created a very uh, sensational uh, discussion. So, <laughs> <laughs> the next question is again for you, and this is from Swastika Chakraborty, and she wants to ask you why has state started to enter into our bedrooms? Oh, <laughs> state. Okay, 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 Swastika. Uh, you are uh, mm, you are hitting the nail on the head. Yes, a state has uh, started uh, 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 burging into our bedrooms, 
recently the uh, central government has started uh, burging in our, our kitchen uh, who yeah. will cook what <laughs> yes right. yes absolutely, yes absolutely. yes so uh, my mom cooks chicken or my mom cooks beef it's not a concern of my mom or my dad or myself it's a concern of narendra modi yes absolutely. yes and and therefore state has, you know it's a very good question by the way state bangs the door of bedrooms because they want to see who is inside the bedroom yes and if a boy is having a making a love with a boy then the state says 377 i'll inflict 377 on you because it will not give you baby and if you don't get the baby they will not get the capitalism running they will not get the market running they will not get this bourgeois uh, 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 trolley running so obviously one form of love making by the way this is called love making homosexuals don't make love only the heterosexuals they make love through marriage and production of children so now because of that a uh, state is curious about who is sleeping with whom and who is making love to whom so love is not a concern of a personal business love is an ideological biopolitical concern yes thank you okay and again one more question for you uh okay. this is from shonjon das and the question is can you shed more light on that gay professor of mathematics in cambridge <laughs> university would you like to answer that okay okay i would love to answer that yes that name of the gay professor finally i'm declaring it i have been doing uh, i have been theorizing it for a lot of late the name of the gay professor is alan turing yes uh since you have asked this question let me clarify this uh and the name of the gay professor is alan turing he was a professor of mathematics in the cambridge university in england now why have i dragged turing's name at the back end of my paper today in this wonderful international webinar is because england uh, is a nation that always celebrated heterosexuality to see how oh my oh, ian forster dealt with that in morris and others so england the kind of heteronormative heteropatriarchal nation england had always been it's extraordinary how england needed the help of a homosexual professor called alan turing to solve the german enigma code during world war 2 and had turing not solved it i mean england would have been absolutely devastated by the nazi ram nazi rampage in world war 2 the allies would have been absolutely cartwheeled now now the thing is that what did alan turing Uh, get in return alan turing was medicalized alan turing was punished alan turing was given the option of hormonal therapy because he was gay and he was uh, uh, he named his uh, in artificial intelligence by the computer is known by his artificial intelligence and 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 something that alan turing got that alan turing got the brand of gay professor so that's what you get when you help nation and what is more interestingly the whole military the whole british army the whole legion of british uh, military force could not come handy and it needed a homosexual professor to save england in world war 2 thank you i'm afraid you are not yet done mr mundol uh, there is uh, another request from ms tisha de and she wants you to explain sex as duty oh Okay. Uh is this the last one? Yeah, this is the last one. Okay. <laughs> okay, oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. No, no, this is so much love from them. You know, uh, and and is sex a duty? Yes. And no both. Let me explain why yes and why no. If we accept the British Dra Draconian law uh, which uh, criminalizes homosexuality, sex is a duty. Because when I am a bachelor. I am not getting married to any. I am not getting married, not surely any girl. And then I am not doing the duty. I am not doing the national duty of creating family, creating babies, taking them to school, keep the capitalism running. So I am not doing a duty. So therefore, sex is a duty. Heterosexual sex is a duty. And now, when we talk about the pre-British. uh uh india uh that something rud venita and selim kidwai in the ancient indian materials had been talking about then obviously sex 
uh, was pleasure sex was erotic and sex was uh, was not a kind of a national or an economic responsibility so sex suddenly as my title has said uh, has biopolitically transformed from being a erotica or erotica to being a kind of a, a draconian british duty thank you thank you thank you mr mundal for answering all those uh, queries by our <laughs> participants thank you thank again you. and we have one more presenter for this session and she is sushana korea uh, miss korea are you there yes ma'am okay okay so ms. sushana korea is a student uh, in the department of english Amy Stella Morris Collins, and she would like to talk on necropolitics in K. R. Mirrors, the Gospel of Judas. So, uh, Miss Correa, please carry on. Okay. Good afternoon, fellow participants. Good afternoon, Dr. Pal. So, my paper, I'm going to be focusing on necropolitics in K. R. Mirrors, the Gospel of Judas. This is a novella in which the author exposes the the rep repressive state apparatus and how it manipulates biopolitics in order to maintain its the sovereignty of the state and also state power and i will also be looking at how the camp is used as an exter exterminatory apparatus so the ultimate expression of sovereignty it resides in the power and the capacity to dictate who is able to live and who must die so in short this is the control over mortality so the repressive state apparatus which are the police in this novella they have control over the lives and deaths of certain rebel groups and in particular the naxalites and what happens here is the planned degradation of the human body and human dignity occurs this is how arjun apadurai characterizes it so how this happens is there are prolonged periods of torture and these periods of torture often involved uh, stripping naked beating and it resulted in the grotesque nature of the body being exhibited and this was all carried out because these rebel groups they created uncertainty now uncertainty is something that is contrary to the stability of law and order in the state so uncertainty was generated because the rsa the repressive state apparatus they are seen as the stalwarts the upholders of the national ethos and of law and order whereas naxalites whose ideology was derived from chinese communism the ideologies of mao they were seen as anti national socially disruptive people and as a threat to the national ethos and they had to be suppressed by the state apparatus mm -hmm. now how this was done is uh, through violence now violence creates a form of certainty and it becomes a brutal technique and it distinguishes the them from the us and uh, it says that violence is accompanied by a surplus of rage and excess of hatred and that produces untold forms of degradation and violation both to the body and the being of the victim it produces maimed and tortured tortured bodies burned and raped persons and disemboweled women when we read this novel we realize the the seral extent of the torture that was meted out to these naxalites in the prison camp which was known as kakayam so um the very graphic and brutal descriptions of torture um they they serve to highlight the violence that was inflicted by the repressive state apparatus and the degradation of the body it was such that even a living person a survivor of the camp was reduced to a mere shell of himself and the protagonist is in love with yudas yudas is the sole survivor of the kakayam camp and her father was one of the policemen who is full of vocational savagery and he delights in retelling these camp stories even in his house even after the camp was dissolved so we see that these ideologies are perpetuated and they also produce desperation and in addition after time these victims of the camp they are seen as victims and martyrs and instruments of freedom so the protagonist of the novel prema instead of understanding the, the atrocities of the camp as mere atrocities 
she romanticizes yudas and this is the central concern of the book and she construes him as an instrument of freedom and the idea of rebellion and the naxal movement she romanticizes the entire thing and she correlates it with freedom simply because she does not enjoy freedom under her father and we see that the body of yudas is a carrier of unwanted memories of acts of violence now yudas who is an axolite he lives on the periphery of civilization and as the sole survivor of this camp he is a constant reminder to a lot of people of the brutality of that camp he is haunted and in turn he haunts his job is to retrieve corpses that have drowned in water bodies and when prema's father who was a policeman in the camp sees him he is traumatized and yudas what happens to him is he experiences what is called social death which is the expulsion from humanity altogether and this is not just a physical or a territorial expulsion from humanity it is also a biopolitical expulsion uh, because not only does he live on the periphery in the in the camp uh, there are two kinds of life there is zo which is bare life and there is bios which is politically mandated life so the inmates of the camp were deprived of their political and juridical rights and they were reduced to bear life which was at the mercy of the repressive state apparatus and this also brings to mind hanna arent's concept of the banality of evil where we realize that evil is not necessarily carried out by evil people but by bureaucrats who are supposedly dutifully obeying orders the head of the camp is called parameshwaran and his alias is the beast about the banality of evil parameshwaran has to say in the novel the state is a big machine a policeman is no more than a bolt or a nut in it we couldn't have done anything by ourselves we were just tools at the state's disposal each one of us was like that only the state mattered and it had to stay so in concentration camps like the kakayam camp the bare life of these inhabitants it confronts the power of the camp guards and the attendants and these people they have unlimited power and in making decisions about the life and the death of the inmates and they are able to inflict punishment and con- commit the worst atrocities without sanction so the camp it was constructed in an idyllic and a, an isolated spot on the outskirts and the camp it's an extra legal space so it is a point where politics becomes biopolitics and the homo sacer that is a life that can be killed eliminated but cannot be sacrificed this life becomes indistinguishable from the citizen and the inhabitants they have been divested of political status so this is a space of lawlessness and it is very complicated to try to understand the kinds and the forms of life that are produced in these exceptional spaces and yudas as i said he lives in the periphery so these people it is said they inhabit a variety of spaces which are called zones of indistinction and um, parameshwaran has to say about these people in justification of the methods used in the camp they were unbridled minds brash adolescents hot blood how in the world were they going to know good from bad at their age their stupid actions were more than just trouble we had no choice but to beat some sense into them it had to be done for the state now i spoke about zo and bios now the distinction between a citizen with zo that is bare life and a citizen with bios that is political life the form the the citizens with bios are politically qualified citizens and they espouse the way of life that is endorsed by the state whereas the citizens with bare life they are considered as deviants so they have to be brought in line by the state or if they cannot be brought in line they have to be eliminated and the repressive state apparatus is always constructing its public authorities and this is done by the capacity for visiting violence on human bodies and we see that it's not just an effort to kill but the sovereign power to kill and also to keep the prisoners alive as they are tortured is important and in order to maintain the illusion of the state 
what the state does is it routinely outsources the monopoly of violence to various proxy agents so what we understand here is that the state does not want to claim accountability or responsibility for the gruesome torture and death of the naxals and it does not want to be publicly associated with having a naxal problem so it outsources its monopoly it gives its dirty work to these proxy agents who are the police and it results in the creation of these camps which are legal black holes and into these black holes victims of state crimes have disappeared and in this new type of war it is said that new techniques have been necessary to uphold law order and peace and among such techniques we have torture and indefinite detention and these are being defended as practices to uphold law order and the liberal democratic state and the need for a physical space to use such new techniques has resulted in the opening of these camps and the violence inflicted on these prisoners it suggests that these subjects have been reduced to the status of animals and in some cases they are rendered less worthy than animals in the book whether incidentally or not yudas is referred to as crocodile yudas that is because he dredges bodies from the marshes now this conflation between his human nature and his animal nature it speaks a lot to his being reduced to the status of an animal and with that i would like to conclude my paper thank you um thank you ms shoshana korea for your thoughtful uh, presentation and as i can see no more questions in the message box so i think it's time to sum up the whole session so in this session we had uh, um mr rajat subramondal as our first speaker and in his paper he has discussed about sexuality producing a specific phenomena in which body and population meet and how from 19th century onwards sex gender and sexuality became the ideological concern of states mid medical juridical panopticon because of the rise of capitalism he has also talked about heterosexuality becoming the only normalized discourse only because of its procreative aspect and also he has highlighted uh, as national duty for its contribution to capitalism our next speaker was ms rumela shaha and she took the issue of morichappi massacre of 1979 from the perspective of conservation biology as biopolitics where the state regulates the decision on whose lives to nurture and whose to abandon and our next speaker was um, snk who dealt with the issue of necro power and necro politics for which weapons are deployed in the interest of maximum destruction of persons and the creation of death worlds she has also taken the discussion she has also taken for discussion nadia murad who is a member of yazidi community and a nobel peace prize winner of 2018 uh, who brought to the world's attention the gendered nature of war and our last speaker uh, susana korea too uh, have taken up the issue of necropolitics to study here mirrors the gospel of judas uh, she has discussed the bodies in the novel both living and the dead as texts upon which are inscribed a profusion of institutional and ideological signifiers so this was this this was a wonderful session with with brilliant speakers uh, i would like to thank all of them and now shubhrata can i call the session to come to an end yeah yes yes, yes. okay thank you thank you will be thank you for sharing the session welcome and, uh, the end of the technical session 2 on the day so uh, our next session actually is physical session 2 and the our invited vishus parshan is there actually dr vishus a uh, faculty member department of english bodoland university assam and also the moderator of this session dr sangeeta chatterjee assistant professor uh, department of english and research
Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay, sir. We have two more minutes. We have yeah. two more minutes, right? Yeah. We have to wait for five minutes, sir. Okay, fine. Yeah. I'll just back in five minutes. But, 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 sir, you are not visible. Yeah, I haven't uh, switched on uh, the video. That's why I'm not visible. Okay. All right. Now you are visible now. Okay. You are okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so are you going to start now? <clears throat> Just one minute, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, uh, you are audible. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sanjukta Chatterjee, are you there? Dr. Sanjukta Chatterjee? Am I audible? Yeah, they are audible and the same visible too. Am I clear? Because otherwise I will be changing the headphones. Okay. okay. So, uh, this is our technical solution thing. Uh, this is special of this session, Dr. Devod Jyoti Bishas, faculty member, Department of uh, English, Borula University, Asham, and the moderator of the session, Dr. Sangeeta Chatterjee, Assistant Professor, Department of English, in charge, Center for Indian Studies, Raigon University. So now I over to Dr. Sangeeta Chatterjee, please. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. 
just a very brief query to you, Professor. Should I go on? What kind of discussion? Sorry, there is uh, some echo, uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, there is quite echo from your side. Yeah, I you will. I. I mean, you mute yourself. Hello, Sigoto. Have you muted yourself? I mean, let me see. Now it's clear, man. You, you, have, you have gone off with the video. I just wanted you to mute yourself. Because it was happening in the morning with the RAM session on. Dr. Bishash, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible now. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I very humbly welcome Dr. Devojyoti Bishash. Dr. Devojyoti Bishash is working as an assistant professor of English at, Bur at the Department of English. I mean, at Boroughland University, his research interests include Anglophone fiction from Northeast India, post colonial studies, critical theories, eco criticism, and nationalism. Was that clear? Or should I go again? No, go ahead. No, I mean, I have a, a feeling that it's not going very clear. Yeah, the, uh, the voice is not clear. The voice is not clear. I, I'll just, uh, uh, just a second, please. Madam, you are not audible. Hello. Madam, just disconnect your headphone. Just unplug your handphone. Sanjukta ma'am, just unplug your headphone.
मैडम जस्ट अनप्लग योर हेडफोन देर आर सम प्रॉब्लम विद योर हेडफोन आई थिंक Sir, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Yes, yes you Am are audible. audible? Now. Yep, yep. Am I audible? Hello. Yes, yes, you okay. are. Well, there's a problem, uh, something with my device. I can't hear. Actually, I can't hear you, Doctor Vishwas. Also, I don't know. I don't know what's the problem. Can you hear me? No. Hello. Uh, you unplug your uh, uh, microphone. You just connect it to the audio from the laptop. Direct laptop. Yeah. Hello. Yes, sir. yes, we can hear you. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. You are very feebly audible, Doctor Bishra. Never mind. It doesn't matter okay, because I'm going to speak. If I'm audible, speak. then I should like to speak, and then yeah. uh, it's okay. Like I can manage my problems later on. So let's start the session, which is getting delayed due to my technical disturbances. So as I am audible, um, uh, very uh, humbly, I would like to uh, go ahead, go over it again. Doctor Bishra has been uh, working as an assistant professor of English at Borderland University. His research interests include Anglophone fiction from Northeast India. Post-colonial studies, critical theories, eco-criticism, and nationalism. He has published research articles in various national and international journals. In 2020, his article "Policing During the Time of Corona" has been published by Policing, a journal of policy and practice, Oxford University Press. And the impasse of Kilonjia Dynasty, I'm sorry, Kilonjia Identity, is a forthcoming uh, article. By Corvinus Journal of Sociology and Social Policy, Hungary. He is going to speak today on necropolitics in post-colonial Assam, understanding the dynamics of citizenship and identity. Dr. Bishwas, all yours. Thank you. Uh, I have chosen a topic uh, which is very controversial in the uh, present uh, political uh, climate of the country. But nevertheless, I chose to address it because uh, somehow I feel uh, that uh, I'm also located within the vortex of that uh, kind of conflict which is now taking place, and seeing it or analyzing it through uh, the lens of biopolitics uh, and necropolitics will, in some way, uh, try to uh, understand how it is functioning, how how citizenship and how identity are related, and uh, uh it it will help us uh, to understand the situation better i'm not taking sides so you know i'm not conclusive or i'm not also giving out solution to the problem i'm just trying to deconstruct in a way that how uh, the things have been taking place and how um, things are uh, things could be related so how do i see uh, you know uh, this uh, the citizenship and identity issue uh, to this uh, idea of biopolitics how do i relate it now in the previous sessions uh, some questions were raised uh, somebody asked uh, professor panos uh, he is here if biopolitics can be traced 
into the time of Aristotle. Then Professor Shudhir Kumar, um, who during his uh, keynote address, challenged the very Eurocentric uh, discourse on biopolitics, serving such an approach as incomplete in understanding life. He rather considered that biopolitics is important, but not as, you know, uh, but only as an ancillary. It is not the main concern. It is only an ancillary to the many ideas associated to seeing life and politics in which he considered that the Indian view of life perceived through dharma actually leaves no room or no room uh, for the dualistic principles which informs the Western academia. So there are many ways of uh, talking and referring to or relating to the idea of biopolitics. Uh, if we go to the, the go to the coinage of the word that when it was coined, if we consider the term biopolitics as was intended by uh, Rudolf Schelan. Uh, um, Rudolf Schelan, uh, uh, we see that it is closer to the Aristotelian view. He forwarded the organistic concept of a state where the state is like a super individual, you know, uh, like we are individuals, but the state is made out of many individuals. So he terms it like super individual. Uh, according to him, uh, the natural form of statehood is a nation state, which expresses itself in ethnic individuality. Uh, Rudolf gives an organistic concept where he views state not as a legal construction, but as an original form of life, which precedes individual. So the uh, state comes before the individual, uh, but this, uh, but this form of state is indeed problematic as we see it today uh, because after colonization, after slavery, after mass movement of people from one place to another, the idea of uh, ethnic individuality and also the notion of Aristotelian police will have many challenges. Uh, so in the present context, talking about ethnic individuality is really problematic because uh, nations are becoming multi-ethnic. Uh, but Rudolf's analogy of life in understanding the state is worth considering. And I would quote him, he says, in view of these tensions typical of life itself, the inclination arose in me to baptize this discipline after the special science of biology as biopolitics. In the civil war between social groups, one recognizes all too clearly the ruthlessness of the struggle for existence and growth, while at the same time, one can detect within the groups a powerful cooperation for the purposes of existence. So uh, there is the requirement of a kind of uh, mutual existence. There is the requirement of a kind of cooperation so that life, you know, life uh, can be promoted. It should not be cut short. So in this relation now, can we, can we uh, actually consider the Indochina or Indo-Pak relation within this view of international biopolitics? So this is the kind of question which comes to my mind. Or can we see and understand the conflicts among the various communities within India? Uh, and can we actually address them uh, through this lens of biopolitics? Now, there are other theorists who have also tried to explain biopolitics through the lens of ecology and theology. Um, now, we have this German political scientist, Dietrich Gunst. According to him, biopolitics embraces anything to do with health policy and the regulation of population together with environmental protection and questions concerning the future of humanity. So life and survival becomes important for Detri. And according to him, the problems can be solved through a life-oriented politics. So he doesn't talk about death. So why do I speak about necropolitics? I'll come to that. I'm trying to relate it. So life is important according to Detri as well. Then we have uh, Kenneth Kaufman, who tried to relate biopolitics with ecology and spirituality within a Christian framework. Thus, we see the application of biopolitics in various ways of interpreting life and politics. 
seeing these various aspects, will it be then erroneous to state that the biopolitics was relevant in Greece, where uh, actually I was talking to Panos about this uh, yesterday, that uh, in Greece, the manual laborers or the aliens were considered to be essential part of the police, but they were not allowed to participate in the politics of the police. So can we view the biopolitics there? So Panos was saying like, you know, but there is a scope, it is wide open, you know, you have uh, the opportunity, it's very liberal, it is a democratic society where you can really work hard and come up to be a, a, a part of that. So that was open and ended in a way. Uh, nevertheless, I feel there is also a way of seeing that how life has been controlled in Greece. So is this not a kind of regulating the people according to the requirement of the state? So that will be the question in relation to Greece. Or I say, will it be erroneous to state how human body and its identity is crucial? Um, consider the role of eunuch in the Mughal era and how uh, in the post-colonial society, it is trying to situate the existence of eunuch in the films, in the media, in the society, how it is being portrayed. What is the role uh, of the eunuch in the public in imagination today? So all this could well be the subject of biopolitics, I think. It is a very broad area. And I'm trying to gauge the numerous possibilities in the use of the term itself. And I will uh, now come down to uh, uh, Foucault. Uh, he says, uh, Thomas Lechme, I'll, I'll be quoting uh, Thomas from, uh, from Thomas Lechme's book, Biopolitics, where he states about Foucault. Thomas Lechme states that Foucault analyzes the historical process by which life emerges as the center of political strategies. So it is life which emerges as the center of political strategies. It doesn't talk about this either, till now. Uh, so biopolitics denotes a specific modern form of exercising power. And the inception of modernity into the Indian scene, you know, with, with the coming of the colonization, actually we can say that it was the inception of modernity into the Indian scene. A uh, lot of uh, things were changed since then. So it is the inception of modernity in the Indian scene which gives the valid ground in understanding how biopolitics has entered into the state functioning in India. Therefore, biopolitics in Indian context has to be understood in continuity to its colonial past. We cannot understand biopolitics by separating today's India from its colonial past. They are contiguous, they are related. Foucault uh, starts uh, his analysis uh, with the sovereign's power over life and death. Uh, if we, if we, if we uh, have read the madness and civilization, you will see how the charge, the monarchy, or the upcoming bourgeois, you know, uh, later on, exerted its power in regulating and controlling the socially deviant population, which was transformation, which was a transformation from the medieval times, where the deviant were cast into the sheep of food. So in the medieval times, we see that, you know, the in the sheep of fools, the deviant, the mad people, uh, broadly categorized, uh, they were sent away to meet their uh, death in the world of darkness. But that had changed in the post-enlightenment world. World, It has transformed a lot since then. And, uh, and I personally believe there are historical reasons for that. Although Foucault doesn't mention it categorically in his Madness and Civilization, but nevertheless, I can see a connection in that. Uh, I think it is the beginning of colonization also at that time, which gave the state an opportunity to expand. And instead of sending out, you know, these uh, deviant people at other places, they they were housed within that uh, the, the, uh, that symbolic, you know, that uh, hospital general uh, in France. And there were such workhouses located in, in, in England as well, where these people were housed and they were made to work and they were made to produce things. So there was a capitalism which was already starting to function and there was a displacement from monarchy. It was gradually uh, coming uh, towards a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of, you know, a republic, a kind of democratic uh, society. So there was this shift also. And this is uh, perhaps uh, the reason why Foucault uh, states, he says, I'm quoting from him, it is no longer a matter of bringing death into play in the field of sovereignty, but of distributing the living in the domain of value and utility. 
see these two words value and utility so the shift was already taking place at that time in in, in europe people were uh, talking about utilitarian way of life uh, bentham's idea and um, mill's idea of utilitarianism was coming into power such a power has to qualify measure a price and hierarchize rather than display itself in its murderous splendor so it has nothing to do with you know ending life in the beginning and it uh, i mean in the in the post enlightenment period it has nothing to do with uh, its murderous splendor it does not have to draw the line that separates the enemy of the sovereign from his loyal subjects it affects distributions around the norm so it was also uh, the time uh, in the in the 18th uh, 17th 18th centuries it was also the time when the idea of race the racial identity the idea of race was making its place and uh, geographical origin language and religion be, was becoming important social markers on one hand the importance of life was recognized on the other hand there was the racial concept coming up in europe in the form of eugenics and we all know about what happened in the holocaust a kind of racial purification was taking place people are being killed so there was the question of sustaining life there was the question of you know ending life and it was also the time when modernity and industrial society were growing now you will use industrial society to end life or to sustain life so foucault states in this connection and i quote from him again how can a power such as this kill if it is true that its basic function is to improve life if the basic function of biopolitics is to improve life to prolong its duration to improve its chances to avoid accidents and to compensate for failings it is at this point that racism intervenes so racism the idea of race consciousness uh, is very important and it was entering the uh, in the social discourse in the public consciousness at that time so it is somewhere between this dichotomy the need to sustain life and also the need to kill that i will situate the necropolitics in post colonial assam so this is the theoretical orientation in which i am uh, uh, i am putting my idea about the post colonial assam and how necropolitics uh, uh, actually uh, sustains i mean not sustains uh, it actually operates now achilles membe talks about necropolitics in the context of colonial occupation uh, he talks about uh, uh, palestine he talks about serbia he talks about the places where a lot of violence is taking places uh, he is talking about rwanda the genocide which happened there we all know about it however i have borrowed this term to interrogate how biopolitics inevitably led to necropolitics in the context of post colonial assam so there is a there is a transition there is a movement from biopolitics to necropolitics and i'm and i'm situating biopolitics within the context of the colonial assam and i am situating necropolitics within the context of post colonialism so there is a division which i am making here the rise in insurgency and counter insurgency violence in northeast india and more specifically in assam is underscored by an apparent rhetoric on under development resource extraction immigration and language politics if somebody is aware about the politics and the literature mm, uh, the social discourses of northeast india and particularly assam they will know that it is always about under development it is always about resource extraction it is always about migration it is always about language politics people want more institutions to come people want modernity to get in but this is where i situate the problem you know it is very nuanced and it's very multi layered and i want to interrogate these nuances which has created a problem in assam so in a way i want to discuss how modernity has become problematic in relation to uh, colonial india in order to understand the multifarious problems that exist in assam today one has to analyze how the structural changes brought about by the colonial rule to the assamese society 
paved way for establishing the imperial structure, the imperial structure that emphasized utilitarian principles and biopolitical exercise over its subject. Now I have already told about the utilitarian principle which informed the West and how these utilitarian principles was uh, gradually um, seeking into the mind in the, in the way of uh, living of uh, the people in Assam in Northeast India. So how it got into here and how the biopolitical exercise that is the governmentality over its subject, which I would say, how it got in here and how it was done by changing the structure. Now every society has its own structure and these structures are not built in just one day. These structures come into being as, as a result of various social interaction. It's a very natural process. You know, it's an evolutionary process. But if you replace the structure in one day, you know, you just remove a structure, bring a new structure. So you just cannot integrate it the way it should have because the structure itself is an alien. But that kind of structure was introduced in Northeast India, in, 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 in India as well. We have witnessed that the strong assertion of Assamese identity and Assamese nationalism have often been termed as xenophobic. You know, uh, the, the, the Mia poets, or you say, you know, a lot of killings are happening in Assam and whatever something uh, happens in Assam, people will say, oh, okay, these Assamese people are very much xenophobic. So, but I think such kind of opinion comes from a very limited way of understanding what makes an Assamese nation. Assamese nation, Assamese people is not one ethnic community. All right, so if it is not one ethnic community, if it is a composite culture, people made up of many, I should not word, use the word race, but nevertheless to make you understand, I'm saying people from different geographical places have come here and lived here for centuries and made a composite identity. So if it is the amalgamation of multiple races, how can it be xenophobic? So, you know, if you do not know what the Assamese nation is made of, then you say that, okay, they are xenophobic. So this is uh, something uh, detrimental, I, I feel. Now, I'm not trying to justify the violence, nor the counter violence that occupy the socio-political life of the people living within the geographical space of Assam. I'm trying to analyze the necropolitics that prevails in contemporary Assam as of today by situating its growth within the historical milieu from wherein it originally emanated. If we go back in history and identify how the colonizers systematically started regulating, controlling, shaping, and informing the very cultural and material foundation, the cultural and the material foundation of the SME society, we shall be able to perceive that there was a break from tradition into modernity and how the bare life, how the zoo was transformed into bios. How bear life was transformed by the new circuit of biopolitics. The new circuit was being created in the context of colonial Assam. The starting point of this interrogation should be the official correspondence, I believe. You know, now a lot of people have to say a lot of things about what happened in the past, but the official communique, the official documents which were, uh, which were uh, written by the British, these official correspondence, they are very important in analyzing what was really happening. So I have taken this official communique, this official document as a source to interrogate the same. Now, if we read the official correspondence, we shall see that the Assamese people uh, lived through subsistence farming. You know, they did not, the idea of surplus farming um, uh, and then, you know, selling it outside for trade, it never existed in that way. Uh, yeah, there was trade, but in different way. They, in regard to uh, agriculture, they believed only in subsistence farming. And the entire area of Assam, which was rich uh, in natural resources, which was to be exploited later on. So these are the two things that we come to know from the report. Now, the bourgeois <coughs> capitalist enterprise of colonial expansion was solely aimed at extracting maximum revenue by exploiting the land as well as the human resources. So how the human resources are to be managed? If the local human resources are not willing uh, to be managed, then the resources are to be brought from outside. Let's see the, understand the politics here. <clears throat> Large tracts of dense forests wrongly designated as wasteland. Now this word wasteland is problematic because 
terra nalia, wasteland, these are the terms, you know, used by Europe. Even this word wasteland appears in Foucault's text several times. What is this wasteland? These are actually rich, uh, these are forest lands. They are uh, rich in flora and fauna. It is sustaining human life. It is sustaining animal life. These are not wasteland, but they were designated as wasteland and they were cut down. They were cleared for sea plantation and agricultural activities. These brought at least two changes in the infrastructure that allowed the colonizers to control the mode of production. So the mode of production was earlier different. And when the colonizers came, the mode of production, it changed. The local people could not cultivate the lands like they used to do in the past. And different kind of exorbitant rates of taxes were levied on the position of agricultural lands and homestead. If you are having a home, you have to give tax. Earlier, such kind of taxes did not exist. So prior to these, the exchanges were done between and among people through barter, barter system. There was no trade. You know, if you read uh, History of Assam by Edward Gage, uh, it states, you know, the mode of transaction was not cash. People exchanged in signs. But when the British came, money became important. The currency became important. So it also had an impact on the life of the people. Also, the local people were displaced from their land, and many of them were forced to work in the tea plantations because they could not pay the tax on the land they possessed. If you read uh, uh, Raj to Swaraj by uh, Amolendu Guho, uh, he talks about this, you know, the local people, uh, they were just cultivating their own land, but suddenly the tax were hiked by the British. So it was a kind of uh, strategy used by them. So when, you, when the tax is being raised higher and you are not able to pay the tax, you are forced in a way to work in some, for somebody else who will pay your tax. So this was uh, some kind of manipulating uh, the population, uh, the regulating and controlling the population. So that is the focus of this uh, you know, entire colonial enterprise. In many ways, the land came under the direct control of the British government and was allotted to people who can pay tax. Now, there was another aspect to it. Uh, by citing moral and health grounds, the British had put a restriction on the private cultivation of poppy and mandated its procurement only through government sources. And they, these, and, and they prohibited the cultivation of poppy on the basis of moral grounds. You cannot cultivate poppy and consume it. Uh, morally, it is wrong. So the British banned it. But at the same time, the British legalized the buying of poppy through, from the government sources. So if you see the, the dichotomy between law and morality, where law starts and where morality ends and where morality starts and law ends, it becomes very confusing. Because if you are cultivating your poppy at home, then that is illegal. And if you are buying the same thing for consumption from the government, then that's legal. So morality and law, they are used for specific reasons. As a result, a kind of supply demand chain was created uh, to control the market. And that is a kind of capitalist foundation is being laid. You know, you, you, you can control the mode of production, you can control the uh, consumption, you can control the market. So this is one big change. The second one is uh, when the British came here to extract uh, the revenues, they had to hire people. You know, they had created some offices and they, they started hiring people. And when they initially came, they hired people, they brought people uh, from Bengal. They brought the traders, Marawari traders from other parts of India. They brought uh, the Bengalis from uh, the Bengal. So a lot of people came in at that time. Now these two aspects, you know, <clears throat> the control over uh, the mode of production uh, and the offices, which I say, see as structures. Uh, these two affected, these two aspects had affected the cultural foundation of the Athenist society initially because they created the necessary environment for an overall structural change. For example, I'll give an example. There is a system called Pike. Those who are not aware about uh, the Ahom rule in India, uh, Ahom rule in Assam, they, they will not know about it. There is a system called Pike system. And um, in that three or four Pikes together uh, will make a goat. See, uh, this goat will function as one unit. 
and they have to render their service to the state. And sometimes what happens, one of the GOAT members have to go on some kind of specific work sent to, say, uh, the, the king sends him for a specific kind of work. So the other three members of the GOAT will take uh, care of, 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 of his family. So there was a sense of communitarian sympathy, you know, a kind of, you know, uh, relation being established. Uh, earlier, the common people used to render their service for the other members of the GOAT that helped in developing a sense of community, very much uh, uh, like the Aristotelian polis. You know, it has a structure, it has an organization, there is a sense of participation where the members of the polis do participate and the sense of responsibility is being developed from that. So that kind of Aristotelian polis, you know, I'm not saying that it is exactly like that, but very much like that also existed during the colonial, uh, during the uh, uh, home rule. And this participation by the GOAT members in various works like embankment work, dike making work, the tank making work, the road making projects, the building projects, these gave all of them a sense of collective social responsibility. A kind of social cohesion was created. This also generated in them a sense of belongingness. However, once you know, the labor is being eliminated from his work. Once the sense of attachment and the social cohesiveness is disrupted um, by the introduction of money and by the change in the social infrastructure, you know, uh, it brought about and it was being brought about by the colonial uh, administration. The social values also started eroding. You know, uh, some people from the same community is being hired by the British and they are used and these people are used against their own people. So there was also a kind of division which is created within the society and the British did it in a very grand way. The people who were employed by the British as laborers or in other positions started receiving payment in cash. This cash was then invested in purchasing the goods which were manufactured mostly in Britain. British brought the raw silk and other raw materials from Assam and they sent it to Britain and this uh, gave some kind of cash in the hand of the local people who started purchasing again from the British, the goods which were brought by the British from Britain. And this uh, was happening throughout the 18th and the 19th century. And when, um, and when um, uh, uh, Foucault, he talks about in his madness and civilization, you know, when the workhouses were being created and when some people were working in the workhouse and producing a lot of things, then there was a kind of unemployment in the other workhouses. What about the unemployment which was created in India? If you read Shashi Tharoor, how the indigenous uh, industries had been, uh, he, he talks a lot about this, how the indigenous industries have been destroyed. So you are sustaining some people in Britain, in France, in other European nations, and you are exploiting the resources here. So all this seems to be very much related, but Foucault doesn't talk about India in his book. <clears throat> okay, so uh, with this kind of change in the, in, the, in, the, in the social structure, in the purchasing and sale of things, the lifestyle of the people were greatly affected. Now, since the British wanted to extract maximum benefit, they opened up the areas to foreign immigrants. Their, their purpose was to re extract revenue, so they will take all opportunity to exploit that. Earlier, the Ahoms hardly allowed the outsiders to leave their kingdom or to enter their kingdom. Now, I am saying this again from Edward Gates, uh, that the Ahoms, it doesn't mean that people did not come to Assam. People did come to Assam, but that kind of free flow of immigration uh, of, of people from one place to another place was restricted. It was not there till 1770s, uh, from 1770s in Assam. Uh, under the Ahom rule. However, with the coming of the British, the host of immigrants not only affected the Assamese people culturally, but also economically, socially, and linguistically. And the introduction of the new education system also, uh, you know, it was uh, the new education system was introduced to morally uplift the people of the indigenous people. That is what the uh, uh, report says, the report on the province of Assam by Mills, it says uh, new education system was not introduced to give them job opportunities. It was introduced to morally uplift the people. 
since the medium of uh, education at that time was Bengali, it brought in more complications. It has time and again been alleged that the Bengalis had misled the British in adopting Bengali language instead of Assamese as the medium of instruction. And till today, this is one issue which is being raised up in Assam from time to time that the Bengalis had misled the British in introducing Bengali language uh, by stating that, okay, Assamese is not a language but a dialect. This instilled a sense of loss and deprivation among the Assamese. And uh, uh, this is well founded. But if we examine the official correspondence between the British officials, we shall see that it was some British officials and missionaries who insisted on continuing the medium of education in Bengali. So it was not the Bengalis who were doing it, it was actually the British. And uh, this is again, I'm citing from uh, the report which was published by Mills. It was in, in two official letters. They have written, they were insisting, no, they are, uh, these uh, textbooks are not available in Assamese language. Therefore, we should continue in uh, Bengali. One of the reasons. Second reason, since Assam or the Northeast was considered as a frontier of Bengal, it was considered as a frontier of Bengal, and the court, uh, the the court which was functioning there, it the official language of the court was Bengali. So Assamese cannot be introduced. So these were the logic which were given by the British officials and the missionaries at that time. And these are uh, very well available in the reports which are available, which are published, which is published by the Publication Board of Assam. Therefore, I think you know the historic discord between the two communities was premised on a misleading hypothesis. Uh, next, the people who received education uh, started looking for jobs because they felt that the objective of receiving education was to get an employment in the public offices. This is something which we still believe, that if we have education, we need jobs. We are to be given jobs because the government is giving us education, so we should be given jobs by the government. So this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, idea existed since 1850s. You know, in one of the reports which has been published, it shows like, you know, there are not sufficient vacancies and the British uh, official, uh, official uh, the, the officer is, being say, is saying, uh, we are giving them education not for jobs. There are no jobs available. Why are they looking for jobs? So these are the things which are being written uh, in the report. And this has prevailed since 1850s. <clears throat> Many of them who received education thereafter did not engage in the trade or other agricultural activities and therefore a new class of educated unemployed people were created. Furthermore, the British also brought the Bengalis from Bengal to perform the official works and whenever any future vacancy came up, the Bengalis brought in their relatives to fill these vacancies. So this was an obvious factor that created much resentment and discontentment among the Assamese people since the 1850s again. So you take away our resources, you take away our land, you build up uh, institutions here and you don't employ us. You are bringing people from outside. So obviously anybody will react. So this was very natural. So <clears throat> this entire, this movement, you know, of the vast population from one place to another for furthering the colonial interest has caused irreparable damage to the socio-cultural fabric of the Indian society. Many laborers who were brought to work in the tea garden hardly survived the journey and the ones who reached safely had to live in the most deplorable condition. You know, these tea garden laborers, even after uh, two centuries, the conditions have not improved. You know, we, uh, my colleagues are here uh, in, in, in this webinar. So we had visited uh, the tea gardens and we saw that they are living in the most deplorable, deplorable condition even today. They're, they're, nobody talks about them. We are not interested in talking about them. They have been living like that for the past two centuries. So these uh, institutions um, which were established by the British Empire, they still continue to exploit people in some way. And we are not concerned about that. We talk about democracy. Uh, the workhouse which were built in France and England uh, in the 17th and 18th century, where the socially deviant were forced to work, as uh, mentioned by Foucault, we find a parallel of that prevalent in Assam till today. And nobody raises a question to that. 
uh, some earns a lot from the tea industry but what about the tea workers uh, how much are they paid 230 40 50 rupees that's most they don't have education they don't have proper health care and there is a lot of politics going on in their name therefore the colonial annexation of assam uh, of the territory of assam in 1826 becomes the moment of departure where the old transactions and cultural life of the Assamese people were gradually replaced and substituted by the utilitarian mode of life. This is the point of departure. And this was so evident in, 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 in Europe that how the utilitarian mode of life, what the utilitarian mode of life can do. And it was introduced in Assam from 1826 when the British took over. It was also at this time, you know, in the, in the first uh, part of my uh, lecture I have told about the racial consciousness coming up uh, Foucault talks about the racial consciousness it was also at this time after the 1820s that the racial and linguistic consciousness started growing among the people of Assam the influence of the Western mode of production and cultural transformation initiated a new pattern of consumption so it is not only production it is also the consumption which plays a role that not only created competition, but a sense of cultural otherness. Now, what is this cultural otherness? You know, when you talk about modernity, you talk about, you know, at that point of time, in, today we talk of modernity in a different way. At that time, what was being a modern? So English education, dressing like them, going abroad for higher studies, so on and so forth. So you are a modern. That also produced a cultural otherness. If we, they say, say that, before the advent of the British, and the annexation of Assam in 1826, the Assamese identity was never rigid. The people did not belong to a homogeneous group, as I told earlier, they belonged to a heterogeneous group. There was openness and malleability, and this have allowed the composite culture to integrate all those who came into its context, not the immigrants, you know, not only the immigrants who have come from different parts of India, but even the Ahoms who have come in 1228 from the Union uh, province and who ruled Assam for 600 years, they assimilated into the fold, getting enriched and enriching the host culture as well. So this composite culture which was growing, which was accepting people from different places, how did it suddenly stop? Why did it become hostile towards the Bengalis? Why it could not um, consume? Why it could not accommodate the, the Bengalis uh, coming or the other people coming from different places. So these are to be viewed. That what is the problem? There could be many reasons for that. Firstly, uh, the horde of immigration. You know, lots of people come, plenty of people coming uh, to your place at a time. So that is a, that is one of the problems. The the uh, reduction in the size of the land. The uh, the growing competition. The dwindling of the resources these are the many problems which are to be seen and how the government handles it uh, will determine the, the the fate of of the nation in a way however you know uh, after 1826 as the flow of immigrants continued unabated under the british rule the local people feared becoming a minority on one hand huge tracts of land were handed over to the immigrants by the british so that uh, more revenue could be generated. On the other hand, with a new imperial structure, infrastructure, the old infrastructure was removed, new imperial infrastructure. By new imperial infrastructure, I mean the courts, the railways, the educational institutes, the tea gardens, the public offices. So all these things were created. So, you know, with the new imperial infrastructure to support the revenue generation, policing and resource extraction from Assam, Lot of people were brought from various parts, especially from Bengal. Now, documentary evidence shows that what started as imperial design to generate revenue later on transformed into a political tool for administration. You know why? Uh, why Bengal was partitioned in 1905? You know, it's not to divide. It's not for administrative convenience. It is to divide. You know, the people, uh, not on religious lines, but on linguistic lines. But later on, it functioned in religious lines as well, as we know. So, then again, you know, the inclusion of Silhet at that time. Silhet was uh, 
included in Assam in 1874, and that also in, increased the flow of immigrants. And along with the settlement policies that allowed peasants from Bengal to come and settle in Assam, only widened the rift between the two communities. Now this uh, this had been a problem since then, since the 18, 1850s. This had been a terrible problem, and since then the Assamese people have been fighting two wars. You can say on two fronts. Number one the expulsion of immigrants, secondly, the expulsion of the British. So they were fighting against the immigrants, they were fighting against the British rule in some way. So how the British subjugated the Assamese people uh, for, uh, uh, you know, 100 years and the uh, ensuing peasant revolt, which like the Pathurikhat Ron, uh, Fulogo Ridhawal, there are a lot of peasant revolution happening in Assam at that time. Then the exploitation of the uh, tea plantation uh, workers, all these are well recorded in history and I will not repeat. I'll talk about the challenges which were created at that time. The challenges were, uh, I broadly classify them. Number one, uh, the loss of land. Number two, uh, new social structures uh, were created by the European bourgeois. Number three, the immigration. And number four, the language consciousness associated with the racial identity as well at the same time. I know linguistic consciousness brought about by the introduction of printing press, education system, and vocational requirements. That is uh, specifically the language question which was emerging at that time. So these were the four uh, challenges which, uh, which was there till 1947. There were other challenges as well, but these are the four broad challenges which existed. Now, I'll come to uh, the post-colonial Assam, like, you know, after uh, India got its independence, you know, what happened? So there is a transition. Now, when you are allowed to rule, when you uh, gain independence, the power is transferred, trans it was called the transfer of power. When the power is being transferred to you, how do you handle it? The problems would have ended. Did the problems end? The problems did not end. It became more complicated. Now, the question that remained after 1947 was as to how the new state will handle the existing crisis without violating the constitutional rights of its citizens. There was a whole lot of people who have come here. There are a lot of people who were deprived of their land and resources. So how do you negotiate? How do you uh, take a policy? And I think the government, the succeeding government really mishandled the, 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 the thing which had aggravated the, this problem. Instead of solving, they have aggravated the problem. Uh, at various times, you know, we will see how people had been brought into Assam and that had really aggravated the problem. Now, uh, the real challenge had been like, you know, how can you restore what had been lost to the indigenous people? At the same time, um, uh, how do you do justice with the people who have come here prior to 1947? Now, this is a very complex situation and it has no simple solution. Uh, there were other problems which existed in Assam and these are also to be understood in relation to the earlier problems which had existed. Now you see in the news, uh, the, the, the damages caused by flood, it comes up every year. Every year the flood not only causes uh, uh, loss to life and livelihood, but it also erodes a huge chunk of landmass to the, from the areas adjacent to the Brahmaputra river. The classic example being Majuli. Now, the people who lose their lands, agricultural lands and homes, they become landless and they go in search of a new home and new agricultural lands. Now, in this relation, I will uh, refer to one particular instance. It's the digression, but I think I should say this. There was a man who had, uh, whose name was Sanjay Ghosh. Uh, those, who are, uh, those who have read about uh, the history of Assam, the recent political history of Assam, they will definitely know about Sanjay Ghosh. Now, he was uh, actually working uh, for the poor people uh, in Majuli. He was trying to make them socially aware. He was working for the society. Every year, there was loss of land. So he was using the local uh, uh, technology of, you know, making the dikes with bamboo to prevent the soil erosion. He was successful. But when he was successful uh, in his endeavorance in helping the poor people, why was he killed? Every year, the government earmarks a lot of money for the construction works. The, the, contract, the contractors take up this. A percentage of these definitely goes to the... the uh, the politicians. So these contractors who keep on doing the same work year and year over again and keep extracting the 
money from the government, the taxpayers' money. So if somebody opposes that, not directly, but you know, by helping the poor people, by uh, creating a structure which will stop uh, the land erosion, you're, you're, you're posing a threat to those people. But you know, um, uh, it was said that he was not killed by the contractors, he was killed by the Alpha at that time. And we all uh, know that how the nexus of contractor of the Alpha and the political leaders were at that time. Now it has been well exposed how Alpha had been used as a tool, as a state tool. Uh, that uh, um, um, the presenter before me, uh, she was talking about the police being used by the state, you know, but the rebel organizations are also used by the state, not only the police. Now, this was one problem. Second, uh, Assam was producing a lot of coal, a lot of tea, a lot of oil, and other minerals. And a hefty amount was being added to the exchequer of the Indian government. But the region had received very little attention regarding the development. This was the second issue. Third, the competition for jobs and land, hold, land holdings brought the indigenous people in direct conflict with the immigrants. These were also the problems which existed in the post-colonial Assam. Uh, these were also the initial issues which had been raised by the conscious citizen uh, and the civic society, I would say, and the political leaders in Assam from time to time. However, very less has been done to address these pertinent issues. The language question remained. The immigration issue uh, uh, was addressed by various leaders, but with uh, political limitation. You know, they addressed uh, to show the people it was only a facade. You can say, oh, we oppose the immigration. It was only a facade, you know, but there were immigration people who were uh, coming all the time. So it was only a facade in a way. The Assam Sahitya Sabha, it, it, it promoted on the language front, it worked on the language front. All of some students' union, it, uh, it fought against the exploitation of resources and the immigration of people into Assam. So there were different civic bodies, there were different organizations and leaders who were speaking about this from time to time. Since the state government and as well as the central government failed to solve any of these uh, above mentioned problems, and instead abated the immigration of people from East Pakistan, the patience of the people finally weaned away. It, you know, it, it eroded away and it culminated into what we know historically as the Assam movement, which started in um, 1979 uh, and we, which ended in uh, 15th August 1985 with the signing of the Assam Accord. That is a very important book in, in this relation. Uh, Assam, the Accord, the Discord by Sangeeta Borwa Pisharoti. It gives a lot of insight into the politics that went into the bringing of immigrants, uh, killing of people, you know, the necropolitics. And it is within this socio-historic background that the necropolitics has to be viewed in the context of Assam. That who will live and who will die? Who decides that? <clears throat> in the years uh, preceding the Assam Accord, uh, it was one of turmoil and uncertainty and very and every uh, uh, political party wanted to take advantage of it. Uh, Pisharot, Sangeeta Pisharoti, uh, in her book, she writes that in the Congress government, which was at the center in 1974, tried to make use of the illegal immigrants as their dedicated vote bank. The position uh, fully exploited uh, the opposition fully exploited this opportunity but could not make any damage to Congress in Assam in 1977 election. However, in the following years, there had been a major shift in voting patterns. As Congress tried to make use of illegal immigrants as their voting bank, the Janata Party in Assam appealed to the Assamese society through ASU to resist the Congress who they alleged had been sheltering the illegal immigrants. Along with Janata Party, Bharatiya Janata Party, uh, sorry, uh, Bharatiya Janata Sangh, and the Rashtriya Swain Sabha, what we know as RSS, they had been supporting the ASU to resist the immigrants. However, there was an ideological difference between the RSS and the ASU. The ASU protested against all kinds of illegal immigration. But the RSS rather wanted the Hindu Bangladeshis who have come. Uh, there is no other homeland, so they have to be settled here. That had been the stance of RSS in the beginning. 
but uh, asus stands is very clear no this is our homeland and immigrants are immigrants we cannot divide them on the basis of uh, on the basis of religion now uh, with the right wing hindu group backing the protest of the asu it provided the right wing muslim organizations they were also working side by side jamaat e islami and jamaat e ulama i am putting this from uh, sangeeta borwa's book uh, who had cited this uh, these two groups they would the muslim immigrant population to their side creating a polarization of both banks on religious lines <clears throat> now organized violence had rocked the region since the days of assam agitation or assam movement not only the civil civilians but also the government officials fell victim to it on 6th april 1981 the commissioner of assam it's a very important position see the commissioner of assam his name was es parthasarathy he was killed in his own office uh, you know through a time bomb he was blown off so in in a, in a powerful person like the commissioner of assam is being killed in his own office somebody must have come there and fitted the time bomb there so you know how the things functioned at that time you know who was the friend who was the enemy and the government officials are helping whom who is whose enemy who is to be killed it became a very messed up affair at that time so somebody somebody as powerful as a commissioner of assam is he is being killed in his own office by a time bomb many uh, doctors engineers based on their ethnic identity had been ruthlessly murdered by the mobs so these are historical truth it cannot be denied uh, thus began a spree of violent human slaughter since then that culminated into the regime of anarchism based on communal identity and the infamous nelly massacre you know uh, japanese had done a research work on that and the book is uh, on nelly massacre had been published it documents uh, very objectively uh, what happened what went uh, before that went after that and you know uh, people talk about it till today so in that nelly massacre 3000 people had been killed where is the immediate cause of the massacre was cited like you know the government was pushing for the 1983 assembly elections but pisharoti and sanjay hajarika they are of the opinion that the immigrant population in the tribal belt and block area community conflict and rumors have actually triggered the violence so you know uh, it's not the election which is the de facto uh, the actual uh, cause of the violence but it had been the other causes which are in the background and this has been cited by uh, sangeeta borwa pisharathi and sanjay hajarika uh, in his uh, rights of passage uh, although the information uh, uh, but you see the another aspect to this is like although the information about the violence was communicated beforehand it could have been stopped but although it had been communicated it did not stop so this raises some kind of doubt you know who is operating behind this you cannot really say Uh, who, whether uh, whether uh, the state agency or whether the politicians or whether the underground, I mean, or whether the civil society, who is wor working and how it is working, it is very difficult to say. But you can realize it the way it is functioning, and that's why it is relevant to talk about all these things. So this Assam agitation actually, which began on Gandhian model, you know, through Hartal uh, non-violent model, it took a very ugly turn. and it took many innocent lives and with the murder of uh, this man called khargeshwar talukdar it further added fuel to it and then there was a spark in communal violence and it followed unabated and then the inception of alpha it added another ch chapter into the infamous killings in assam and what started as ideological war ended up as killings for extortion you know alpha they had been ideologically very strong helping the poor people running a parallel government kind of parallel government where you know people who do uh, you know who do socially uh, nefarious work they will be punished uh, the doctors cannot practice uh, out, um, outside the hospital the teachers cannot um, give tuition who are working in government institutions so they started regulating it was a good ideological thing that they were doing but at the end it ended up like you know the, it ended up in extortions and killing innocent people at, at the same time now uh, sanjeev borwa he sanjeev borwa is a kind of authority uh, when you talk about nationalism in 
Assam or Northeast India. He has done a lot of research work. Now he quotes from Didi Thakur. He says that the loss of faith in the efficacy and the credibility of the government apparatus is so great that the distinction between Alpha, a rebel group, ASU, a civil, uh, a civic body, uh, body, a civil society representative of the civil society, and AGP, a government body, the one who is running the government. The distinction between these two, which existed at some stage, now remains totally obliterated. Who works for whom? Uh, you know, you're not sure. This is say, this is quoted by Sanjeev Borwa in his book, The Durable Disorder. Now, later on, this situation was exploited by the political forces further, which successfully drew a wedge within the Alpha by creating lucrative opportunities for the surrendered Alpha members. Now, among the Alpha, uh, who, who's, uh, who, who actually the Alpha never talked about as such, you know, about the immigrants. Or they understood, they realized that the state cannot do justice, so we should uh, form a sovereign, a separate um, state. Uh, we should be uh, creating a separate nation. So that was their ideology. Now, within the Alpha, there was a group which was created. They would surrender, and these Alpha were used by the state to hunt and kill the members, uh, the family members of the Alpha. So, you know, the people are turned against themselves and they are used by the state as a kind of ad hoc inter, uh, ad hoc counter insurgency force. Uh, according to Sanjay Hazarika, which he writes in his book, Strangers No More. So, you know, you see the anti-immigrant thing which started here, it lost its relevance then and and it, it started it started with a different cause and it ended up with killing a lot of people and how this is happening and how the state is uh, organizing or how the state is trying to control the entire thing should should be the focus of the necropolitics and if we bring its relevance today we see the anti-immigration issue uh, has been raised up again with the bringing of the citizenship amendment act and uh, in this relation, there are other issues like the detention centers, uh, which are being talked about from time to time. If you, there are no separate detention centers in Assam. The 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 the, uh, the jails are being transformed into detention centers. So you lose uh, their the identity whether you are a criminal or you are a detainee, uh, detained. You are being detained there. So you are not a criminal, but you are living with the criminals there. So these detention centers are. There. And many people who could not prove uh, their identities, maybe they are not aliens because some of the evidence have come up recently. You know, in in in, in Barpeta district, uh, one recent evidence was found that all the members of the family are Indians. Only one was uh, could not who could not prove his identity. He was sent there, and eventually that person died. Such thing happened in Gualpara district also. His name has also come in the NRC, but he was detained wrongfully and he lost his life. Lots of people have died in the detention centers. And then this kind of, you know, uh, controlling the life of the people by threatening them, uh, it had been evidenced the way the D voter thing had been handled. Nobody is denying that there are um, immigrants, there are illegal immigrants who have come uh, to, to Northeast India. Nobody is denying that. But again, there are innocent people, and who who will um, who will vouch for them? Who will save them? Because at times, what happens? Uh, the police who are to the the border police who are to visit those villages and find out if there are illegal immigrants, they just randomly pick up names. They just randomly pick up names and say that okay, these are illegal immigrants, and the onus is on you to prove now that whether you are. A Citizen, and then your name is listed as a D voter. So once you are a D voter, you cannot have many privileges of being a citizen. So you lose your citizenship. So how do I control you? How do I exercise my power on you? If you are a citizen, if you are a legal citizen, I cannot exercise my power on you. So I take away the citizen, not directly. I say, okay, I doubt you as a citizen. So in that way, I cartel some of your rights. And then I operate. That is the mode of operating, uh, you know, operating in uh, something that's going on. And one of the victims was Mahendra Mohan Chaudhary, the, uh, the famous person, the uh, uh, chief minister. So he belonged to a place where there are a lot of Bengali Chaudhary's and 
that random deletion of names was happening and his name was also included and his name was cut off from the voters list so he also became a victim of that but since he is a local and, and he was an Assamese, he 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 rescued himself from that position so this is the state of affair which is happening in assam and this is how i read the necropolitics that how it controls the life and death and at the end i would like to refer to uh, the killings which took place in 2018 near uh, Dhala Hodia bridge uh, uh, this anti car or anti cab um, uh, thing was going on and there was a lot of debate going on uh, people were threatening you know on social media on television that okay if the car is passed then we will kill the Bengalis we will kill them we will kill a lot of people and it ended up actually in the killing of uh, five innocent people who had nothing to do with this agitation, who were living here, who were, who were, you know, citizens. They were killed. By whom? By unknown militants. And who has provoked these militants to come and kill them suddenly? And why were they killed? Based on their, based on their names. Because they had a name which revealed their identity. So this is how necropolitics is being functioned. Now, who is, I'm not saying that somebody is to be blamed for these or uh, how can we handle the situation. I will end my talk with a reference to, to a particular text, which will actually help us understand the situation better. Now, if we try to blame a community for what has been happening in, in Assam, if we try to blame the Assamese community or any other community for that reason, uh, there are a lot of organizations which are fighting against government atrocities, against the uh, against the immigrants. Uh, if we try to blame them, will that be the right thing to do? That uh, what is forcing them to take such kind of drastic action? What is the way out? What is the responsibility of the government actually? The people who are in power, who can really make a change, who can really make a difference? Are they really acting sensibly? So these are the questions we need to ask instead of blaming. And I will relate to one particular text. It's a, it's a novel by uh, Pankaj Seksharia. The name of the novel is The Last Wave. Uh, it's a fictional work. Although it is a fictional work, it is based on research. There is another book by Pankaj Seksharia, um, The Island of Flux. So it's a collection of essays where he actually, in this novel, he shows like uh, the island of Andaman and Nicobar. There were a lot of uh, uh, indigenous people living. Those are the homeland. They had been they had been living there for thousands of years. But once you know uh, that you know people started, uh, people were shifted to the jail, the Kala, Kalapani, you know, Sajaya Kalapani thing. The people were shifted to that cellular jail, and when they were released, they were given a plot of land in in in, in that region. So that they can settle down there so the story starts like that you know a person from pakistan and a person from another part they go and how they meet up there and how after being released from the jail they marry and they settle down and how the colonization process of the andaman and nicobar island had begun you know i think that andaman and nicobar island can be seen as a miniature of what is actually happening in the amazon or what is actually happening in assam now these uh, indigenous groups if you see the data, you will see the the. If you see the data, you will see that the population is coming down day by day. Some of the tribes, some of the indigenous tribes, they are they are no longer to be found. Uh, one particular tribe, I think, is Onge. You know, it's totally obliterated. It's totally gone. They have died out. Why? The question remains why. They remain outside the outside the biopolitics. We view them as something uh, savage. We 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 try to intrude into their space. And since they cannot fight back, we are gradually grabbing their land, their flora, their resources. And today the population strength is so big in Andaman that it is actually causing damage to the island. The flora and fauna is being damaged there. Who is responsible? The colonization process, the people who are migrating from here to Andaman and Nicobar Island, and the indigenous people, the tribal who are living there, they cannot fight back. They do not have the means to fight back. Since they cannot fight back, since they are not participating in the, in the politics, in the decision making, they are not 
taking part in the decision making you know uh, in the strategy making policies of the government they are reduced into nothing they are being you know they are being uh, killed in a way we are participating in their extinction now if we read this novel and just imagine uh, we feel bad for these tribes who are dying out in Andaman and Nicobar Island. Had the tribes, had the people of Assam been not resisted, have they not resisted, they would also have met with the same fate like that of these tribes in Andaman and Nicobar Island. So that is, I think, is very relevant to understand that nobody is responsible in a way except the state, the, the political force which is operating behind the state and which is trying to exploit the resources you know and behind all this there is the structure the capitalist structure which is i feel responsible for today's uh, condition the condition that which was created in the in the colonial india in the 1826 has culminated uh, the, the condition which was created in 1826 in assam has culminated to this kind of necropolitics today so there is a relation in understanding that with this uh, i end my talk Thank you for uh, listening to my lengthy talk. I do not know if it made sense to you. I tried to bundle up a lot of ideas. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much, Dr. Bispas, for a wonderful appraisal of the condition of necropolitics as we understand it today. Necropolitics, as I believe, as I have so wonderfully learned from your talk, circumscribes life, it circumscribes life as it is lived at present. So instead of being detained physically, one is forced to live a life of unliving. The identity of a deviant who is identified as such by the state, itself is turned into a problematic condition to serve the military diplomatic economic needs of governmentality. So basically it is as we would like to say, the inheritance of loss. So uh, it's a very wonderful, very insightful sessions and a session, and we have uh, lots of questions. But sir, uh, due to the time constraint, I would only be very happy if uh, we could just focus on one or two questions. Um, so there's a question that uh, asks you about power being concentrated in a particular axis or does it thrive at multiple location or institution? It is related to your question, to your reading of the power gain as you talk about it throughout history up to the post-colony. So how power and necropolitics is actually related? <clears throat> See, uh, I think I have already addressed this uh, thing in the beginning of my talk. Like, you know, uh, how this uh, thing had actually see we have it's a very it's a very uh, uh, wide wide world having lot of social structures you know uh, in, in in if you talk about assam you know if uh, if we if we refer to assam before 1826 what was happening in here was there peace was there um, no no uh, no problem in here there were that's how the british had entered uh, the northeast india See, the, the Burmese who had taken over Assam, which is referred to as Manor Din, you know, it is a, the most fearful, the most abhorrent, you know, historical, historical phrase, you know, phase which the Assamese people had ever faced. People were being killed mercilessly. The womb of the mother uh, is cut and the child has been taken out from there and it's been thrown to pluck mangoes. That was the kind of society which uh, the Burmese gave, you know. The Ahom had a better society. The Ahom were disintegrated because of the Moa Maurya rebellion. The Greek had their own problem. Uh, there was the conflict between democracy and oligarchy. So different kind of societies were there uh, and which tried to control their population. There were dust, there were slaves in Europe, there was dust in, in, in here. And, and I was reading it somewhere, you know, the women who had been uh, Maniram Dewan, Maniram Dewan wrote a letter to the British uh, citing that, you know, you, are, you have done a great job. Uh, there were a lot of uh, bad things happening in Assam. People were being killed and women were being carried away from their homes forcefully 
prior to your coming. So you have rescued us in that way. But there should be equality. If you are not taking tax from the British, then why are you taking tax from us? He was arguing in that. So what I am referring is here, like taking away a girl forcefully from. So a lot of violence, a lot of things had existed everywhere in the world. Now how it has been rationalized? When rationality came into being, you don't find rationality in killing people, but in regulating their lives. And I think the capitalist or the bourgeois class, the petty bourgeois or the bourgeois class which was coming up, they thought that it is wiser to regulate life. Why to terminate life? If we regulate the life, we can, we can increase our uh, capital. We can increase the production so that we can increase our capital so that we can maximize uh, our benefit. So there was this idea of regulating the population. And right. when it was taken by the national socialists, you know, in case of, uh, in case of Germany, where it was taken up by the national socialists, it took a different form. It took a different form. They, they believed in the purity of races. They believed in, okay, like the environment uh, and the biological determinism. They did not talk about biological determinism directly in the beginning. They talked about how the environment can facilitate to bring the best in you. But for that, selective genes will play a part. So some to be rescued, some to be killed, to be obliterated. So it existed in different forms in different societies. Now today, India can go war against China, China can go war against India, but they are not engaging in war because there will be huge financial losses involved. So it is like, you know, today, in today's world, both biopolitics and necropolitics are functioning in their own way. And it is totally in the hands of the capitalist forces. That is what I personally believe. When I try to analyze things, I always see that the capitalist forces are functioning underneath everything. Right, sir. So there's a, a very good uh, um, observation on, and a question on the part of Professor Panos Iliopoulos. Mm -hmm. He is, uh, he has congratulated you on a wonderful lecture and he writes that, uh, how could we negotiate with the regional population a biopolitical view of modern politics and how would we communicate this possibility for the implementation of biopolitics to these same populations? Okay. So uh, it again depends on you know the kind of uh, government you choose, and I think the police, the Greek police, it had a very small population. Um, it has a very small population, and it was very easy to regulate that. You know the population was not different from the state. So the the well-being of the population was the well-being of the state. The well-being of the state was the well-being of the population. But when there is a injunction when modernity comes in wherein there is a uh, in the new liberal world where borders can be crossed no doubt it is under scrutiny but again you give safe passage to uh, to ideas to move around with the products coming along with the ideas it is very difficult to negotiate in that case i think uh, regionality itself will if you talk about regionality people will say okay that is a very parochial way of looking at things you are not liberal but again in the name of a liberal regime the big countries the big organizations in the name of modernity the big organizations organizations are eating away the smaller organizations so i think there is a need in the change of uh, you know micro politics not a macro politics a micro politics is required and i think you know the idea which prevailed during the Greek time, the idea of the police, it's, it's a wonderful idea. You know, that is the best way. But how can we implement that in, the, in, the, in a, in a, in a, in a post-colonial society? It cannot be implemented. So I really do not know how it can really be negotiated. I can see only more problems coming in until our leaders become sensible and, you know, they do not plunder the resources and give uh, good thought of regulating the life in a in a in a in a in a, in a moral moral ethical way, you know the moral and ethical aspect, the spiritual aspect of life should be given more relevance instead of the utilitarian way of life. So that is one way I think which will be helpful in in, in solving the problem. So uh, would I like to put in the word Tiaga, the philosophy of Tiaga in our Hindu philosophy, in our Indian philosophy, I should say. 
thank you so much sir, for a wonderful lecture, Dr. Debarjoti Vishwas. And um, necropolitics could not have been more relevant if we had not been in the throes of a pandemic right now. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Shubrato. Uh, I hand over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, for your uh, very wonderful presentation and at the same time, very, very provocative presentation. And, and thank you, Dr. Chatterjee, for your moderation, for actually moderating this, this, this session. Uh, so, this is an ancient. Uh, 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 I, I, I want to say something. Can I? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah. I can see, you know, there are a lot of questions, you know, there are a lot of questions uh, which there are have been posted. Questions. Yeah. And actually, you know, uh, I will definitely like to connect to each of those people asking the questions personally, and I'd like to engage in a discussion with them because I'm working in this field. I'm interested. So if I can improve my argument, if they can help me in doing that, definitely I will be connecting to them. So uh, please share my email address and phone number with them so that I can carry forward the discussion. It's for my own benefit. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Yeah. Really, yeah. presentation of, um, that you have presented today. So this session is over now. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, that is you also, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, so, thank you, thank you. Uh, we are already 20 minutes late. So, this is for the, uh, this is, this is actually the session for the paper presentation that is technical session four. So, um, the chairperson of this session is Dr. Rumpa Das, Principal Mahispala College, Kolkata. And there are five paper, uh, paper presenters. Uh, so now, uh, now, please, Zumba. Yep. Am I audible? I think so. Yeah. Both visible yeah. and audible. It was yeah. nice uh, listening to Dr. Devojyoti Vishas' extremely enlightening uh, talk and uh, finding my dear sister and friend after such a long time. Uh, hi. <laughs> uh, I must uh, thank uh, Dr. Shubhroto Rana for giving me this opportunity to uh, chair uh, a session which has uh, five extremely promising presentations, uh, two on films, one on a play, and uh, another on, uh, and other two on two literary texts. I welcome Professor Mohana Chatterjee, uh, Professor Himangshi Kashyap, Dr. Devomitra Chakraborty, Ms. Nabonita Paul, and uh, Professor Lizia Nazareth to the fourth technical session of this uh, international webinar. Shubhroto, is there anything you want to say? Just sorry to interrupt you. Actually, we have actually just one hour left for our next session. Okay, so we have at the same time five paper presentations. So uh, please try to actually manage time with really time. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, with your permission, can I uh, ask my uh, dear paper presenters to wrap yeah. up their papers uh, by 10 minutes so that we can have a bit of time for questions if there are any? Right? So, uh, around about uh, 7.5 to 8 minutes if I, I remember and I don't get too much engrossed in the paper I will be <laughs> giving a small uh, nudge and uh, then we absolutely stop at 10 minutes is that okay Dr. Rana? Okay, okay. I, I feel uh, myself to be like you know a, a bit of a very strict school teacher uh, in you know actually stopping people please don't talk but well uh, uh, there's uh, very less we can do, but without further ado, I want to move on to the first presentation of the evening, which is going to be this, uh, given by uh, Professor Mohana Chatterjee. She uh, is an assistant professor at Amity University. Uh, Mohana, are you there? Yes, ma'am, I'm there. Am I on? Okay. Uh, hi, Mohana. Hi. Yes. Uh, so, Good evening, uh, Mohana. Good evening. Uh, Mohana is going to talk on the unbearable displacement of being, a refocus on Ritik Ghatok's uh, Meghe Dhaka Tara. Uh, and uh, uh, Mohana, it is my extremely unpleasant uh, job to restrict you to uh, eight to 10 minutes. So 
please. I, I, I advise you to give sort of a gist to your entire paper. I was just reading the thing. So over to you now, please. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'll be doing with the presentation. So uh, if you don't mind, may I please share my screen? Yeah, sure. Um, yes. Uh, is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes, it is not yet start. Right. So I start my presentation on the topic, the unbearable displacement of being, a refocus on Nita in Ritti Ghatok's Meghadhaka Tara. So I start with a quotation from K. Munshi. Uh, the quotation goes, uh, we have now a homogeneous country, though our frontier ha frontiers have shrunk. So K. Munshi stated it on 14th of July, 1947 at the Constituent Assembly of India. And uh, this uh, actually, uh, he had said this in his, this effort towards political homogenization that led to Bengal partition of 1947 and the subsequent violence it perpetuated. Violence not always measured by external acts of murder, loot, rape, but violence typifying a state of fear of being dispossessed and the fear of not belonging. So if we come to uh, Cyril Ratcliffe, uh, Sir Cyril Ratcliffe, the chairman of the Boundary Commission, had less than two months to separate India and Pakistan. So he was a lawyer by training and had very little knowledge about the social, demographic and cartographic realities of British India. So the hurriedly drawn Radcliffe line gave birth to multiple disputes and over 2.5 million displaced beings, the humanitarian crisis sees individuals reduced to a statistical footprint of political and historical forces. Uh, now, if I move on, uh, as we already know in the concept note that uh, it is already given what we mean by biopolitics, we are referring to the intersection and the uh, incorporation of life and politics for Foucault. Life cannot be uh, understood in terms of biological process. Instead, life must be understood both as an object and an effect of political strategies and technologies. So in this presentation, therefore, my focus would be on how the formation of the Radcliffe border trans transforms the human nature interaction that played a prominent role in the partition writings and also in the films of Prithi Ghatok. I'd like to look into the idea of being and of, of the being being in quotes in interaction with the presence of place and placelessness characterizing the migration. I would like to trace, uh, this carries the trace of the past place into the new experience of the placelessness and it is within this that the identity of the individual that is formed. Now displacement due to the hurriedly drawn political border affected Ritti Ghatak's life in an insurmountable way which was metamorphosed into the experience of, experience of Nita, both as an individual being and, as the meta, and, and the metaphor of experience of refugee woman. So Nita was acting both as an individual being and also as the metaphor of the uh, refugee woman and their experiences. So if I move into the first clip that we get to see in the film, you see the tree uh, deeply rooted and Nita rambling her way back home and in the background, the mammoth tree perhaps suggesting that Nita is actually like the tree giving shelter and refuge as an individual to the family. And uh, Aghatok aptly uses this uh, backdrop. Uh, so if you move to the second screen, we find Shekhar, the brother who is unemployed, chasing his own dreams. Uh, singing a rag and you find the train looming in, perhaps carrying the refugees from the other side of Bengal and Nita coming from her toilsome war. And if we move to the third uh, screen, we find a very, very iconic uh, symbol where the Nita slippers tears off and this suggests like many, many other refugee women uh, this travel was, this toiling hard was not for any entertainment, but not for any adventure, but it was a need of survival and sustenance. 
So I try to equate uh, Nita, the body of the woman with the land, land which we regard as Bhita or Desh. So Desh has uh, connotations with Mati, Bhita, and Mati meaning Ma and Prakriti in relation to Purusha. So Nita stands as the uh, symbol of the Bongo Mata or the Bongo Janani. So if, if I, I take into consideration another iconic image used by Ghato, we find Nita, uh, Nita's face getting bifurcated, which I can equate with that of the land. Uh, the, so the bifurcation of the land, uh, as you see, gave into something really uh, traumatic, uh, traumatic uh, as in rape, abduction, dislocation, and diaspora. And you also find the fragmented self of Nita, Nita as an individual being. So uh, a comparison can be sought uh, in that way. And also the bifurcation of the land uh, gave economic independence to the women. We could, uh, we could see that there was the adaptation and assimilation. We could see that the woman got into education. They found their marital security. And so does Nita. Uh, we find also Nita trying to be, trying to emerge from a colony woman to, uh, to somebody who uh, just moved out of the house, broke the shackles and tried to, uh, tried to earn bread for the family. She was the Shindhubad Nabi as used by Bongshi Dotto, the grocer in the film, the term that Bongshi Dotto uses for her. Uh, there is also a Bhati Ali song that is used in the film. Many of us uh, know Maji uh, uh, so there is a song that that she is going to speak uh, that that is related to her. So with this, we move to the fertile land of Bengal. Uh, uh, so the fertile land of Bengal. It is related to the archetypal mother figure. It is encapsulated with the rivers, the Padma and the Ganges, and also the uh, it is relates to the home. So Agomoni and Bishojan Shongi comes about. And with this, uh, uh, we, I, I took this image from Ashish uh, Rajadaksha's book, Indian Cinema in the Time of Cellulite. So I find Nita here as the uh, splitting character who is a mythical figure and also as an individual, an individual being. And she is the exemplary daughter and sister, much associated with goddess Durga and Gauri. So according to Ghatok's own words, so I take it, and this is my translation, expressing the great mother archetype was the basic need on which Meghedakatara was built. So with this, uh, I find the inter intersection and the mutual incorporation of life and politics. I'd just like to focus on the two uh, pictures taken from the film, two clips taken from the film. One where Nita is saying that she couldn't go on studying because she has to work now. And you find another slipper tearing off, and this is not from Nita, but from another woman. So you find that in Kolkata in the years 1950s and 1960s, the colony dwellers like Nita, who were subaltern by class and gender, who navigated, minutes, the, city, yeah, uh, navigated the city and charted out their journey, so they tried to journey through it, the suburban train, the colony streets, and the alien bustling city. So you find them coming in a cycle. So it doesn't stop. Their struggle doesn't so stop. Their struggle to thrive doesn't stop. So with this, I move to the uh, concluding slide, uh, the piercing cry of Nita at the end. Dada to Bajte Chechilam, her urge to live she really wanted to live as an individual. Nita therefore succumbing after establishing the family uh, portrays the image of their sacrificial mother. Not only that, she remains as a deathless symbol of partition of Bengal, like many other refugee women who struggled to thrive. And perhaps this cry was uh, a clarion call, and this cry might, might be granted as venting out Nita's own self, which is very, very important, and that she truly wanted to live in a home, in the home summing up all the essence of uh, displacements, exodus, and partition. So with this, I end my presentation. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Mohana. It was indeed a very lovely presentation. Uh, extremely you, well analyzed and uh, the uh, illustrations are also very good. Uh, but uh, more on your paper at a much later stage. We would like to uh, move on to uh, Professor Himakshi Kashyap. If you could just uh, take on. Yeah, it. right. right. Uh, uh, we mo move on to Professor Himakshi Kashyap, who is uh, going to uh, present a paper on understanding Anupa Patangia Kalitas, the girl with long hair, from a biopolitical lens. Uh, Himakshi is an assistant professor in the Department of English, uh, Nalbari College, Assam. Uh, welcome uh, to the technical session, Himakshi. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible, yes. ma'am? Yes, but uh, we cannot see you. Ma'am, with, yes. yeah, with your permission, can I put up my uh, video, please, ma'am? Yeah, sure, absolutely. But uh, I will be again giving you a nudge at eight minutes and then you have to wrap it up by 10 minutes, my dear. Okay, ma'am, no problem. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Carry yeah. on, please. So, uh, I am Himakshi Kashyap, and today my paper is entitled. Uh, understanding Orupa Potongya Kolitas, the girl with long hair. This is a short story written by her from a biopolitical lens. So let me first tell you the story, uh, the girl with long hair in brief. Orupa Potongya Kolita, uh, the one of the prominent Indian authors hailing from Northeast India, and the recipient of 2014 Sahitya Academy Award, Katha Prize, an Assam Valley Literary Award, etc. Here in this story has highlighted one multi-ethnic Assamese society inhabited by tribals and non-tribals, the Boros and people from other communities. The hesitation for a new statehood or a sovereign power is taking place amidst them, led by the Boros. The Boros are the ancient tribe, the sons of soil of Assam, from the time of the colonial intervention itself, they were claiming a specific recognition for them in their own land, which was of course a result of the long-standing domination and exploitation experienced by them at different level. So here in the story, we have a place, a village, a remote village, somewhere in the present Boroland. Mainau is the protagonist in the story. Mainau is, the, um, uh, is a name given to a Boro girl, that means literally means uh, the goddess Lakshmi. She is a teenager and is about to appear in her matriculation examination this year. She is not much interested in her studies, rather enjoys doing all course in the house from sweeping the courtyard to weaving beautiful dokkonas with beautiful designs. These dokkonas are, are the traditional attires worn by the uh, borrow women. She has a long bunch of hair that reaches down to her hips. She cares for her hair and is very proud of them. She is young and very jovial in her behavior. She is always gets she always gets rebuked by her parents for not being serious about all the happenings outside. All those burns, those processions, firings, moving troops of armies, and so on. Maino has been witnessing all such things since her birth. She now feels these things to be very usual and not harmful for themselves, due to, of course, her childish unawareness. But to her utmost shock, those unquestionable rules set up by the hesitators turned her life topsy-turvy, almost destroying all her liveliness and hope. She secretly went to one once. She secretly went to the Hindu puja with her friends Binuma, Champa, and Rima, which was banned for her and her community people by the agitators. But unfortunately, she was seen at the puja mandap and was caught and punished by cutting her long bunch of hair. She burst out in sorrow, cried, and tried defending herself, but all was in vain. Furthermore, while cutting the hair before the public, as her body was touched by a man, one more punishment was imposed upon her that she might get married to that man who touched her in front of the public. They took help of the story of the two sisters, Asagi and Boishagi, 
while passing the judgment who once faced the same fate due to the same act of sin here i want to read out the story as quoted by described by oruko potongya kolita in the text the sisters asagi and boishagi often stole from the fruit garden of handsome chandra bau one day he set a trap and caught both of them he held their soft hands and freed them from the trap but the matter didn't end there the next day um, uh, people understood that somewhere a young man and woman had committed a sin in the meeting chandrabau and asagi and boishagi com- confessed to the sin and what was the sin chandrabau had to free the woman by touching their hands and thereby he had to marry both of the sisters and here comes the understanding of biopolitics from my point of view i am not going to discuss what uh, about what biopolitics is what i am concerned with is the idea of governance which is of course the core idea of biopolitics as wikipedia defines governance and governmentality incorporates all those means tools and ways used by any authority be it government local power body or any powerful human group modes of domination and control initiated by these authorities tend to take assistance of existing social belief traditional customs and even those paths showing folklores where a society's past resides in this story the agitators have forcefully posed a pause to the rights of freedom right to expression and movement of the people through all their dictates the imposition of bans and all other such techniques of rebellion against the mainland of assam was so frequent that they appeared as if to be part of those part of life to those people here the group of hesitators are striving for a new identity for their community by denying the authority of mainland assam in this process they have overtaken the position of authority to determine the fate of their own community their communitarian outlook further divided the society as they forbade their people from mingling with other community people inhabiting at the same place one pehi or paternal auntie of mine was mistreated to death only because she wore a salwar pyjama and not their own attire dokhana the body is uh, uh, another easy to exploit kind of a thing for them especially the female body of mine now uh, when uh, yeah, their dictates yeah. couldn't sorry actually yes, you know uh, please uh, switch on your Video. Yes, sir. Hello, Makshi. You are. You can. We cannot see you. If you can just switch on the video, please. People want to have a look at you, my dear. Ma'am, move it. Okay. Ma'am, I am trying to uh, switch. No, 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 no. You go ahead. We will see you uh, later on during the question answer session. Okay, ma'am. Unmute yourself. Rumba, the army. Actually, I'm unmute yourself. Rumba, the. I'm trying to start the video, but I cannot do it. Okay, madam. Uh, just accept my request. I'm asking to start your video. Just uh, accept my request. I am sending a request. I have. I don't. Accepted, excuse me. I don't think there is. I don't think there is much time as it is we are running behind schedule and she just has 3 minutes at her disposal we better hear out what she has to say uh professor okay. kashyap i'm sorry we only have 3 minutes left right so please carry on with your please carry on with your presentation yes ma'am is uh should i carry ma'am carry on yes please please carry on please carry on okay ma'am okay so here i was talking about the body uh, which uh, which uh, appear to be an easy to exploit kind of a thing for the agitators when uh, their dictates couldn't control and bind the body of mine now they targeted um, uh, uh, they couldn't control mine now uh, personally they uh, targeted her body and for a very baseless crime that she didn't committed Uh, uh they not only subjugated it but rather deemed it its essence and self proximity 
we see no voice of resistance against all those maltreatments from any other member of the society because here too we can see they are caught in the biopolitical cobweb dreaming a dream shown by the authority notwithstanding what happens to whom emits them in that process of fulfilling that dream thus the story advocates what biopolitics do to the people their lives hopes and aspiration in the process of governance how every element in a society starting from the household itself to culture folklore economy and human relationship gets exploited and used by biopolitics to fulfill its interest it's not only the government that rules and controls the population of the society but other power bodies also exercise the same the people of a certain society has to undergo multi level biopolitical dominance where their culture their social structure their community goals their personal relationships and so on appear to uh, be authoritative in shifting modes so with this i conclude my presentation and thanks for bearing me this long thank you i hope i have produced something relatable and uh, relevant to the topic of the web conference thank you ma'am absolutely professor kashyap that was wonderful uh, we were a bit sad at not being able to see you because everyone had uh, before both the audio and the video but i'm sure you can take care of the video part right now but as far as the presentation was concerned it was absolutely beautiful it was sheer joy hearing you out uh, our next speaker uh, is dr uh, devomitra chakraborty but before going on to devomitra chakraborty's paper just a very small message uh, dear audience if you have any questions please feel free to put them on the chat box uh, we will be taking on the questions uh, after the all the paper presentations are uh, done with so uh, i now welcome dr devomitra chakraborty she is assistant professor in english dr b n dotto sriti mohabiddaloy uh, her area of interest is girish karnad and uh, we are lucky enough to have her today she will be talking on the bio behavioral pattern in girish karnad's nagamandala uh, welcome Dev devomitra so it's over to you thank you ma'am am i audible yes so with your with due respect to chair and everyone present over here okay, may i ask your permission ma'am to share my screen sure. so that i can rush to my presentation yes please <laughs> okay you have to conclude by uh, 1837 it's 1827 okay now. okay okay so yes so the topic of the title of my paper is bio behavioral pattern in girish karnad's nagamandala yes now the, since this international webinar is on biopolitics much has been said and much has been heard about biopolitics and uh, i don't want to go into details of this let uh, specifically just reading the first line the problematics of problematic of biopolitics has increasingly become important in social sciences starting from michel foucault genealogies of governance of sexuality crime and mental illness in europe which marks the shift from negative regressive techniques of sovereign power towards the positive and productive power over life the research on biopolitics has developed into wider interdisciplinary orientation so we can well justify the need to have a webinar on biopolitics over here now it has a long history biopolitics has a long history in the arena of political science where the idea that the biological concepts are helpful in explaining political phenomena and that biological factors play a significant role in political behavior it has a uh, long history in western political thought now and uh, it also thinks about human nature as a limiting factor as well as an explanatory factor in political life <laughs> now moving on straight uh, to my play which i want to discuss over here and how karnad has actually employed or shown a bio behavioral pattern in this play this is a as you can see in the screen on the screen this is a short introduction about the play nagamandala when it was written and this is also a brief uh, summary summarization of plot 
of the play is narrated within an umbrella story and uh, as we all know it's a much read text very famous text and much worked upon text so these are all preliminary ideas now the things that i want to focus on is that rani is the only daughter of a fond father who is named rani as she is the queen of long lovely hair now her hair resembles a long black cobra when let loose gets tangled in her silver anklets now such a beautiful girl is given into marriage with a rich young man with dead parents now uh, although rani has a name her husband has no name in the play now here comes in the crucial issue now why giving him to marriage of the vomitra the sound has uh, lessened a bit so if you can just yes now it's okay yes please okay the microphone has just dropped <laughs> sorry sorry yes now uh, when this little beautiful young girl was given into marriage did her father consider take into consideration the bio behavioral pattern or did the father who is also a representative of the society the political uh, and also the political group over here did he take into consideration of these things no uh, the matter of fact is rani gains womanhood and leaves her parents house with her husband and her husband actually locks her up okay and she accepts this reality she readily accepts the role of apanas apana the has name of the husband apanas cook and maid without being made his sexual partner now girish karnat in his introduction to the three plays actually tries to give us a, an idea about these unconnected roles okay that uh, rani is actually uh, will be having will be getting a, a lover a naga a subhuman being a snake but actually kanad wants to present it as he says in his introduction uh, to the three plays that it can be seen as a metaphor and the pattern of relationship she is forced to win an important word which i want to i have highlighted and i have bold uh, bold in it is that she is forced to win from these disjointed encounters must be something of a fiction so something she is forced to your bi bio behavioral pattern your biological need your sexuality does not have any consideration in whatever in the way the society is actually working now apana dharwatkar in the introduction to collected plays also says the same thing however she highlights that the woman actually apparently tries to uh, come out of this cage come out of this prison of the house which is imposed upon her by her husband uh, through her imagination okay but and, and this play is actually an amalgamation of human abstract and magical elements created a synthesis that is thematically and philosophically simpler than the polysemy of ayurveda another uh, play by girish karnat but it appeals more to fancy than the imagination now in my paper i have tried to uh, first go through the different literatures go through the previous works that have been done on nagamandala and try to highlight how this concept of social taboo has been highlighted by previous uh, researchers also but something extra another new perspective can be added to the, their thoughts their critical uh, uh, critical works in the fact firstly i want to summarize it what uh, now this is another uh, uh, work where no uh, where the researcher actually says no traditionally conscious and culturally alive society would accept rani's crossing of the moral taboo that she goes on to find a lover outside her nuptial uh, out, outside her marriage okay now rani here also shares uh, a what to say a feminine world although she is locked up and her husband does not want her to have any relationship with anyone in the society totally uh, wants her to be in his control rani shares a relationship with kurudava another woman in the village where kurudava hands her a magical root now rani is supposed to feed this root to uh, apanna her husband so that apanna falls in love with rani but Ra rani throws it on naga being scared and as the 
sub, as the magical potion was supposed to work, Naga falls in love with Rani. Now, Savita Goel, another researcher, she too focuses on the concept of shape shifting and male masculinity. Okay, now this play also highlights the bio behavioral pattern of the male, of the men in this, uh, in the society, not only about the sexuality of the woman, uh, but also about the sexuality of the men. Now, the sexuality of Apanna, uh, Apanna, the husband of Rani, she, he actually manages to keep a whore and again lock her wife in the house. Another two minutes. Two minutes. Two okay, minutes more, then please. I'll rush on to my, to my conclusion. Sorry. Okay, it's okay. I'll lock my rush on to my conclusion. Now, regarding all the, actually the previous few slides are important. Yes. Now, this play actually has another, uh, the different critics have highlighted the concepts of marriage, love, uh, social taboo, uh, sex, woman sexuality, male sexuality, and different other things. But what I wanted to read wanted to find out or what i have found over here is that the norms of marriage that are prevalent in our society they do not take into consideration the bio behavioral patterns of either the male or the female the norms of the society are set including not only norms but the marriage acts be the hindu marriage act be it the special marriage act or other uh, specific uh, marriage acts of different communities. We know that in India, we don't have a uniform civil code, but the norm, norms of the marriages do not take into consideration any concepts of biobehavioral pattern. The another part about that has been shown in the play is the attitude towards sexuality and the issues of taboo. That the society is very liberal. They maintain a double standard about the sexuality of men and the sex issues and the sexuality of women. And the third important point that I uh, have found in this play is the issue of male sexuality and also the possibility of enhancing it through medication. Okay, now the magical, uh, we, all, we all know that in case of infertility or whatever concepts we have, uh, infertility, the cases we have, it is generally said that the woman is infertile. We never go into consideration that the male can be infertile. Okay, but here, uh, this the magical root actually changes the behavioral pattern, the sexual pattern, and also the biological uh, need of the characters and also the political and uh, social behavior of the characters. Thank you. If I may. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, I am so sorry to act uh, like a Hitler uh, and uh, intervene and interrupt uh, all these wonderful discourses. But uh, well, I have an <laughs> extremely unenviable job. Well, both here in this uh, conference as well as outside it. Uh, okay, let us now move on to uh, the next presenter, uh, Ms. Uh, Nabonita Paul. Uh, Nabonita, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, Nabonita will be talking on uh, a post-humanist reading of uh, Ritik Ghatuk's uh, film Ajantrik. Uh, Nabonita, are you there? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, please. You are audible. You are visible. Okay. Uh, Nabonita <laughs> is uh, an MPhil research scholar at the University of Burdwan. Uh, and uh, Nabonita, we look forward to your presentation, though it has to be curtailed, I understand. Um, <laughs> so over to you. Please. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, the Department of English, Kalishani Mahavidalai, for giving me this opportunity uh, to present my paper and uh, share my views on the biopolitics. Okay, uh, so let us uh, start my paper. So the title of my paper is a post-humanist reading of Ritik Hotok's Ajantrik. So adapted from a Bengali short story Ajantrik by Shubhad Ghosh, the film by Ritik Hotok is one of the earliest Indian films to portray an inanimate object. Uh, 
Ghotok introduces a science fiction theme by placing an automobile as a protagonist of the story. So he achieves this through the use of diegetic uh, sound and thus emphasizes the car's bodily functions and movements. The film presents a distinctly uncanny narrative of the relationship between Bimal, a cab driver, and his dilapidated car, Jagodol. Bimal treats uh, Jagodol, his soul uh, and old companion, as a living being. The human nature of their relationship is presented in a surrealistic mode. I would like to talk about a particular scene from the film where Bimal realizes that Jagodol is thirsty and therefore he goes to fetch some water and when Bimal pours water into Jagodol's radiator, Ghotok uses and Ghotok uses the sound of a person gulping down water. The intensity of the human relationship is further heightened. The close-up of Bimal's face shows that he is deeply content having been able to quench Jagadal's thirst. Thus, in a happy mood, he begins uh, his off-tune singing that disturbs the airy silence of the barren land. So Jagadal seems to dislike the song and therefore screeches. And, uh, you know, this is very interesting, uh, you know, and, and very, one of the very funniest uh, uh, scenes uh, from that very film. So Bimal takes out his napkin and covers the headlight as if they are Jagadal's eyes. So then he songs even louder with this funny yet interesting scene, Ghatu tries to achieve the anthropomorphism of the curve. Well, uh, James R. Doolittle, in his 1916 book, The Romance of the Automobile Industry, describes the automobile with the following words, and I quote, Elegant in lines, powerful in action, void in service, the modern automobile represents the incarnation of the transportation art, the silent, always ready servant that has more strength than Aladdin's Jenny and that, uh, you know, and that already has accomplished vaster walks for uh, mankind's better men than anything that has gone before, unquote. So Doolittle's description of the automobile as a silent, always ready servant is exemplary not only of the capitalist fetishistic attitude towards the technological commodity, but also the essentialization of man-machine dichotomy uh, man or man man-machine binary. So through the depiction of a bizarre bonding between a man and his car, Ghotok's ojantric dilutes that boundary and shows how the act of possessing and consuming becomes an act of historical retort to the project of capitalist bourgeois modernity. The film challenges the mainstream response to technology in post-colonial India by establishing a relationship of pre-capitalist fetishism between a human being and automobile, one of the most prominent products of capitalist modernity. The automobile, the most desired commodity in modern era of mass consumerism, is a product of technological modernity that reaffirms the instrumental view of the world as object. The film's engagement with the idea of mechanical modernity is quite relevant as it is temporarily situated in a post-independence India that was still negotiating its path between an agrarian past and a technological modernity. Ojantri can be argued to engage in dialogue with Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru for delineating an alternative space for imagining the dialectic between man and machine. While both Gandhi in his abomination of technology and Nehru through his statist fetish for technological modernity articulate the conception of machines in terms of their instrumental utility. And Ghotok rescues the relationship between man and machine from such ontological responsi uh, responsibility. Well, due to uh, time constraint, I'm not going into the detail of the intellectual debate between Gandhi and Nehru that I have dealt with in my paper. Uh, well, so it is quite interesting to note that Jagodol came to the year uh, Bimal, Bimal's mother died as if to fill in the vacant space of his private world caused by his mother's demise. This chronological aligning of the curse arrival in his life with that of his mother's death frees Bimal and Jagodol from the limits of owner-owned and subject-object dualism. This dismantling of subject-object dualism can be taken as a point of departure for cyborg studies. In her essay, A Cyborg Manifesto, 
Donna Haraway develops the concept of cyborg, which is broadly understood as a rejection of rigid boundaries separating human from animals and human from machine. So cyborg is a hybrid of a machine and an organism, but the borders and boundaries between these two are porous and interchangeable. In that sense, cyborg is a third phenomenon. Neither an organism or a machine, but having qualities of both and exceeding both. Therefore, it is different entity altogether. The study of cyborg begins with Foucault's idea of biopolitics, where the body is treated as a machine and that can be optimized. Uh, and once it is optimized, it is thrown away and made biopolitically non pertinent. Cyborg theory actually opens up the scope of a closed dialogue between man and machine. For Donna Haraway, it is very difficult to find out whether uh, where machine ends and where human beings begin as, as it happens in Bimal Jagadal relationship in Ajantri. So going against the commodity structure of capitalist market, Bimal does not want to part with uh, dilapidated Jagadal even after repeated cautionary words on the part of uh, mystery, the mechanics. Uh, the people of the town Moxim calls the car's name, but he is adamant not to change it. Bimal cannot come to terms with the fact that Jogodol can no longer, I mean, Bimal can no longer be cured and no longer be um, uh, made pertinent biopolitically. So during 1959, a time when modern cars are making their appearances in the town, Bimon frantically spared, uh, spends large sums of money on curing Jagodal, the decrepit car. Bewildering everyone, Jagodal is cured, but death being imminent, his rebirth is shortly. Cyborg theory talks in a very positive way about the social consequences of such a cyborg phenomenon. In the labor-intensive yet capital non-intensive third world context, the creation and the treatment of a machine is much more humanized. Cyborg in a subcontinental condition is a little less shined, okay ma'am, uh, is a little less shined and polished product. But its uncharming physical appearance does not bar it from developing an intelligent and effective mind. In cyborg, uh, in cyborg, artificial intel intelligence is made culture specific and sense of national pride is inculcated through the immediate, intimately named and nurtured Jagodal. In subcontinental conditions, cyborg is produced as an efficacy of a fetishism, which is different from the fetishism of commodities and the statist fetish for technology of Nehruvian India. This fetish neither leads to accumulation nor does it lead to any phantasmagoric fluidity. So the relationship between the owner and the owned is overwhelmingly aesthetic and deeply affective. So it involves desire, pleasure, frustration, and a kind of pain. So according to Michael Torsig, the effective relationship between human beings and non-humans can be best described as pre-capitalist fetishism. So describing the differences between the capitalist and pre-capitalist fetishism, Tosi goes on to argue that the modern market system works to replace pre-capitalist fetishism with a capitalist commodity fetishism by erasing the trace of reciprocity between the possession and the possession. Uh, with this, I end my lecture. Uh, thank you, Navanita. It was really, really interesting after having watched uh, Ojantrik for at least uh, six, seven times now. Uh, <laughs> I could feel uh, how, how uh, well, in a, a totally a novel way, you have been relating so much, including uh, the inclusion of cyborg uh, theory. Uh, so uh, we will be taking this up uh, if uh, time permits. Uh, we will be moving on to the last uh, paper of this uh, session and it is my honor and privilege to uh, welcome Professor Ligia Nazareth, Assistant Professor, Fatima Mata National College, Kerala. Um, Professor Nazareth, are you there? Professor Nazareth? Hello? Uh, yes, we can uh, hear you but can't see you, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, could you please excuse me? Because yeah, sure. A, uh, no issues. I understand. Okay, uh, so Professor Nazareth is going to uh, talk to 
to us about biopolitics and narrative overtones in the selected works of George Orwell. Uh, and uh, we have a 10 minute uh, rider for everyone. So ma'am, it's over to you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Shall I proceed? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Biopolitics and Narrative Overtones in the Select Works of George Orwell. So in the vision of Booker, there was an explosion of numerous and diverse techniques for achieving the subjugation of bodies and the control of population marking the bedding of an era of biopower. So my paper gives a broad outlook of the select works of George Orwell, namely 1984 and Animal Farm, along with narratives, which becomes a prison for approaching biopolitics. So moving into the Animal Farm, so it's an allegorical novella by George Orwell. The book tells the story of a group of farm animals who rebel against their human uh, owner, that is, uh, you have Jones, hoping to create a society where the animals can be equal, free, and happy. Ultimately, the rebellion happens, but the state of farm is never restored. It falls under the dictatorship of a pig called Napoleon. Even the events depicted in Animal Farm bears a close resemblance to the Russian Revolution of 1970. So I'll lead you to a few quotes. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. The creatures outside looked from pig to man and from man to pig, but already it was impossible to say which was which. We are strong, clever or simple, we are all brothers. Next, and to know things never had been, nor ever to be much better or much worse. Hunger, hardship and disappointment being, so he said, the unalterable laws of life. And next one, four legs good, two legs better. So these are major points. That the pigs use their narratives to control the underlings in the park. The central conflict of animal farm arises when animals desire for freedom and equality is corrupted by consolidation of political power among the pigs. So the power struggle is clearly propagated through the narration employed by Orwell in a very clear way. Check out Old Major Speech, Battle of Kaushit, and even the characters of Sweden, who becomes a mouthpiece of Napoleon. He indirectly becomes a symbol of propaganda. The snowball, who was considered to be the rightful head of Animal Farm, was removed by Napoleon in an intricate plot. So, a panoptical image is the disciplinary mechanism of high knowledge as well as a game of truth in the discourse mechanism of. Michel Foucault's power theory to interpret the concrete power arrangement in Orwell's Animal Farm. So you have the images like barn, windmill, and manor as some panopticans in power theory. Moving into 1984, it's a dystopian novel, again by Orwell, which centers on the consequences of government overreach, totalitarianism, mass surveillance, and repressive segmentation of all persons and behaviors within society. Broadly speaking, it examines the role of truth and facts within politics and emancipation. After analyzing the plot, you can see it takes place in 1984. You can see war, cognition, government surveillance, and new propaganda. You can see Airship 1 has become the province of totalitarian super state named Oceania and ruled by party who employed power police to persecute individuality and independent thinking. You can say Big Brother, leader of the party, enjoys the privilege. Then the main character, Winston Smith, is a diligent worker at the Ministry of Truth, where he rewrites historical records. And being a party member, he, or he even hates party and dreams of rebellion. He enters into a relationship with his co-worker, Julia. If you go through the narrative employed in this highly privileged work, you can see images like Big Brother, Double Thing, which simultaneously holds the belief. Then we have thought crime, we have Newspeak, which is an ideological language. Then we have Telly Screen, 2 plus 2 equals 5, Memory Hole, which is equals uh, Oblivion, Insort. Again, multiple connotation falls on all these words. Parallels can be drawn between novels, subject matter, and real life instance of totalitarianism, communism, 
massive movement, violation of freedom, and even expression. He draws light even on censorship, which happens in the Ministry of Truth. In surveillance, the inhabitants have no real privacy. They are watched, just like Big Brother is watching them. And 1984, an animal farm shares the themes of betrayed revolution. The individual subordinates the collective universally informed class distinctions, cult of personality, thought police, etc. The fundamental premise of the novels, where world is divided and hierarchy persists, and a group completely controls information and free expression of thought, and they're engaged in perpetual and unwinnable wars for world dominion. So the climax of 1984 shows how O'Brien interprets Winston and convinces him that two plus two equals five. The Orwell clearly explains how imprecise and euphemistic language turns the people's capacity for critical thoughts in his work, politics, and English language. So a few uh, quotes. War is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. The natural slogan of Oceania and an important testament to the power of people's party's mass uh, campaign and uh, psychological control. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Appears twice in book one, chapter three. It highlights a point where history is broken down, the psychological independence of a subject. Indirectly, a past full of misery is created and people are forced to believe that party has created the human race. As Winston says, for after all, how do they know that two and two make four? On that course, or that uh, force of gravity work, then freedom is the freedom to say two plus two makes four. So the motive comes full circle at the end of the novel after the torture of Winston suffers in the Ministry of Blood, he, which breaks his soul. He sits at the uh, chestnut tree and uh, traces two plus two equals five in the dust as a table. I understand now, I do not understand why. Winston collates his thoughts in his forbidden diary. I'm quite ready to take risks, but end of something worthwhile. It shows the difference between the kinds of resistance which matters to Julia and not Winston. In diving into 1984, Orwell used third person point of view, which is close narration, to explore the uh, internal and external expressions of living under a totalitarian zone. So, it enables us to understand Winston's limited perspective and devices that uh, provide greater context for his experience. To conclude, I have the relation between power and uh, knowledge is giving priority. In fact, knowledge not produced for the sake of knowledge, but it's produced in relation to power. Animal Farm displays the affinity between power and discourage, which is highlighted by the animal characters. Foucault's vision regarding power and knowledge, while in 1984 also parts placed employed power and, and knowledge as a route to control and dominate our society. On Animal Farm in 1984, society, the most notable power is political and social power. It is conceived through discipline. For Foucault, discipline is a powerful activity to produce subjugated and practical body. So through discipline, the human body becomes trained to obey the government. It is control over their bodies and minds and become imprisoned by understanding people as subjects. The government will realize the great use of the human body to ensure maximum productivity in general for population, for general welfare of the state. It happens via control of media, source of information, controlling memory, education, class discrimination, and altercation of language and cancellation of history. So, the intricate political satires mirror our society in general, where we are all indirect victims of power struggle on the basis of religion, class, and gender. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. That was uh, a wonderful five papers. Uh, we are now open uh, for questions or comments. 
but I can also uh, see the hovering figure of Shubroto, uh, who is kind of there <laughs> to tell us that, oh, you don't have time. And we are talking about power struggles and I never felt more scared uh, <laughs> uh, to uh, see a very genuine friend and brother. But uh, well, yes, uh, comments, questions, anyone? Uh, we had uh, five extremely uh, brilliant, uh, well-researched papers. Uh, the first three were, uh, uh, well, women-centered, if we might uh, use the word. Uh, whereas uh, the, in uh, the first, uh, we had uh, Nita, who is a refugee and uh, is also projected as a, a mythical uh, figure. And we have uh, the Durga image along with uh, that of Nita. We have uh, the second uh, paper, The Girl with Long Hair, where again it is a woman-centered text. And we see how uh, the body becomes a site for contestation of power. We then have uh, the paper on Nagamandala, where uh, our uh, presenter talked on the different biological factors that determine political behavior and very uh, brilliantly depicted how, how the woman uh, seeks an imaginative uh, freedom. She also touches upon the sexuality of, uh, the, of a man. The fourth paper is on uh, Ojantrik and uh, our uh, 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 presenter talks about uh, the how how uh, the film challenges the established uh, capitalist notions uh, the name ojantrik itself uh, which is uh, attributed to this film is a, a sort of a, a, a challenge uh, to this sort of uh, titular power, how, how uh, an automobile, which is the symbol of dynamism itself can, uh, can challenge this particular, the, the, make, the, the attempt to make it uh, or transform it into a, a sort of a machine. And uh, Nabunita has taken the help of the cyborg theory to uh, reject the rigid boundaries. The last presentation by Professor Lizia Nazareth uh, conveyed how uh, words become all powerful. The narrative uh, style in Orwell tries to uh, negotiate these different power relations. She has quoted a number of uh, statements to establish her fact. And I, I was uh, really uh, thinking about, in this regard, uh, about the ancient Indian uh, scriptures where words itself are considered to be very powerful tools of uh, wielding um, such power. And uh, I was thinking about the concepts of Shabdo Brahmo, Nado Brahmo, which, which completely uh, show how, how uh, words can, can be uh, the, the, uh, you see, uh, used to, to uh, perceive this kind of power to convey and communicate the different nuances of this, uh, the constant power struggles and negotiations that go on. Uh, I am afraid Shubroto got scared from me and ran away. Okay, uh, so any other uh, comment or question? Shubroto, my brother, please come back. Yeah. Yes. Okay, dear, dear, dear. Uh, yes. Uh, if anybody else is there uh, to with their, we we are within our time limit. You see, yeah. nice five yeah. women and uh, me, six nice women who have uh, completely uh, maintained our time and yes, we have yes, done yes. what we were asked to. Okay. So we have paid obeisance to the power struggle. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> right? Thank you, Didi. Uh, thank you, Nupadi, for sharing this session. You have really uh, completed your session within the time. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this is the end of the technical session four for, for the presentation. And we have also another technical session uh, that is actually invited lecture. Uh, Dr. Antara Mukherjee is there for, his, for her presentation. Dr. Antara Mukherjee, Government Girls College, uh, uh, Government Girls General Degree College, Kolkata. And the moderator of the session is actually uh, Professor 
প্রসূন ব্যানার্জি অ্যাসিস্ট্যান্ট প্রফেসর ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ ইংলিশ কবি জয়দেব মহাবিদ্যালয় আই হোপ দিস সেশন উইল অলসো বি ভেরি ভেরি ইন্টারেস্টিং সেশন আই উইল বি গোস্টিং টু বি প্রেজেন্ট হিয়ার ওকে সো ডক্টর অন্তর মুখার্জি নবদি থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ ভেরি মাচ ইউ আর অলওয়েজ উইথ মি এন্ড আই থিং ইউ উইল রিমেইন উইথ মি অল দ্য টাইম ওকে ডক্টর অন্তর মুখার্জি ওকে 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 ইউ আর ভিজিবল ইউ আর ভিজিবল নাও ওকে 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 সো অ্যাজ ইউ ওয়াজ এগেইন ইউ হ্যাভ বিকাম টু হ্যাভ আ সরি টু ইন্টারাপ্ট ইউ আই আর ভিজিবল নাও আই আর ভিজিবল ইয়া ইয়া আই আর ইউ আর নট ভিজিবল স্টিল নাও ইন মাই ইন মাই মেক ইন মাই লেট ইন মাই ডিভাইস एक्चुअली Uh, let me check my uh, no actually I, i could i could see myself uh, on the camera okay, okay, but okay. Uh, i don't know uh, okay, okay prashun uh, the session i can see prashun as well i can see prashun okay okay uh, okay now, over now to you prashun 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 carry on prashun can you hear me now yes Prashun, are you there? Ah, unmute yourself. Prashun, unmute yourself. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. I, I have done that. I have done that. Okay. 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 Uh, so, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, as uh, our convener has actually announced, uh, that this is going to be an invited lecture uh, from a, a very interesting speaker. to kind of uh, to introduce you know this uh, is going to present today in this particular session is known to me more sort of an elder sister to me so it's a very tricky situation to kind of uh, to form an introduction about her but still i will uh, try to go uh, go into the formalities of it as to dr has asked me about it so dr antara mukherjee uh, she is presently uh, a professor Uh, in the in government girls general degree college uh, in howrah uh, dr mukherjee has uh, you know had both uh, pg teaching and mt teaching experience for the last Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, also. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm facing a, a some sort of network problems. Without uh, getting into the much detail, I like to invite Dr. Antara Mukherjee to present her paper. uh to to give a lecture dr antara mukherjee has you know been an enthralling uh, scholar and speaker uh, you know she has given lectures in various uh, seminars and uh, you know uh, and, uh, and and uh, and sessions and in, and been part of many invited lectures and uh, what i can uh, ensure you about one thing that what uh, whatever she does she puts her life into it 
and uh, we have uh, kind of listened to her uh, you know in many occasions but today's speech is going to be special because she is going to take us back to the 19th century world in a world which is uh, you know uh, rather considered to be a taboo world uh, but uh, she has uh, sort of uh, you know trying to delve deep into the psyche of that dark uh, i would say rather dark era and bring out hidden treasures from there so i without any more fuss i request antradi to kind of uh, deliver uh, her uh, lecture i'm sorry for the technical glitches it's absolutely okay and thank you so much uh, prashun for that very informal uh, introduction and i really expect exactly uh, that from you am i audible uh, and visible to you and to others yeah, yeah. please tell yeah, me yeah, okay yeah. okay okay yeah. okay so so good evening to one and all um first of all i thank the principal of uh, kolishani mahavidyalay for the invitation and uh, express my warm regards uh, for shubhrata da uh, shubhrata kumar rana the convener of this three day webinar uh not only for the invite but but also for providing me a scope to speak on chandan nagar the place where the college is located uh before i begin i i must thank uh, purva chatterjee and of course uh, shagnik banerji uh, without whom i would not have been able to complete this paper because i was dealing with texts that were uh, out of publication and uh, shagnik really helped me to procure one of uh, the text that i would be dealing with now since i will be quoting from uh, bengali text uh, so i would be speaking in bangla but uh, for the non uh, bengali speakers or listeners uh, i shall be offering uh, the translation so i do have a, a powerpoint presentation for that uh, my presentation today is divided into two sections in the first section i'll be more historical and uh, i'll speak on the socio uh, legal implication of a british administrative measure on the prostitutes of uh, late 19th century calcutta uh, i shall be drawing from uh, shumanto banerjee shurojit sen uh, audrish bishwas mohan bhattacharjo et al to understand how state power was imposed both on the prostitutes and of course on a segment of neo uh, elite bengali neo elites and in the second section i shall uh, refer to three contemporary chap books bengali chap books or bortala sahitya and would try to map the anxieties the plight the emigration of the prostitutes and um, would try to understand their counter discursive strategies and would attempt a critique of what is being called as a typical colonial biopolitics so uh, since i also have network issues i will uh, try to uh, switch on to the screen and off and switch off my video uh, prashun please tell me whether my screen is available sorry is no. visible or not okay is it visible uh, not is started not is yeah yeah, uh, yeah. now it is visible now it is visible so go is to it, full screen mode yeah 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 is it okay Completely. yeah absolutely all right so this is the title of my paper outcast bodies under surveillance critiquing typical colonial biopolitics in immigrated homeland let me start with the cantonment act of 1864 which was implemented on the prostitutes who were imprisoned within the cantonments in the late 19th century calcutta the act was directed to protect the health of the british soldiers who were visiting prostitute quarters and contracting venereal diseases from them by this act you know it was decided that separate brothels would be constructed for the british soldiers within the cantonments now this measure which was apparently taken for the safety 
behavior of the British soldiers was actually directed to control the prostitutes through surveillance by the colonial masters. For this purpose, young, beautiful, healthy girls were brought from nearby villages and suburbs. Least they want to run to their, uh, let us say, return to their relatives, they were entrapped in the lock hospitals which were built for their treatments within the cantonments. Now this measure, which was apparently taken for the safety of the British soldiers, was actually directed to control the prostitutes through surveillance. So Shumanta Banerjee, in his famous book, Dangerous Outcasts, the Prostitutes in 19th Century Bengal, uh, considers that this was a very significant moment of transition of the profession of prostitution from being a sinful trade in the pre-colonial past to a criminal act in the colonial present. So colonial rule, as he says, converted the so-called sinners into criminals and altered the profession from its social religious interpretation into a colonial social legal codification. Actually, warring in pre-colonial societies, as Shumanto Banerjee has noted, was a sin where prostitutes, though branded as sinners, were grudgingly accepted as a part of the society. But to the colonial rulers, the profession of prostitution was considered as a crime. They were dangerous since they threatened the empire by making inroads into it through its soldiers who were contracting venereal diseases. In this sense, the docile bodies of the colonized other had the capacities to exert an uncontrollable threat to the system of operations. So controlling those bodies by disciplining them medically was the only way by which they could be transformed and used. And I have quoted from this famous article, Transfiguring Colonial Body in the Postcolonial Narrative, where Boimar opines that colonized subjects' body has been the object of colonizers' fascination and repulsion and, in effect, possession. The sublimated fascination that is given in the quotation with the strange justifies the domination of the other as untamed and raw and open to mastery and available for use. Hence, to use the bodies of the colonized subject, it became essential to tame them medically, to negate any possibility of exerting an unpredictable threat to the systematic mode of social system, neutralizing thereby the threat to the prevailing social system and thereby legitimizing colonial rule. But you know what happened? The Cantonment Act was failing in its aims for the soldiers were moving out of their cantonment and were consorting with other prostitutes and were getting inflicted. So it was decided that they, the British masters would extend their operation beyond the cantonment and impose control over all those prostitutes who were plying their trade outside the cantonments. Thus, they implemented a new law called the Indian Contagious Diseases Act on 1st of April, 1868. This brought the entire profession under strict, straight control and supervision. By this act, it became compulsory for all the prostitutes to undergo medical examination in lock hospital along with registration. And only a fit certificate from the authorities would permit them to ply their trade. This act came to be known as the Choddo Ain. Choddo or 14 derived from the number of the legislation act number 14. And the act was the brainchild of Dr. C. Faber Toner, who was the health officer in Calcutta. So in his article, Sikh Badmaish Jobto, which is enlisted in the book, Bangali Bhattala or Bhattala of the Bengalis, published 2013, Shurajit Sen describes the method of operation of the act. A Aine Bola Chilo, and I'm quoting from the Bengali text, J Shorkari Dakta, Deshaparai Camp Korbe, Beshara Khanai Registry Korabin, 
এবং সেই রেজিস্ট্রেশন নাম্বার অনুযায়ী তাদের ডেকে পরীক্ষা করা হবে যাদের শরীরে সিফিলিস এর লক্ষণ পাওয়া যাবে তাদেরকে সরকারি হাসপাতালে রেখে চিকিৎসা করানো হবে এবং সুস্থ হলে তাদের ছেড়ে দেওয়া হবে এই জন্য ব্রিটিশ সরকার কলকাতায় জরুরি ভিত্তিতে কতগুলি লক হাসপাতাল খুলেছিল ডক্টর লক অনুসরণে যেগুলোর নাম ছিল লক হাসপাতাল প্রসঙ্গত ডক্টর লকই এই আইনটির প্রস্তাব রাখেন সরকারের কাছে the police actually left no stone unturned to torture threaten and abuse the prostitute under the garb of the law so in his book ashruto kanthashor or the unheard voice banerji notes that jor kore dhore niye jawa daktari porikkhar name doihik obomanona o utpiran rehai pabar jonno utkoch pradan ittadi nana hoyrani shojjo korte hoto ei deho pojibinite ankur thus the docile bodies of the other the subjected to torture they were used and transformed now confinement at lock hospital for a long time meant loss of income which by extension meant lack of food and essential for dependents at home out of the hospital they you know they became unemployed because their long absence uh, have bought new prostitutes and therefore they cannot you know get uh, proper uh, you know uh, business so what happened as audrish bishash in his introduction to volume 2 of bottolar boy unish shotoker dushprappo kuriti boy points out that some fell sick some committed suicide and some ran away to french rule tondunagar so police theke purush doctor shokolei emon nirmom o nishthur acharon korte যে পরীক্ষা করানোর যন্ত্রণার ভয়ে বহু বেশা কলকাতার শহর ছেড়ে পালিয়ে গেল অনেকে গেল ফরাসি শাসন চন্দননগরে চন্দননগর বেঙ্গল মিনি ইউরোপ অন দ্য গ্যাঞ্জেস অ্যান্ড ফ্রম দ্য সিক্সটিন সেঞ্চুরি অন ওয়ার্ডস চন্দননগর ওয়াজ রুল বাই ফ্রেঞ্চ অ্যান্ড দ্য টাইম দ্যাট আই এম টকিং অ্যাবাউট uh chandnagar continued to rule by french though initially it was a transfer of power to the british but again the french won back chandnagar but the rest of the places were all controlled by the british so by the time we come to the 19th century what we find is that bandel chinsura shirampur uh, all these places were dominated by british but chandnagar continued to be dominated by the french so as uh, all these bishops has pointed out that some of them came to chandnagar we must also keep in mind that not only chandnagar but some of them also ran away to neighboring districts like bardhaman and to distant lands like kashi bindavan goya mathura now this entire phenomenon when when it was you know discussed with uh, the eminent scholar prodeep bashu in an interview to mo bhattacharya He has interpreted this phenomenon as an instance of typical colonial biopolitics now colonial biopolitics as i understand it it refers to the shrewd mechanism of power that attempted to consolidate the imperial authority by utilizing political power to regulate the control um, to regulate and control the bodily autonomy of the oppressed colonized subject however the very fact that they could escape from a british ruled calcutta to a non british territory deserves critical re exploration of this phenomenon what dr basu calls typical colonial biopolitics it must be noted that colonial calcutta became a dreadful place for these obhadra or the disgraced other not only for the choddo ayin or for that act but also for lack of sympathetic support from the gentle society or the bhadra samaj deep seated prejudice against the prostitutes could not be overpowered by western education and so the bhadra samaj fails to recognize prostitution as any other profession professional community working within the commercial setup and so deserves support when threatened by legal measures rather some amongst the bhadra lok voice against the eradication of the prostitutes 
from respectable localities or the bhadra police and appealed for dumping them to the peripheral part of the city uh, the bhadra mahilas accustomed to traditional norms of female submission to male dictates in social behavior failed to recognize the main responsibility in it the situation became complicated for many bhadralo who had linked with the prostitutes on a regular basis also came under the scanner because for this act it became compulsory to get them also registered the act the this became a double edged sword for the babus could not decide what to do if they get registered they would risk their family pride and prestige for they could no longer keep their dark deeds a secret and if they do not do so they could no longer enjoy hedonistic pleasure so while some really came under the legal dagger economically privileged babus either rented or constructed a second home outside calcutta mostly in neighboring chandurnagar to keep their mistresses and quite interestingly this arrangement opened up a new avenue for the prostitutes and gave them courage to thwart their physical and psychological confinements in her article inscriptions and body maps published in feminine masculine representation 1990 elizabeth goes argues that if the body is the strategic system uh, sorry strategic target of systems of codification there is also a possibility of a counter strategic reinscription for it is capable of being self marked self represented in alternative ways thus the confined bodies of the colonies contest their stereotyping and insists on self representation you see self representation was the only alternative uh, left to them because as the abhadra or the disgraced women they were turned down both by the bhadra lok and by the bhadra mahilas of the time now it is interesting to know that a large number of prostitutes immigrated to colonial chandurnagar which was a favorite weekend destination outside kolkata particularly for the swanky night life during this time so long you know stretches of the colonial town in the north of river ganges so this is a very old map of chandurnagar and if you look uh if you look closely then you will find that this crescent shaped river is actually the river ganga okay and one of the conjecture that chan chan chader nagar you know it's like the shape of this crescent moon uh so what happened you know during the colonial time uh the area that is uh, located uh, towards this part of the town you know here these are the little little boxes if you could see here this was the place where the brothels during the colonial time was located right but what happened after 1868 a large number of prostitutes from calcutta uh, came to chandurnagar and chandurnagar sorry witnessed a massive uh, mushrooming of prostitute quarters in another part of the town that is this part of the town this is gondolpara this is hatkola this is beshohata so this part of the town is very close to the waterfront and this is close to the waterfront but not that much close as this part of the town is i will come back to this map a little bit later on also now uh, let me stay a little bit more on godolpara area and tell you that godolpara area godolpara beshohata and and uh, this hatkola area they were noted for the for garden houses of zamindars and uh, one also finds elite native residences like the siramanis and the rakshits in this part of the town unlike calcutta affluent localities here did not object to the resettlement of the prostitutes here rather this area is also close to the waterfront now this is the waterfront and the waterfront right this is the picture of the brothels the uh, before the mushrooming of the prostitute quarters during the indian contagious diseases act 
and later on this is the riverfront which is known as the strand the famous strand of trandonovo the the area that i was talking about in the map that is gondolpara and beshohata and uh, hatkula this is very close to this riverfront right so what happened you know in this waterfront in this riverfront let us say uh, most of the european settlements grew and it is here which was considered to be the pleasure habitat of colonial chandranagar we find pubs hotels brothels this is a picture of one of the hotels hotel de paris that was you know constructed right in the riverfront so uh, what we see actually uh, if i could go back to the map once again colonial chandranagar this is this uh, is the gt road okay running through the town and this entire part from the gt road to the river front this area and this area this came to be known as la ville blanche or the white town and beyond the gt road let us say here this portion this portion and kolikani college is located somewhere here so this portion was came to be known as the black town now this division was done during the colonial period and kanchana mukherji in her book chandranagar and its dependencies the unfulfilled dream of duplex notes that many topi wala mahal right the, the typical french architectural pattern is being hinted as you can understand was beside the river bishwanath uh, gondopadhyay the noted historian who has worked on the history of chandranagar almost all his life notes that and i'm quoting from from his book his bengali book chandranagar's shankipto itihash sada anchole chilo prachurjo o paka bari samaroho dok o bondorer karmobasto jagot gacher shariwala samantolar rastar bahar poye pranali nacher adda shurikhana ar kalo anchole chilo akabaka rasta jongol doba nana phaka rasta khorer ghor ja dikhe gram bole mone hoto so adrian carton it was almost the same in his book mixed race and modernity in colonial india and says that these color coded classification actually resulted in the construction of two divergent worlds so even though this crude manichean division between the white and the black town signify the racialized demarcation based on color this division in the context of cultural differences in 18th and 19th century india acquire the symbolic meaning of power so small wonder that in la ville blanche elites who had access and entitlements to the privileges of whiteness by dint of their wealth and class position resided along with the europeans naturally therefore the wealthy class frequented the newly developed hotels and pubs where exclusive variety of french wines like cognac champagne and claret were ready available meanwhile it is this economic power that also gave access to babus from kolkata to enjoy the night life at la ville blanche and if uh, one reads the memoir of the revolutionary shochindranath shannal who was hiding at chandranagar and he recollects his memoir a uh, bondi jibon uh, just translated as the life of captivity 1922 Uh, he also talks about the availability of high quality french wine in hotels and i quote from uh, bondi jibon oi hotel e te shonibar robibar kolkata theke shoukhi ro dhuni lokeder podarpon hoy ekhane khub shohoje o sharombore shura debir aradhona kora hoy keno na kolkatar chaite ekhane dokkhina onek kom so fascination for french wine was well complemented with famed brothels at chandranagar the white town of chandranagar emerged as a pleasurable weekend destination both for the europeans as well as for the native elites particularly the babus from kolkata since the colonial times interestingly enough the swanky night life of chandranagar along with the whole episode of the torture of the prostitutes their flight their escape rehoming everything finds significant mention in contemporary chap books or cheap bengali books 
brought out by Calcutta's small printing presses of Portola and written by the new literate people of humble origin, these books came to be known as Bhattala Shahitto. They voiced the unheard voices of the prostitutes, chronicled the entire episode of Chodo Ain and its historical impact, apart from shedding light to many such neglected and marginalized topics. Incidentally, as I have given in this quotation, Shukumar Shane has noted in the article, Bhattalar Boshoti, Bhattalar Chapao Chobi, he has given a description of the area adjacent to Shobha Bajar Balakana, where upon a cemented pavement around the trunk of the sprawling banyan tree, an old market for local books thrived. Even when Shumanto Banerjee was working on this, uh, and he, he you know, wrote an article, Unishatoker Kolkata o Shoroshoti Kito Shantan, he has considered Bortala and Shonagachi as twins. And the Kolkata's famous you know, red light area, Shonagachi, originally derived its name from Sona Ghazi, a Muslim religious preacher, uh, Sona Ghazi, or Ghazi Sonaullah Shah Chisti Rahmatullah, who came from Iran and settled down in North Kolkata. So Hardik Proto Vishash, in his article, the obscene modern and the pornographic filmy adventures in Bangla pornography has rightly identified the varied themes and genres of these literature. There's a long quote given over there, but he has categorically pointed out Naksha, Ketcha, Prohoshon, Gupta Katha, apart from other topics like murder, mystery, natural sciences, and etc. So notorious for their lurid presentation of sexuality, Bortala books eat the refined sensibility of the gentle society. But these books challenge the elitist bias of the mainstream 19th century Bengali literature, subverted the upper class culture and registered the socio-historical winds of change that were blowing in British rule Bengal. Naturally enough, the implementation and effect of Chodo Ai provided a ready material for the Bortala authors who documented how the disgraced other undermined typical colonial biopolitics and registered their protest against the same. In doing so, they nevertheless refused to excuse their elite brethren whose prejudiced deaf ears could not hear the plight of the disgraced women. So I come to the second section and I will be, will be referring to these three books, Tarini Choron Dash, Desha Biboron Natok, uh, or a play about the annals of the prostitute, Pran Krishna Dotto's Badmaish Jabdo, or the taming of the profligate, and finally, Aghor Chandra Ghosh's Pachali Komal Toli or Chodo Ain, or a poem about a lotus bird. The first two are farces, and the third one is a narrative poem. Please note the year of publication, the Indian Contagious Diseases Act, 1868. And these two were written immediately on Aghor Chandra Ghosh's poem, 1873. Uh, it's a very uh, significant year because, uh, you know, uh, voices against the Chodo Ain uh, started uh, to be raised. And so finally, it was abolished shortly thereafter. So in Besha Vibara Natok, or a play about the annals of the prostitute, the Bhattala author Tarini Charun Dash takes a babu and his programmed wife Shumati to task and not a prostitute for their illicit ways. Shumati, the programmed wife, is not spared for camouflaging her husband's venereal diseases. And I quote Shumati, Jogodishe Kripai, Gunamui Daktar Mashi Hoite, Gopone Jatona Nibaron Hoilo, Prokash Hoile, Grinate, Ohimane, Amar Pran, Bibidino Hoite. The otherwise subdued faithful wife, who is unable to detect the vulnerability of her nurtured home, ironically scorns at the prostitute as Kolonkini or the tainted woman. These lines express the poignant condition of Bengali Bhadrohilas who were kept enough to find means of curing infected husbands 
but but were incapacitated to deter them from visiting brussels this text speaks volume of the massive extent to which bhadra mahilas have internalized the ambivalence of their bhadra lok written by pran krishna dotto badmaish jabto which begins the ninth before the implementation of shuddha ayin and continues after its implementation so that the author can present the mental anxiety of and necessary measures taken by its sufferer takes the issue a step further and focuses on the politics of representation badmaish as we know is an implied snobbish upper class tag given to describe someone's wicked nature and in this text it seems to be applied to the prostitutes as home records and to the ignominy attached with their trade when such a trade is controlled by the british administration through chuddo ain they are evidently tamed or chopped off with the progression of the text however dotto's satirical being finds his best outlet as one slowly but steadily tracks down the actual badmaish in the text dotto clearly sympathizes with the helpless victims of the colonial policy and therefore gnaws at the fixed baboons of the prostitutes who illegally satisfy their lust in the darkness of the night they are the real badmaish like tarini charan das tan krishna dotto also mocks the bengali neo elites by calling them badmaish who are now tamed by the badmaish jabdo ayin or the law of the profligate for it has become mandatory for the badmaish to get registered along with the prostitutes they are cut to size as fear of exposure looms large over so dotto brilliantly expresses the nervous rankings of the inner soul of the bhadralo caught in between the act and the illegal desires i am quoting from the bengali text book phete jay hai mukh tola bhar registry korilei hoibo amar na korile bondho hobe beshaloye jawa bishchomo bodh hobe boshonter hawa বটতলা হইবে নিমতলা সম নিমতলা ভালো এবে বোধ হয় মম আনকোট সো অসিলেটিং বিটুইন প্লেজার এন্ড প্রবলেম দে ক্যানট ডিসাইড देयर মোডাস অপারেন্ডি এন্ড সো ওয়েট অ্যাঙ্কশিয়াসলি উইথ ওয়ারিড ফোরহেডস দিস লাইনস বিউটিফুলি এক্সপ্রেস দ্য হ্যামলেশিয়ান ডিলেমা অফ দ্য ফ্রিকোয়েন্টারস অফ দ্য ব্রাসেলস হু ওয়ার সার্ভড উইথ সাচ আ সারমন that they can neither ignore nor digest if their affluent status gave the babus an opportunity to make separate arrangements at nearby chandnagar it also opened an alternative employment possibility for the prostitutes in a french ruled colony thus one notes in these bottle attacks a plethora of reference to farash danga or the land or the dongi of the french or the farash which is which was the popular nomenclature for colonial chandnagar colonial chandnagar incidentally speaking was easily accessible from calcutta through both railways and waterways thus aghor chandra ghosh's narrative poem patchali komalpuri mentions how babus from kolkata fearing registration along with their public women came to settle down at colonial chandnagar and i quote from the poem abar kono kono dhuni ori moddhe jini dhuni bhalo bashay shonge loe jay bole cholo farish tangai heshe hal thakbo mojay e behale teka holo dai and then he goes on to say keu ba chore koler gari farish dangai kochhe bari কেউ বা গিয়ে খালি বাড়ি খুঁজছে কেউ বা চোরে নৌকায় নুকিয়ে ফরাশ ডাঙায় যায় ভালোবাসায় ভরসা দিয়ে কত বলে কি করবে রে ধন উপায় তো আর নেই এখন উপায় হচ্ছে ফরাশ ডাঙায় যত আনকো সো দি অ্যানোনিমাস অথর ইউ নো অফ অ্যানাদার বটতলা টেক্সট এন্ড আই এম নট রেফারিং টু কুদ বাহবা 14 আইন অর কুদোস অ্যাক্ট নাম্বার 
14 uh, for the time constraint. Uh, but this is written by an anonymous author. And in this book, one notes or one gets a confirmation of this historical shift. Now, uh, you know, as we see the desire for Porash Daga as a prospective trading zone also emerges from these uh, Bortola texts. So in Vesha Vibarod Nato, a prostitute suggests a colleague to flee from coercive colonial biopolitics of Kolkata that is denting their business prospects. So she says, Onubhabe bojha galo, premier bajar mochke galo, khadbe na ko chal chaturi, shoi lo shoi, shabe mile chal jai polaye, parish dangai bashkuri. So tied down by the repressive state apparatuses, the speaker prostitute gives a clarion call to her colleagues for self-assertion. So the narrator in Pachali Komal Koli decides to abandon a claustrophobic Calcutta and declares that it is impossible to stay in this state any longer. Now, as uh, Shumanta Banerjee has rightly pointed out, that French administration at Chandranagur did not impose any such act. So naturally, it was easy for the prostitutes to run away to Kolkata, uh, sorry, to Chandranagur. But in this connection, one must also note that despite being away from the winds of enlightened Western education, the uneducated marginals of Calcutta were perceptive enough to have a knowledge of a place outside the purview of British laws. Thus, settling down in colonial Chandranagur was a decisive step to outsmart the colonial biopolitics directed to mentally and medically discipline the body of the colonized. However, critiquing the Bortola text further would bring to light how the emigrated prostitutes contested the typical colonial biopolitics in Chandranagur by counter strategic self representation. Representation of the self was possible in the French ambience because colonial Chandranagur was free from Hindu religious coercion. Traditionally, Chandranagur didn't adhere to strict Brahminical practices. And so it, a cultural ambience was quite lenient. This absence of orthodox Brahminical order was complemented with the presence of a large number of Vaishnavites in Chandranagur. Majority of Bengali working class of Chandranagur came from the laboring agricultural and artisan class like the Koiborto, Tafi, Bhopa, Goala, and Chuto. These communities were inclined towards Vaishnavism, which allowed a more permissive and liberal lifestyle than the strict Brahminical order that ruled Calcutta Bengali society. As the Bhatsala text affirms, the prostitutes sometimes took shelter under the garb of another religion as disguised Vaishnavis and explicitly expresses their preference for Lord Krishna over goddess Kali. In Vesha Bibaron Nato, a widow turned prostitute claims, and I'm quoting from the Bengali text, Tajia Kali Nam Krishna ke bojibo, Krishna preme premi hoye shoda shukira. Toibo sharon joi Krishna nam gune, Krishna bole par habo e bhavo tifani. So it goes on. So this intense urge to adopt Vaishnavism is not only an expression of protest against the rigidity of Hinduism, but is also a pointer to their suppressed desire to lead a life free from Hindu orthodoxy. In the same play, you know, the Hindu prostitute ends with a desire, or let us say with a prayer, to return to earthly form as a non-Hindu. And she says, Hindu kule monusho nahi kajjon, Hindu dharmo miche matro bujini akho. So the rigid caste and class division of Hindu religion are taken to task by this hapless victim as she further criticizes the hypocrisy of the Hindus. And she says, Gopone shakoli kore thake Hindu gano, Gopone koriya karjo shadu hoye rano. 
so they are disguised in the subversion of the hierarchical snobbery of the hindu religion as well as a protest against the socio religious orthodoxies which are no less obnoxious than the administrative intervention in the practice of their trade now resistance to typical colonial biopolitics and their counter strategic representation in chandnagar are best expressed in their destabilization of the colonial binaries of the white town and the black town chandnagar's white town with its distinctly european characteristics erased the indigenous lifestyles replaced them by that of the settlers establishing thereby the prerogatives of the settler nation apart from assimilating the indigenous elites into commercial activities french colonizers as already mentioned encouraged tax free french wines in pubs hotels and full fledged brothels to function so french colonial masters slowly amalgamated the indigenous elites into a hedonistic relaxed submissive socio cultural lifestyle and attempted to ideologically carb any possibility of violent uprising this was a well thought of french colonial project of maintaining the spatial binary in colonial chandnagar however the abundant mushrooming of brothels along the southern part of the ganges in the white town brought significant changes to the colonial project the dangerous outcast of calcutta began to coexist with respectable localities in the white town and became a part of the mainstream french ruled society as agorchandra ghosh's poem records the immigrant prostitutes catered to the pleasure quotient of a large cross section of the society irrespective of the spatial binary and i quote anache kanache rar rar moi shob forash dangai joto chhorader barilo utshob anko so unlike calcutta there was no need to out them from the bhadrapallis as new prostitute quarters sprang up near hatkola and gondolpara in south chandnagar night life got a boost so in badmaish jabdo the author indicates how the economy of the town improved for rent of a house in chandnagar rocketed from 10 rupees to 50 rupees per month thus chotto ain converted chandnagar from a sleepy little town into a grand epicenter of hoarding and this has been summed up in one line from the text bodmaish jabdo and the author says chandnagar guljar hoya uthilo according to firoz ul lugha the dictionary that i have mentioned the persian word zar in gulzar refers to a place of gul or flower as beautiful and appealing roses their relocation made the colonial town no less than a garden of flower or gulzar in this sense they were redeemed from being the dangerous outcast of calcutta to the most coveted and sought after heartthrob of the colonial town thus the town provided them a much needed social space a place almost in the mainstream of the society something that could that they could never dream of in calcutta moreover the word zar also refers to a king or a badshah or a towering personality in this sense the emigrated prostitutes vicariously tested a legal privilege for their babus in chandnagar had the free reign to enjoy the privileges of the white by dint of their class position whatever could be the interpretation one could gauge the role reversal of the emigrant prostitutes in chandnagar under chotto ain moreover the varied customers with different class color and cultural background converted the brothels into contact zones of socio cultural exchange in arts of contact zone mary louis pratt explains contact zone as social spaces where disparate cultures meet clash and grapple with each other contact zones are the spaces of colonial encounters or rather colonial frontiers where people 
geographically and historically separated come into contact and establish ongoing relations usually involving conditions of coercion racial inequality and intractable conflict botswana text patali komolkoli brilliantly highlights how brothels as contact zones attracted men from diverse class and cultural background this is a long quote but i have to read this gorango shoron kore shikoy tule jhuli rarer bari uki jhuki makche kulukuli ekhone te nokko babu achen totha jara dibbo kore chul piraye bahar diye tara পকেটে ফেলে পাঁচ পয়সা চুরুত গুজে মুখে রানের বাড়ি পয়সার মজুর যারা খেজুর চাটায় থাকে খাট পালঙ্কের খাসা বিছানায় সুচ্ছে লাখে লাখে Devoid of class and cultural biases, the prostitutes had no caste prejudice. They welcomed the Muslim boatsmen to their quarters. And the poet says, Nair maji jara tara shune bhujab patha, Allah roshul shoron kore nongor kocche tatha. So these encounters are indeed fraught with racial and cultural conflicts as the disguised identities of the prostitutes as vaishnavas or housewives blur out the point however the different clientele of the brothels is symbolic of the fact that when it comes to whoring colonial binary at chandanagar was quite relaxed towards the later part of the 19th century in this sense the immigrant prostitutes became instrumental in disrupting and displacing the hegemonic divide of the colonial culture in the white town they formed an alternative space of cultural negotiation where structures of meaning and reference became ambivalent the botswana texts uh, therefore you know what these botswana texts are are hinting at they are hinting at the fact that the hybrid nature of the customers undermined the formation of any essential cultural identity at the brothels on the contrary the varied customers at the brothels and garden houses create a contact zone of interaction in colonial chandanagar where cultural homogeneity is overshadowed by continuous cultural negotiation a negotiated in betweenness despite power imbalance in this sense the brothels became an intercultural contact zone a gulzar a hybridist garden of prostitutes and their varied customers this poem thus become a valuable document which registered the destabilization of color coded classification of the colonial town now what differentiates the botswana forces that i have that i initially referred to from the botswana narrative poem which is patali komulkuli is the absence of the voice of the prostitute in the latter this is probably because unlike the underlying note of sadness in the farces the narrative poem ends with an optimistic mythical vision of the return of the prostitutes to calcutta after the abolition of chotto ain almost like a duex machina the poet brings down the hindu god of love or modern day from heaven to calcutta maidan and after touring calcutta when modern them finally comes to shonagachi he is aggrieved to find the empty corridors and he says shunetichi 14 ain ashi ache bole bash chhari porobashe jacche sob chole so he decides to bring back the prostitutes to their original homeland and gives a clarion call to boshonto raj to carry out his mission and he says cholo shobe forash danga kashi brindavan and let us go to these places and find out uh, uh, you know what the, the, they are doing and let us bring them back so stuck by the arrows of cupid the prostitutes return to shonagachi and the poet concludes guti guti shobe elo shohor guljar holo so the emigration of prostitutes as the botswana poet envisions it had made calcutta a barren land devoid of its appealing flowers 
the empty streets of shonagachi speak volume of its aridity he therefore hopes that calcutta can only get its hue back by their homecoming after making chandanagar guljar the prostitutes return to calcutta to make the city guljar this botkala text thus relocates the prostitutes from the peripheral chandanagar to central calcutta from where they had been decentered both by the british administration and by the unsympathetic bengali elites to dismiss this vision simply as mythic would be to undermine its epiphanic nature choddo ain was finally abolished by the british government in 1888 after the intervention by british feminist josephine butler who led ladies national association and also by the efforts taken by the christian missionaries and few sympathetic brahmo reformers like shibnath shastri and nilmoni chakraborty now due to all this intervention calcutta gradually converted from a dreaded land to a gulzar thus the ending of the poem is quite epiphanic in nature so i finally come to the conclusion that it must be pointed out that no attempts were taken to integrate the prostitutes into respectable bhadra society of calcutta the measure rather ignored their individual capacities to exercise a rational control over their lives contrastively in chandranagar as the botkala text affirms they created a counter discourse of self representation and therefore could assert their choice their capacities to construct another better grand center help them to lead a life free from the strict brahmanical order at calcutta most astonishingly their rehabilitated contact zones challenge the colonial policy of spatial fragmentation of chandranagar however the most unique thing that could be deduced from these botkala literature is their refusal to be a passive receptor of the colonial biopolitics they used the coercive administrative measure of one colonial settlement to challenge the colonial policies of social fragmentation of another colonial settlement the historical emigration of prostitutes thus was a conscious unsettling of the master's house with the master's tomb thank you very much for listening is prashun there ashubrata da i don't know yes i am here actually i am waiting for prashun hello prashun 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 please unmute yourself prashun can i please request uh, for others to keep their uh, thing, audios in a mute because i am hearing very loud noises are you unmute and just for unmute access for ha access for access for your phone access for uh no alcohol and uh, i cannot hear 
Just wait on to the uh, his coming. Yes, yes, yes. Surely, surely, surely. No, no issues. Again, your voice is breaking. I'm sorry. Hello. Am I audible? Am I audible? Audible. I just want to there are uh, network issues, so I request you to conduct a question answer session. Uh, you know, kind of, uh, and I'll be logging on to kind of sum up the session. Uh, but uh, uh, now, uh, is there any questions? Am I audible? Is there any questions uh, from the chat box? I couldn't find it. So, is there, if there is any, there is any, if there is, is there any question? There are bound to be one uh, for the trolling session. I hope. Okay, no issues. Uh, uh, I'm trying to find out the questions in the uh, questions from the chat box, and uh, that's uh, for Chantor, um, for Antora. Uh, there is a question uh, from Robin Chakraborty. Uh, can the brothels in Chandan Nagar be seen as? Uh, as uh, heterotrophic sites subverting colonial spatial configurations. Antara, please. Can you hear me, Antara? Uh, Ma'am is uh, muted, I think. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, now, I, I was not been able to unmute myself because the host was not allowing me to. Uh, Thank you, Avin, for this question, such a relevant question. And, you know, I completely agree with whatever you have uh, written over there. Brothels were sites of heterotrophic sites uh, that subverted the colonial spatial configuration. And here, you know, I could not talk about uh, the wine, you know, uh, a local wine, Bossa, which was uh, manufactured in Chandranagar, that were distributed uh, for the have-nots actually and that was another uh, prospect of luring people from the black town into these brothels so they were sites of subversion of spatial configuration thank you for the question um i think there is no such questions in the chat box uh, chat inbox mm -hmm. so Hello. Yeah, I think there is no such question uh, in the chat, chat box. 
uh, so so many praiseworthy words are there uh, praising the presentation of Dr. Antara Mukherjee. So uh, thank you, Antara Mukherjee, uh, for your wonderful presentation, and thank you. Really, it's uh, no doubt a well-researched paper and well-organized paper. Uh, thank you, thank you for your presentation, Antara. Thank you, Shubhratada. Thank you for the opportunity. So, me too. It feels it feels great to speak You're not about. Audible, uh, wait. You are not audible now. Am I audible now? Am I audible now? Antara, you are not audible. Can you hear me, ma'am? Hello, Am I audible now? Am I audible now? No. Okay. Okay. No. Uh, thank you, Shubhra. I can hear uh, you, Antara. Uh, hello. Can you hear me, Shubhra? Can you hear me? I think there is. Shubhra, ma'am is audible. Ma'am is audible. Ma'am is audible. We can hear her. We can okay. hear her. Okay. So maybe there is some problem with Shubhrata Das. Need to work, I think. Yes. So without uh, without much ado, let me just say thank you to Kalishani Mohabiddala uh, for giving me this chance uh, to speak about Chandranagar uh, for a college located in Chandranagar and me staying at present in Chandranagar. So thank you very much. And thank you all the viewers who uh, took their time out uh, to listen to my blabberings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much, ma'am. A very, very good evening to all of you once evening. again. Kolishani Mahavidyalaya has always disseminated knowledge appropriate to the need of the hour, which would foster a better worldview. In this journey of ours, we are extremely privileged to have Mahishtala College, Kolkata with us. I now hereby invite Dr. Rumpadash, Principal Mahishtala College, Kolkata to offer the valedictory speech. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, Rumpadi. Rumpa, Ma'am, are you here? No, sir. Uh, Madam is not there. Mm -hmm. Rumpadi, are you there? Rumpadi, are you there? Ma'am, just joining, sir. Ma'am is not. Okay, sir. I, I am already absent. Okay. Ma'am, joined? Just joined. Okay. Once again, I will then invite her. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Ma'am ma is already in. Okay, uh, there is an announcement for the participants. Uh, actually, all the participants are requested to submit the last feedback form that will be provided during the vote of thanks session. Uh, to have their participation certificate and and all the paper presenters for all the paper presenters the certificates will be provided after two days and for the for the participation of the seminars uh, the participation certificate will be provided um, after 12 midnight thank you so over to rumpati uh, thank you, Shubroto, and uh, thank you for your technical team. I must congratulate them. Uh, well, uh, respected uh, Principal Kolishani Mohabiddaloy, honorable resource persons from different universities and colleges across the world, uh, distinguished professors, scholars, and uh, my dear students, a very good evening to all of you. I'm sure you must all be quite uh, stressed out and uh, tired after the long three-day um, uh, deliberations and discussions, but it has been a rare privilege and pleasure to be associated as a collaborating college 
with this uh, humongous uh, academic extravaganza spanning over three days and on a topic that is extremely relevant. Um, the world is in the midst of a, a pandemic where uh, thousands of people are affected. Uh, many people are dying every day. Families are getting ruined. And uh, the pandemic has also adversely affected uh, the economies as well as uh, political systems of certain uh, countries. Uh, and uh, the situation is such that if people survive COVID, uh, many of them might not survive starvation and death by starvation. Uh, what is most tragic is that not all of this tragedy will happen due to natural causes, but more due to anthropogenic and biopolitical causes. Uh, it is extremely tragic to note how human lives have become mere statistical data to different political stratagems. And uh, society, culture, and literature will go on recording in different ways, in subtle nuances, uh, this constant, this uh, uh, this this uh, repetitive, uh, repetitive uh, uh, nature of the bio geopoliticalization that is happening around the world. The of uh, this seminar, this webinar, international webinar, was obviously derived from Michel Foucault's celebrated work. But we need to constantly reorient ourselves about the different perspective which he has offered. And I believe that this three-day uh, session has really allowed a, a wide farrago of opinions, of discussions, of deliberations to, to arm us better, to uh, make us inquisitive. And it has left more questions than answers. We need to adopt, as it is being constantly reminded over uh, different forms of media, to adapt to the new normal. Uh, but what I need uh, to uh, question, and uh, I am sure many of you will agree with me, is that the new normal is also an ever-expansive temporal paradigm and uh, the magic of novelty in the term new uh, has uh, really long lost its sheen and has started smelling of formalin spread over decaying putrefying bodies. The Foucauldian concern of locating the bios in the political superstructures that constantly impinge, interact, interfere and interrupt human governance has long de determined the social, ethnic, cultural, and literary practices. And the lectures by our resource persons and the papers presented by teachers and uh, research scholars have gone to deliberate over those. Many literary texts, films, drama have been read from biopolitical, feminist, post-colonial, and other nuanced perspectives. Uh, we have uh, started uh, to learn, or uh, I, I guess this webinar has given us a new kind of an opening to learn to understand biopolitics, not just from the theoretical point of view, but also with different examples from praxis. I fervently believe that the enlightening discourses held in this international webinar has generated multiple queries, and uh, our scholars and our resource persons will uh, have much more to take back from this webinar. And I look forward to more such engaging academic interactions in future. Thank you, Shubroto. Kumar Rana as the convener. A big thanks to your technical team who have gone on, have done a wonderful job in spite of minor hitches. And uh, I thank uh, Mohabib Daloy for organizing this wonderful webinar and allowing us from Mahesh Tala College to collaborate. A big thank you to you all. I wish you all the best. Stay safe, stay secured, and we shall look forward to that 
day when again we shall uh, be with Kolishani Mohavidyalaya in a seminar and not a webinar. We shall definitely overcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dumpadi, for your idea speech. Uh, really, we are honored by your collaboration, and I'm really honored by your support. Um, As uh, Jack Confield says, that uh, me, anything that has a. Yes, sir. sir uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are. You are. Yeah. So, uh, as Jack Confield says that uh, anything that has a beginning has an end. So uh, with the ending of the valedictory speech, uh, our three-day international webinar on biopolitics, literature, culture, and society has also come to an end. Uh, now I would like to request our convener, Professor Shubhroto Kumarana, to convey the thanking note uh, and end the webinar. Uh, thank you, uh, it is a real pleasure for Kolishani Mohavidala to host the three-day international webinar on biopolitics, literature, culture, and society, organized by the Department of English under the aegis of IQSC, Kolishani Mohavidala, Chandanagar, Brooklyn, affiliated to the University of Badovan, in collaboration with Mohistola College, Kolkata, affiliated to the University of Calcutta, on and from 23rd to 25th July 2020. I convey my deep respect to the President of the Governing Body of Kalishari Mohavid Dalai. I express my sincere gratitude to the respected resource persons. Professor Dr. Shruthir Kumar, Professor of English, DES Multidisciplinary Research Center, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Dr. Shamjukta Chatterjee, Assistant Professor, De uh, Department of English and in Charge, Center for Saigon University. Dr. Panos Iliopoulos, Faculty Member, Department of Philosophy, Pedagogy and Psychology, University of Ionina, Chris. Professor T. Max, Professor of English, Department of English, Punjab University, Puducherry. Dr. Devu Jyoti Vishesh, Faculty Member, Department of English, Bodolan University, Asham. Dr. John Charles Ryan, Adjunct Associate Professor, Southern Cross University, Australia. And Dr. Antora Mukherjee, Assistant Professor, Government Girls General Bigley College, Kolkata. And the moderators of our sessions, Professor T. Marx, Professor of English, Department of English, Pondicherry University. Professor Poshun Banerjee, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Kobi Joydeep Mohavidalai. Dr. Pradeep Prashant Chaudhuri, Assistant Professor, Department of English, University of North Bengal. And Dr. Debo Jyoti Vishesh, Faculty Member, Department of English, Bodolan University, Asham. And the Chairpersons of the Sessions. Dr. Shushanta Kumar Bodhun, Associate Professor, Department of, of uh, English, Shivri Vidya Shagar College. Professor Pushun Banerjee also in Chair, uh, Department of English, Kobi Jayadev Mohabid Dalai, Suranjana Bhatro, Dr. Suranjana Bhatro, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Sirampur Girls College. Dr. Dipanita Pal, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Goshi Mohabid Dalai. Dr. Ramanu Chwanar, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Shodhu Centenary College. Dr. Rumpa Dash, Principal, Mohistala College, for making their time available to join us. At the same time, my sincere respect goes to the participants from other colleges and institutions from various parts of India, even from abroad. I convey my thanks to the principal, Dr. Nepankar Hajda, who has given enough latitude to me in going ahead with this OFVNA. I convey my cardiac regards to Dr. Dumpadas, principal, Mahasthala College, for her support. And I convey 
my regards to the advisory committee, that means the members of the advisory committee, Professor Devasti Dasarma, Associate Professor, Department of Commerce, Kalishani Mohabiddalai, Dr. Orgo Bandhapadhai, Associate Professor, Department of Mathematics, Kalishani Mohabiddalai, Professor Gaurav Shina, Associate Professor, Department of History, Kalishani Mohabiddalai, and, and the member of the organizing committee, Professor Shuman Bhar, Associate Professor, Head of the Department, Department of English, and also Shankana Moshal, uh, Department of English, Professor Shushmita Mukherjee, Department of English, and Professor Dipanjan Chatterjee, Department of English. And also Monalisha Mustafi, Head of the Department, Department of All Science, uh, Kholishani Mohabitalai. Special thanks to Dr. Shongjukta Chatterjee, faculty member and, and in charge for charge Center for Women's Studies, Zaigon University, who has not only encouraged me to proceed with this marathon program, but also cooperated with me each and every time I needed. So really, she deserves a special thanks from me and from each and every one. And another gentleman is there behind the curtain. He is Dr. Devachuti Rishas, faculty member at Bodolan University, without whose assistance, it was quite impossible for me to arrange the program. I will also mention Dr. Ramanuj Kona, Professor Koshun Banerjee, my friend, Ramanuj Kona, also my friend, and Professor Devasita Surma of my college uh, for their assistance and support. Special thanks to Prashanto Mandal for his technical support, without whose support it was also quite impossible me, for, for me to go with this program. I would be ungrateful and doing injustice if I do not mention the special support and untiring efforts of the members of the organizing committee, advisory committee, and my dear students and my dear colleagues who have worked smilingly under stress and strain to make this webinar successful. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Uh, there is an announcement also. Please submit your feedback form. Each and every participant will have their participation certificate after the submission of the feedback form. And those who have presented paper in our webinar, they will be provided certificate after two days. Thank you. This is the end of our webinar. Thank you. I'm really overwhelmed by your active cooperation and active participation. Thanks a lot.